Hello and welcome to a very crowded marketplace here in the city of Bruges, the traditional start now of the Belgian classic race, the Tour de Flanders, the 92nd edition. I'm Phil Liggett, alongside me is Paul Sherwin. And Paul, the traditional signing in here of the riders. Everybody getting a chance. This is Stefan Weissemann, a former winner of this race, and Thomas Vaucler, a former French national champion and, of course, a former wearer of the yellow jersey in the Tour de France. Well, the French uh, don't usually do too well in this event, but this is uh, Jani Miersman, who's a Belgian rider on a French team, Francaise des Jeux, followed by a Frenchman who could do, a, a rather a Belgian-French-speaking rider here, Philippe Gilbert, who will look to win today, I think. I think he'll be looking for a fine performance. He's had a great start to the season with a good win in Het Vault. This is Alan Davis. He's finally got himself a contract on a European team. Former finisher in the top three here, Fabio Baldata, but he will be looking after the interests probably of his teammate, Alessandro Balan. And there he is, Balan, last year's winner, and he's also had two top six finishes as well. And he says he loves this event, and he's going to try and repeat again today. The weather conditions, as we watch Manuel Quinziato come up to the front, are chilly, but there's threats, you know, of hail and sleet out on the course. Big Magnus Backstead, former winner of Paris-Roubaix, looking for great form, recently finishing second in the time trial stage of the three days of La Pana, so he'll be looking to ride well today. Well, Magnus, this is one of the big days. This is what being a professional bike rider is all about, the Ronde van Vlaanderen. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you can always just look at the crowds out here today, you know. You know, it's a special day in Belgium, and, you know, you can definitely feel the race days coming on, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. A lot of pressure on your shoulders, but uh, surely you're thinking a little bit forward to Paris-Roubaix, although this is a great bike race to win, too. Oh, definitely. I mean, if I can get up there today, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll take the chances and the risks necessary to be there. But uh, the big focus is on next weekend. So uh, we'll see what happens today. Bit of a learning process as well for Team Slipstream Chipotle. For a lot of these young guys, they really are not going to know what's hitting them. No, I think we only have actually two, maybe three guys that have ridden the race before. So, uh, you know, they're out for a big shock today, but uh, I think they will learn from it and walk away stronger. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the year started well for you in the Tour Down Under and uh, it looks like you're ready for a good race here in the Ronde van Vlaanderen. Yeah, it's a great start in Australia and now it, we, are, we are three months later and the condition is also so good and uh, I hope to finish on the podium today. It's a little bit different though here though, the pressure is a lot more on you as a Belgian rider. Yeah, in Belgium it's very different. The supporters just so much and uh, I, I, I hope one million person longs the, long the road today and uh, it's very big. Good luck today. Thank you. Well George, these are the days that you really love. Tour of Flanders, Paris-Roubaix, they're special races aren't they? Yeah, these are really epic races. It's hard to really describe how uh, special they are and how hard they are. It's really going to be a war out there today and we're going to do everything we can to, to be with the leaders. A little bit different for you this year as well because it's not the same team you've been with for a number of years but you have got a solid team behind you yeah actually the team is really strong i mean it's you know when you go to the the really crucial sections you can kind of look around you know there's always three or four high road guys there so i'm really excited about doing the classics races with high road and strong team really experienced guys like clear you know he knows every inch of the road so just try to stay, stick with him and uh, hopefully i'll have some good luck and uh finish up on the podium that's what i think is important about a race like the tour of flanders to have the experience and you have the experience of a very long career and a love to do well in these races absolutely these are my favorite races you know i train hard for for these this week here flanders and roubaix and you know i just hope for luck and good feelings and i, I should be there good luck, mate. thanks paul jerry great to see you looking very happy pretty relaxed at the start of the tour of flanders yeah, it's uh, certainly makes a nice little change having your family and little boy here. First time they've come up from Flanders and the last race you come to see was Perry Bay, so uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> I was talking to a few of the riders before the start and although we haven't seen a lot of Stuart O'Grady, a lot of the guys are saying you've got the legs for today. Oh, I'm pretty happy actually flying under the radar. Um, my name hasn't been mentioned for a couple of months, so I'm, I'm more than happy with that. And I'm in a very similar situation to last year. Um, Fabian's obviously got the form of his life. We're there to ride for him, but if an opportunity arises, then uh, one of uh, CSC boys will be there to take it. I remember talking to you and Hank Vogels a few years ago about these races. These are special races for you. You really like to do well here, don't you? Yeah, it's the first time I've uh, felt like racing all year, to be honest. Um, 
it's the first time you kind of switch on. You know, these are the big ones. These are the ones you want to win, and these are the ones that you remember. And having your little boy and your wife alongside here today, that's going to be inspiration. Yeah, I mean, every, every little thing counts in this game. Different jersey this year, and it's nice to see at the Tour of Flanders. Almost half Flemish yourself, you're very motivated today. Yeah, of course, yeah, it's almost my home race now. I've lived here so long now, it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely got a special feeling to it. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Talking to George Hincap, he said he's very motivated by today, and he feels that when it comes to the critical points of today's stage, he'll always have a number of teammates alongside him. Yeah, I think I think it's going to be the big big change for George this year. You know, he's, um, he's come away from a tour-based team to a, a team that's very highly motivated for the classics. So, uh, I think there's a lot of experience in this team for riding these races. So, I, I, I think he's right. I think there'll be a lot of guys there to help him in the, in, late on in the race, in the final, in the critical moments. And although the weather's uh, very nice at the moment, the roads out in Flanders and around the hills are pretty nasty. Yeah, I heard there's some snow coming as well, so I think it's going to be a classic. Good luck. Cheers, thanks so much. Tom, you've had a fairly quiet week this week, but everybody's saying that your legs are ready for the Tour of Flanders today. Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, it was my first, this is my first real big objective. Uh, for the first time uh, in my career, uh, I tried to do nothing <laughs> in, in front of Flanders. I just tried to focus, be 100% fresh, uh, not get anything, uh, not get anything else in my mind. Don't, don't get worried about other races, and uh, it's worked out. I'm feeling really good. Uh, oh, we go to the start now. Well, I got to say that. That was a great interview with Tom Bone, and we were just finishing off the interview. I was going for the next question, and he says, uh, thanks very much, the race has just started, so he's gone. And so are we. So it's a crowded square here. A little a bit of a reminder there, Paul, of what's to come, the cobble roads in the marketplace here in Bruges. And it's famous for the small clients. Let's have a look first, though, at the winners in recent years. Johan Museo now retired back in 98. So too retired Van Petergum. Looking down the other end, Balan is here to try and defend. Tom Bonin, if he wins the day, makes it three. He'll join the all-time greats. No rider has ever won it more than three times. Four riders have succeeded. Well, Tom Bonin's got the chance to win today and, of course, to go and win it for a fourth time and really write his name down into the history books. And that's what he'll be looking for, the top step of the podium there. The World Cup standings at the moment after the Tour Down Under, Andre Griepel with maximum points there. He's got a strange number because he also won most of the stages there too to give him a grand total of 62 points. Stuart O'Grady backing him up at the bottom end of the table there in position number 10. But that actually was rather important, Phil, because you can see that it's actually the order of the riders here in the World in the World Cup rankings that actually gave them the positions of the team cars. Very important on a day like the Tour of Flanders when the roads are very narrow and dangerous. Right, well, let's go and have a little uh, short look at what's happened in the uh, story so far. But before we do that, here's the actual race route. We start in Bruges as we head down to Rosler, Cortric. And once we're through Cortric, we're into deepest Flanders, then the little hills. We call them Berg Start. The Kleisberg is the first of the 17 climbs. Yes, and then the riders, uh, climb number three, hit the Molenberg, but I always believe that this race really kicks in at the climb number five there, the Eau de Quaremont. And, of course, once you get down to the end of all 17, the real difficult ones are the Mur de Gramont and the Bosberg to finish before the riders end up with their 264-kilometre route into Merbeke at Ninova. Well, weather conditions uh, is a very, very good if you're watching Tour de Flans. A bit tough for the rides today. They started in very cold conditions. They're coming to the start of the Kleisberg climb here. All together, there's been the usual little flurry, but surprisingly today, nobody succeeding in breaking clear of the pack. A sign that the big favourites are watching one another. This is uh, a little bit earlier on before we actually go to the live pictures. This is the town of Bellingham, and it was voted the town of the Ronde this year, and that's why they've got all the bunting out and the Lion of Flanders, because not only, as you've mentioned, Phil, is this a very important bicycle race, this is probably the biggest annual sporting event of the year in Belgium. And once you leave there, you head on to the lower slopes of the Kleisberg. All of these climbs are not very big, but they hurt. This one is uh, a maximum gradient of 13%. It's about one2 uh, kilometres long and this is where the move which we're about to join the live action got clear. Tom Vailers of Skill Shimano, uh, Sven Renders of Top Sport, Jérôme Vincent, the Frenchman on Boig Telecom and the rider in our picture there is Yannick Tombak who's setting the pace here. 
Well, Tom Back uh, coming back to the top of his form. In fact, nice to see him in a breakaway move like this. Uh, formerly a, a long-time resident on Team Coffee Disc, but he really was never very consistent. And it's quite funny, really, when a, a rider finds that he's losing his position on the team and has to battle his way back into the sport, how all of a sudden he finds his form and dedication again. This is the Klausberg on the one side that we've climbed up, but a lot of riders know this uh, climb as the Mont de l'Enclou, and that's the French name for it. We're not too far away here, actually, from the French borders. And good move, uh, pushing on there, Sven Renders, the top sport rider, pushing on now a little bit further down the road. The maximum these riders have gained, 2 minutes 10 seconds. Not without uh, compensation for the crashes here, number of riders falling on the road. Sergei Lagutin of Cycles Kolstrop having a bit of a tumble here. We might be able to get a look at that again. Yes, and watch the motorbike on the right, because it's in fact Lagutin who falls very just on the edge there of that motorbike. The boat, motorbike did well to miss him. He certainly wasn't at fault. I tell you what, who would like to be a cameraman in a race like the Ronde van Vlaanderen? It is very dangerous, not only for the riders, but for the men who bring us the images, the still images and the movie images of the Ronde van Vlaanderen. Everybody has to be alert. I think we're now starting to feel the nervousness in the main field because they realise that very shortly, Phil, they'll be getting into what I regard as the most important start of the strategic race here, and that will be the old Quaramon. But I tell you what, the weather conditions are not great. And yet more crashes here. The leaders catching a hailstorm. Uh, funnily enough, none of this bad weather coming to the finishing line of the race, but out in Flanders they were catching some bad weather all of the time here. And uh, the Cofferdish rider here also having himself a little bit of a trouble, a little bit of a problem. It looked to me as though it was Rick Verbrugger himself there wrestling with his bike. Well, the lead went out, a uh, maximum of over two minutes, but very attentive, the main field, chasing them down and quickly reducing it despite all the tumbles and the crashes at the back. Well, this is that crash just once again, and you see why it's so important in a race like the Ronde van Vlaanderen to ride up near the front end of the main field because most of these crashes and accidents actually happen in the back 50% of the field. Very nervous, big peloton here, and then this makes them even more nervous because as they're headed up towards the second climb of the day, they really did catch a deluge. Temperatures plunging uh, just onto the verge of freezing, Stein de Volder right in the centre there as the hailstones bit into his skin. And the Mitsubishi Jatazi team uh, got Tom back in the breakaway, which will take a little bit of pressure off Alan Davis, the Australian rider who is very anxious to prove himself now. He's had a rough ride all year finding a team. His name was linked with the Operation Puerto uh, drug scandal, uh, but even his own federation in Australia has cleared him of anything to do with that and yet he's become sort of untouchable by the big team, which is a great shame because Alan Davis is a pretty nice guy and he deserves the chance to race. Well, he's found this team and he wants to prove he's worthy of much better than this. Well, it's very difficult. Uh, his name was linked to a number of the top pro tour teams in the early part of the season, but I think prob probably, Phil, that link with Operation Puerto, a lot of teams now are very concerned about the battle against uh, drug-taking and unfortunately, in the day and age that we're living, it really has become a question of you're guilty until you can prove your own innocence. Well, there's no doubt about that now, and the fact is, if I was to tell you that Paul Sherwin's on drugs, that would be enough. Uh, so it's past the joke uh, to stop him probably riding for the moment. Well, I wouldn't be able to ride at the moment because I've been taking cough medicine since this morning, and I think <laughs> that would probably show up uh, quite high on a grass radiography machine. Well, the peloton repairing itself after the latest fall. These are the hard men of the world of cycling, and Belgium, if anybody has ever had the opportunity to race in Belgium, then you'll know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, you should try it, but these are surviving races, and then you think about winning them when you survive the first few hours of high speed, lots of crashes, and usually a fair percentage of bad luck as well. And if you can sit near the front and, and miss all out on all of that, then you have a real good shot at winning a race like the Tour de Flanders. It's still in the early stages, lots of time yet uh, for the riders because the main hills of the day still ahead of the riders. Uh, yesterday there were thousands of cyclists took part in the what they call the Randonnée or the Cyclo Sportif Tour de Flanders. Even Sean Kelly, the great, who uh, never actually won this race but finished second on three occasions, was taking part yesterday. This is uh, Mathieu Ladagnou, he went down a little earlier, you can see he's been ripped apart so rather rapidly. Just talking to the team car is Timothy Goodsell, the Kiwi rider on Team Francaise de Jeu, having a quick chat with the race doctor, so he obviously was also involved in one of those accidents. It is a very nervous part of the race, Phil, yes, we are an awful long way to go, but you have to be alert, you have to stay near the front, 
this is probably one of the most important races of the year alongside Paris-Roubaix, where you have to try and stick in the top 20 to 25 riders. Well, the confusion's helping out uh, as Thomas Voigtler passes through picture there. Um, two minutes ten is the latest time check coming out from the race now, uh, so they're more preoccupied with themselves. There's Fabian Cancellara, very confident, I thought, this morning when he was uh, being interviewed on the stage before the start. And he's really on top of his form. He's never ridden so well this last couple of months since he won Paris Roubaix. He's been a different bike rider. Five time trial victories last year. But boy, were they great wins! World Championship, French, uh, Swiss Championship, Prologue of the Tour de France. They were the biggies. They were, but he continued this year with a great start in the Amgen Tour of California. But I think the way he dominated the main field fill in Milan San Remo was phenomenal and an indication that tactically he's riding superbly, but he's got the power to back it up. Absolutely right, because everybody knew the move was going to be made by him. They were there and they couldn't stop it when, when it came and he rode to a, a very superb victory in there in Milan San Remo for sure. Not surprising Paul to see the boys from Lamprey down there on the front at the moment because they've got great confidence in last year's winner Alessandro Balan who won last year and the two years previously to that he finished fifth and sixth so he's a man for this race and as so often in recent years the Italians have become the men of Flanders. Well you have to be super motor. we're looking here at the Cop van der Wegstrijde at the front end of the race on the left hand side and the main field or the peloton on the right hand side but you're right I think uh, since riders like Franco Ballerini the Italian riders have been very much motivated by races like the Tour of Flanders and of course Paris-Roubaix and that was followed up by the great Andrea Taffy and since then a lot of the Italians have not been worried at all about uh, expatriating themselves as was the case in the 1970s and 80s when they didn't really enjoy racing outside of their own borders. Well, a little bit of statistics for you as we watch the race try to decide what's going on up front. Uh, this being the 92nd Tour de Flanders, the Belgian riders have won 64 editions of this event, while the Italians come a distant second place with 10 victories, but a lot of those victories come in quite recently. Uh, the Belgians uh, haven't won this race really since Tom Bonham, but it's only two years ago, and before that it was Tom as well. And the Germans also haven't won it since Stefan Wesserman, who's riding again today. That was happening in 2004. A little bit further back, uh, this is Gianni Mirsman. He's a rider who's only just 22 years of age, and in fact, uh, a lot of people are tipping him for stardom for Belgium. He was picked up in his first year as a professional by uh, Johan Brunil, as was this man as well, uh, the Belgian national champion, Stein de Volder, riding at the back. I think today his uh, race will be very much dominated by what the form of Tom Bonin is, because Bonin, to me, although he hasn't done a lot since the Tour of Qatar in the early part of the year, he looked pretty much like a, a fettled racehorse as he came yeah. into sign on. I think you're right. I would have taken that as a danger sign, the very fact he has not been winning races, because normally Tom comes out and he wins right, left and centre, and uh, this year he's been very quiet since he started off so well, so I'd be quite worried about that. He looked extremely fit this morning. He had legs uh, to die for, I have to say. His, his muscles looked perfect. He looked absolutely phenomenal, and he was relaxed before the start as well. I know last year I tried to interview him before the start, and it was absolute mayhem. You could see the nervousness. He was nice and relaxed coming down to the start gate. He stopped and had a, a quick chat with uh, one or two of the journalists, and then, in fact, he uh, uh, ended our conversation very rapidly and said, Paul, I've got to go. The race has just started. Well, <laughs> At 27 years of age, Tom has won nearly 90 races already, so uh, he only turned pro in 2002. Here again are our top four riders who got away on the first climb of the day. A little bit later than normal, I have to say, but the tailwind was keeping the race at very high speeds and altogether we're starting to swing in uh, a westerly, an easterly direction rather uh, now as we move after the journey south from the start as we head into the area here now of the real Flanders where the hills are bound, many of them cobbled and a new uh, little challenge there now, these speed humps they're putting down in the towns around Belgium. Well these riders are looking at around about 10 to 15 kilometres to the next section of uh, rather tough cobblestones and that is uh, the Molenstraat but after that they will have the very long, difficult section of the Padestrad. And although the rain is not coming down here, the rain has come down consistently over the last few days, and the Padestrad is absolutely soaking and covered in mud. It won't affect these four riders, but it will be a battle fill, I think, on the Padestrad when the main field comes there. And we may well see the first serious acceleration in the peloton. 
We're looking at the breakaway here, well, we're back to the peloton now as they all start to mass. Nobody interested in that breakaway. In fairness, the riders up front haven't got the big pedigree. Uh, they're a perfect break to draw the attention away from themselves in the peloton, I think, because uh, I suppose Yannick Tombak is the most experienced rider. He rides for that Mitsubishi Jartazi team now, but he's uh, heading up 32 years of age. Um, I think his best classic finish ball ever is a fifth place in Paris, Brussels, which is really a, a semi-classic. Well, he was a rider who was tipped for stardom when he was riding for Team Cofidis. They expected an awful lot of him. He was the Estonian national champion, but he seemed to lose his way a fraction. And, and once you get down to the, the smaller teams, if you've got the class, it gives you a chance to get back into the top end of the sport. But just looking down here, you can see how dangerous the Ronde van Vlaanderen is as well. You've got all these little directional islands. You have to be so alert. There's the white jersey at the front there, that is André Griepel, the leader of the World Cup, but I think today his race will not be to try and get himself points in this race. He'll be looking after the interests, I think, of one George Hincapi. I think you're right. In fairness, though, he'll look for a chance. There's 50 points at stake for victory today in the World Cup competition. He comes to this race already with six wins this year, but the hatful coming in the Tour Down Under. In fact, all of his races coming down there. He won four stages of the tour down under out of a possible six now if that isn't domination i don't know what is he also won the, the sort of hors d'oeuvre of the tour down under which was the glenel classic this is a lovely seaside town in south australia and that uh, should have warned us how he was going to ride a couple of days later he's a man there uh, very pleased with himself and he's he's feeling as though he's breaking out of the shadow of the other team sprinters now because he is beginning to show his talent and you know he's still only 25 years of age I think uh, it's one of those things you you need a click to get your career going and I think for him that click was certainly the tour down under and he's given an awful lot of confidence we're looking here at the Onderstraat it's only a small section of column of stone just around about 300 meters in length but these four leaders now have stretched their advantage outfield to a minute and 58 seconds well, these early journeys to the hills take a little while to reach, but once we get to them, uh, starting down by the uh, Paterberg and the Koppenberg, then we are in them and they come thick and fast. These four riders, Tom Vulis, uh, Sven Renders, uh, Vincent Jerome and Yannick Tombak, setting the early pace. Well, the Onderstrate, just on the outskirts of Gavara, puts those four riders just 12 kilometres away from the Paderstraat, which is 2.4 kilometres in length, and that is around about 127 kilometres to go to the finish. And in fact, uh, just looking at the time, Phil, they're just outside of the fastest time of the day, so they really are going very quickly. Uh, five minutes uh, inside, the 13:11, so uh, they're doing very well at the moment well, well we're now arguing here about our watches but never mind they're, they're on schedule put it that way for a best time finish uh, i suppose it depends whether we're talking gmt or <laughs> vmt vlaams are median time and that's where we are at the moment <laughs> well this is definitely gavra so at least we know we're on the right section of cobblestones just a, a short 300 meter hors d'oeuvre and for these guys at the uh, the padestrat seriously is a very difficult section of cobblestones the first real test i think of the day a real tour of Flanders, the hotbed of world cycling. The Belgian people, I think, are the best spectators in the world. They know their sport, they know their riders. They'll cheer everybody. They appreciate the efforts that these riders make. And, of course, they'll be ecstatic if Tom Boland finally gets over that finishing line in Mayer Bakes himself. It looks like a rider either fell there, or there's so many people going around the corner, he had to stop to make the bend, but he's certainly restarting. It's a chaotic race, this, a very nervous race, and uh, on days like this, when you've got a little bit of wet weather coming in, mix that with a little bit of grit coming up the roads, you can actually use a full set of brake blocks on a day like this, and the riders will have to probably throw them away at the end of the day. This is the Onderstraat, 127 kilometres to go, They've already been in the saddle for 137 kilometres, so just about halfway through the race. And no chase on here. The riders are content to just hold position as long as they can. There's the problem. It's a back wheel puncture, I think. It's a rider from Barlow World who was yeah. uh, looking for a back wheel there. I'm not sure exactly who it was. A little bit further up, this is the leader of Team Barlow World. This is Marco Corti, who just happens to be the son of the team uh, manager there, Claudio Corti himself. A world champion the guy having the problem there in fact was baden cook so there'll be a yeah, little bit of panic there uh, new colors for cookie as he now tries to refine himself he still gets about five or six wins every year even so um but he'd like a big result 
Anyway, that's unlucky there. Now, look at this, Paul. Skill have moved all the men up here. Well, you know, this is a great team, and they've been uh, very much recognised by the organisation of the Tour de France because they've been accepted to ride Paris-Roubaix, and they are a team, and although they're one of the, the second-rate teams, second-ranked teams, I should say, they are riding very well now. I think that was the wrong way to go that there, down the left-hand side. It seemed all right at the time, but then a Sony Duval rider stopped, and it made it look as narrow as it really was. So instead of coming out at the front, they're now coming out at the tail of the bunch and all the work to get back up has to start again. Yes, yeah, so looking back at that team team uh, skill there, it always reminds me when I look at that jersey of the great Sean Kelly because that was the jersey that he used to race in when he was at the height of his career. And uh, sorry about that, guys, but there is a traffic <laughs> jam on the left-hand side. Maybe that wasn't the shortcut you were looking for. Well, he got the bunny hop correct and then it sort of came to a halt. Danny Pape was sat at the back there for the Slipstream Chipotle team, presented by H3O and... Uh, He's sitting in the dangerous place at the back of the f race because the strong men will hold their position at the front because as these roads get narrower, and they do get narrower, if you're not at the front, you can be 800 metres behind the leaders once you turn onto these narrow roads. And once you get onto a, a section of cobblestones like the Padestrad, you can find yourself for a minute behind the front end of the bike race, especially when you get the big acceleration. And the unfortunate thing that may happen there is you could find your team car two or three minutes behind and, and that's a little bit of a problem I think today for Tima Astana I was talking to Johan Brunil yesterday he said uh, the unfortunate thing for us in a, a race like today is because we didn't participate uh, too well in the early season races we're in fact car number 17 in the rankings and that's not too good that's right it's the, uh, the first uh, 10 cars I think it is is the order of the Pro Tour overall so after that you draw for position and uh, a draw can be very important today, that's for sure. Getting your riders a wheel or a bike at the crucial moment, which will come later on, I think. And it's also important to try and uh, ride well, of course, in today and get yourself a few more points for next week, because next week is, of course, Paris-Roubaix. Unfortunately, not now included in the World Cup. The World Cup seems to uh, increase in size and decrease in size on a, an ongoing <laughs> basis. It's very difficult, actually, to keep up with it. Well, there's the wayward Sony Deval rider who's now rejoined, but I can't see his number, so I don't know who he is. But in fact, uh, new colours for Sony Deval as well this year, slight variance on what they were. David Miller, who was on that team, the British rider, now swung across to the American squad, Slipstream Chipotle, and looking forward to riding a full season with them. Bait and Cook is back, uh, which is good. So he's got a good wheel change and he's rejoined actually very quickly there. Well, the South African rider uh, Robbie Hunter, one of the riders here for Team Barlow World, I haven't seen Robbie Hunter just yet. I was surprised to see that they selected Daryl Impey as well for Team Barlow World for the Ronde van Vlaanderen. I think he would have been a little bit more comfortable on the, the hillier roads of Liège, Baston Liège. I would agree. He's a very good sprinter, but I'm not sure with his light body weight he will still be around to use his sprint. But we'll find out and we wish him well. Every rider who starts at La Ronde wants to get to the finish and say that they've done at least that as they did indeed do with Paddy Roubaix. Astana, first chance to see them now penetrating the air. Banned from this year's Tour de France, uh, which means that the defending champion won't ride, neither will the third place finisher Levi Leipheimer. Something of a travesty of justice seems to be the opinion of most. Uh, but that team being led on this occasion by Vyacheslav Ekimov is in the guard this year. Here's Cookie getting himself back into the main field. Uh, Achteraan van de Peloton the back end of the main field, and that is Andre Griepel just on the far side in his uh, leader's jersey of uh, the World Cup. But I have to say, Phil, that uh, uh, we're talking about Team Astana. They may well have been uh, banned from the Tour de France uh, so far this year, but they haven't actually been banned from winning races because they were <laughs> dominant in the Amden Tour of California. And just recently, I have to say that Alberto Contador was phenomenal in the Castilla Leon, uh, ably assisted by his teammate Levi Leipheimer, who was only a fraction of seconds behind him. Contador has made a great start to the year and he's not really too worried about the Tour de France, whether he defends it or not, quite honestly. He, he was placed in the Tour of Valencia, he finished third in the Tour of Mercia and then he won the Castilla Lyon. So he's off to a good start to the year and watch out for him perhaps in one of the other Grand Tours. Well, looking at uh, Team Astana riding at the front end again, uh, going on with that conversation I had with Johan Brunil last night, he said, look, we're going into the race uh, with uh, no pressure at all on our shoulders. And I think your man, your tip for today is at Vladimir Gusev. And I think that is an excellent tip because he is certainly one of the hard men of the squad and he loves these conditions. We've seen him ride well in races like Paris-Roubaix and he too really is pretty much a development rider for the future, a man who I think has enjoyed races like the Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix in recent years. 
And the other rider on the team is Thomas Veitkus, who's now come across, like they all did most of them, from Discovery Channel, who disbanded at the end of last season. He's had two wins this year, stayed for the Tour of the Algar, he finished third in that race as well overall. And the Tour of the Green Heart, or the Ronde von Groenhardt, uh, here in Holland. So he's a man who's uh, looking as though he might produce a sprint, but it's not just about sprinting the Tour de Flanders. You've got to have the strength to hold your position and to fight off all those who try to steal it from you. And around the back corner from the referee's eyes, of course, uh, Fisticuffs is quite well known in the Tour de Flanders. Well, it's really a question of a sprinting for the corners like these. These corners are so strategically important, as we've seen already so far during the day. Uh, once you get into this point, there's a serious slowing down. And uh, as you can see, happening right in front of your eyes here, yeah. from the back of the main field, you get almost stopped, and then you have to accelerate again to get yourself back up to the front. Number 21, Johan van Sommeren. What a great character this man is. He can ride for guys like Leif Hoster in the flat stages here. He can look after Robbie McEwen, but he can also climb to a assist Cadell Evans in the big mountain passes a great domestique oh absolutely he's a wonderful character too but he's uh, very tall and thin and ungainly he's only won two races in his life and everybody was really pleased with him last year when he won the seventh stage of the Tour of Poland and that was enough to give him outright victory there he is Johan van Sommelen and uh, that was a big result for Johan because he spent his whole life which began as a pro in 2003 helping people like McEwen win races and so he's not worried about sitting on the front end of the main field for 50 or 60 kilometers although you can see that the main field here are not chasing in earnest you can almost sense the nervousness starting to creep into them because they realize that they too are not very much more than four or five kilometers now away from the Padestrata. they're going into the town of Berlagen and that puts him in fact seven kilometers from the start of the Padestrata. as we look here at the four leaders but we're still holding on to around about a two-minute advantage. But once we start, Phil, to get to the Padestrat and the Molenberg and the Old Aquarium, you're going to see that two-minute advantage really get eaten away. Well, the Molenberg will be the next climb we'll see. And then we go on to the Wolvenberg and then the Old Aquarium. The Old Aquarium is a cobbled route reintroduced after it was taken out, but it's back again. And it's where the riders tend to come to a standstill at the back of the field and push all the worse so they don't lose contact these are the three leaders again the weak telecom rider that's uh, Vincent Jerome Jerome I'm not sure it's <laughs> Vincent Jerome or Jerome Vincent uh, Jerome Vincent anyway he's uh, the rider in the blue on the left hand side there for Boigie Telecom and uh, they're all working exceptionally well together these riders uh, talking yesterday I had a chance to go around to a couple of the hotels and uh, have a chat with one or two riders and I was talking to the mechanics of team Slipstream Chipotle and uh, looking at all the different bikes They're, most of them are riding their Paris-Roubaix bikes today uh, to test out the uh, cobblestones and how they handle on the cobblestones for next week um, what they've done mainly is increase the clearance at the back end so that they can put a, a larger rear tire in although one man who doesn't want to ride his Paris-Roubaix bike today is Magnus Baxter he wants to save it for next week ah, that's the sign of a winner he's ridden some good Paris-Roubaix and even in the year after he won Paris-Roubaix he rode extremely well to finish in fourth place so uh, that was in 2005 so he's ridden very very well indeed in this event but then he has all this bad luck when he crashes he always crashes rather spectacularly and breaks bones and he's coming back again from injury but it looks as though his form is good after a great ride in the three days with the pan well i tell you what i spoke with him last night at the team hotel phil and he was telling me that uh, although he had that very nasty accident in the tour of qatar went down and broke his collarbone the team was so organized they had him back on a plane the next day 12 hours after the accident he flew back to the uk he had an operation to put a plate into his broken collarbone and he was on his bike three days later he said i couldn't pull too hard on the handlebars <laughs> but at least i was riding yeah, good for him too. I remember um, I broke my collarbone once in a bike race and I travelled to work by bus because I couldn't use my bike when I was working in Fleet Street and uh, the bus put on an emergency brake just as I stood up uh, to, uh, to go down the stairs to get off the bus and of course with my broken arm I reached for the handle to stop falling. Can you imagine the scream that went through the bus? 
Well, was that from you or was that from the ticket collector? Uh, from everybody <laughs> concerned, yeah. and the, especially for the bus driver. Just look at this. This, this is, is quite, Tour of quite France. dangerous, isn't it? It is very dangerous. You have to be alert. You, and that's why, at the end of the day, these riders are not only tired physically, but they're tired mentally as well because you're on the edge of the saddle all the time. If you look at them, they're all craning their necks over to the left-hand side, over on the left-hand side of the main field, trying to see what the gap is like. And any of the brave souls will go around the back of the crowd. And the, I think the crowd here is a fairly well-trained oh. crowd because they know not to move, especially if they're watching the bike race, because there could be a bike rider almost anywhere. It's the only place in the world where you see this here in Belgium. And uh, while all this is going on, and you can see the speed of the peloton, the gap has come down to a minute and 40 seconds. So they are, in fact, pulling back those four riders, despite the uh, attractions of the road furniture here just now. Up at the front end there, you can see, just to have a look at how dangerous that is over on the right-hand side there, and in fact, uh, that spectator, everybody's moving back. Uh, it really is... Uh, oh, I'll oh tell you dear. what, uh, that spectator's going to have something to talk about when he goes home tonight, because he's probably got a little bit of sweat from a rider from the yeah. Ronde van Vlaanderen on the back of his shirt. Well, really, you, sh you have to blame the riders for this too. They shouldn't be doing that, uh, taking the, the big risks of the day. Just back at the team car is Alan Davis, chance to see him taking on the bottles, asking how his mate's going up front at the moment. Well, it's nice to see that Alan, as you said, to Phil has got himself a contract for this year because he rode very well in the Tour Down Under. He almost got himself the victory here, but he was battling a really on-form Andre Griepel. Yeah. And, of course, uh, Alan Davis's name not appearing in the World Cup uh, standings because his team doesn't qualify. That's absolutely right. But he's fighting his way back in. He's a very fast finisher. That uh, second place in Milan San Remo last year. Oh, I tell you, that's a squeeze. Uh, it is amazing how they, they've got to keep uh, so alert here. And you see, it's happening to the riders at the back. The men at the front are seeing where they're going. The strong men sit up there. Well, the reason for this is everyone's starting to get just that little bit nervous, Phil. You can see Team Quickstep moving to the front. The reason for that is not that we're getting to a, a Dane, a, an important climb of the day. We're getting right up now to the Padestrat, which is around about four kilometres. Team Liqui Gas also at the front there. They're thinking about their man, Pippo Pozzato. But the Padestrat is a section of cobblestones, a very much a, a, a Paris Roubaix type section of cobblestones, where you've got to be in the first 10 places getting onto it. It's going to be wet, it's going to be dangerous, slippy. There will be crashes and flat tyres, so you don't want to be involved or behind any of that. Well, the weather forecast today was absolutely dire. Let's fan out for these parked cars here. They're actually off the road, believe it or not, but you wouldn't think so right now. Uh, the uh, the weather forecast isn't as bad as it seems because the weather is quite good. We've got blue skies, fluffy white clouds just now. The finishing line and pretty much the same out on the course as the riders will be pretty thankful about this. Although this morning Tor Hushoff did say he'd be very pleased if, if it was snowing today uh, because, of course, he comes from Norway where there's snow aplenty at this time of the year. Yeah, well, he's a, a tough character, is uh, Tor Hushoft. He's a kind of rider who enjoys this kind of terrain. It's, it's a race for courageous riders, men who are prepared to battle and ride at the front and battle for all these sections of cobblestones to get onto them in the first ten places. Looking a little bit further back, this is uh, Joost Postuma, the recent winner. It looks as if he's gone down and had a little bit of an accident. Yeah. He's got a, no a blown nosebleed. A little bit of a problem. Yes, it's running quite profusely right now. Maybe just pressure of the day. Here we are on the pad start, the Kopf on the Red Stride, the leaders of the race, the yellow flag that flies with the black line on it. They are the flag of Flanders. And this is what Paul was talking about now. 2.4 kilometres and a very narrow and a huge crowd, as always. Very long at 2.4 kilometres. In fact, the gap of these four riders, because I think of the approach of the Padestrat and the main field, has dropped down to a minute and five seconds with the acceleration of uh, riders like Tom Bonin's quick step team on the front and Team Guliquigas for Pipo Pozzato. This is actually the nicest part of the Padestrat here, but it starts to get a little bit rougher once you get out into the countryside. Here it's nicely laid, but a little bit uh, in about a kilometre or so, you'll start to see just how rough it is. There's the main field getting themselves organised, and they are now also on the Padestrat here, led by Team Silence Lotto. Yes, it wasn't a good time there for uh, Postuma to go to the back of the race because now he's going to have to fight his way back up here. Now, there's no doubt who Silas Lotto are riding for. There's no Robin McCune in the race, even though he lives on the course at Brackle. Doesn't like the race and isn't taking part. He said he's going training today for five hours. 
and he'll watch the finish on television. Third place here in the line is George Hincapie. Hincapie getting, as you said, a little bit older in his career, but certainly a man of great experience. You can just see him popping out there with the white helmet and the white shirt there of Team High Road. Brand new team for George, and that's quite that's amazing because uh, throughout his whole career, he's basically been pretty much in the same team structure. Team Motorola for a long time, and then Team US Postal Service ever faithful to Lance Armstrong even though he had offers to go elsewhere and had he gone elsewhere he may well have won Paris-Roubaix with a stronger team dedicated to that classic in the earlier days like Mappe, Quickstep etc but now George very happy with Team Iro, very content had made the decision last year to move when he thought he was moving to Team Mobile they withdrew so he finished up on Team High Road. He was very happy before the start. He too was talking about the strength of his team with riders like Bernard Eisel and Andre Griepel, Roger Hammond alongside him. But he also, Phil, had a lot of good to say about Andreas Clear. He said the great thing about Andreas is he knows his way around this country quite remarkably. Even though he's a German, he spent a lot of time riding in this part of the world. Placed in, uh, well, in fact, he won uh, again, yeah, well, yeah. didn't he? He beat Hank Vogel at the time, the Aussie. But uh, this is life at the back. It's not so pleasant, is it, when you're just hanging onto the wheels in front? Behind the bunch, Achteraan van de Peloton, the back end of the main field, and that's certainly not the place that you want to be. It's uh, much safer and much easier to ride at the front end of the main field. Look how the riders have their hands on the top of the handlebars. They're not really holding onto those handlebars really stiffly. They're just keeping them nice and soft. Bonin, you might have noticed there, in about fourth or fifth position, looking very relaxed. He's, he's got the ideal body weight and position to float over the cobblestones, just like Johan Museo did. And the very wet field we've just passed is indicative of the whole region just now. It's been under rain for weeks in and weeks out. And so we're going to see a little bit of mud on the roads. I'm pretty sure of that. And if the riders divert into the fields, well, we'll lose them because they're very, very muddy. But the Belgian people, this is their race and this is their country. And they just love watching this event. Packing all the way around the course. Huge crowd at the start again this morning. And this is a strange place to put a feeding station for but I think we've got one that would actually be one of the illicit feeding stations right. a lot of the teams are organize uh, some of their uh, supporters they call them uh, although they've all got team jerseys on to get to the end of the cobblestone sections with bottles and with spare wheels as well uh, it's actually uh, somewhat contrary to the rules but I think in a race like this because of the special character the referees and the organizers tend to just look the other way Looks like Leif Hoster here in second place, and uh, he's had three second places, now he's riding in second place. Now his number's 27, by the way, and the commentator this morning who interviewed him was referring to two plus seven, and he says, yes, it makes nine, but I have no wish to finish ninth in the event. Um, he's got three seconds so far to his name. A tremendous achievement, but of course, to a professional cyclist, it's the win that counts. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, he was uh, inadvertently second in Paris-Roubaix, although that position was taken away from him, because, if you remember, they That's stopped right. at the railway crossing and they disqualified the three riders who finished second, third and fourth. And he wasn't very happy right. about that. All behind, uh, behind the winner who got through the level crossing, Cancellara. There was Hoster, there was Gusev, and one of the riders slips me at the moment. It was an Italian. Oh, it was Van Pieter. It was either Van Pieter or Vesson. It was one of those two. Anyway, back to the head of the race as the car squeezed quickly by. That might be an indication, Paul, that they're coming up fast. I think they've got this down to about 30 seconds, you know. Oh, as I say, they're saying 35 seconds on the race radio. So they're just behind now the main field. This is a different Tour of Flanders to what we normally see. We normally see the escapers go early, gain big minutes, and then slowly get drawn back. They're going to be all together for the next climb. They've certainly uh, paid a serious amount of attention to this four-man breakaway, and they've never really allowed them to go more than the two-minute mark. That section of cobblestones there was just a small section of cobblestones at 300 metres, and that was the Kerke Plain. And I'm sure it's called Kerke Plain because it goes right next to the church there, just on the top right-hand side. Slowed down just a little bit now, the uh, nervous tension easing as they come away from the Padestrat. And they right Paul Kerka playing it is, a 300 metre stretch this one. It's going to put them, uh, once they come off the Kerke plane, that puts them around about five kilometres away from the Molenberg. And in fact, I can hear race radio crackling in my ear now and uh, accelerating all the cars away from the front end of the main field to give some gap between the front races and, of course, uh, the, the race when it comes into the Molenberg. A very steep and nasty climb, the Molenberg. You approach it uh, along the valley road and then there's a very nasty right-hand bend and you go from a big, wide road for big enough for about four cars in width then all of a sudden 
it's as wide as a tractor. Yes, and it only climbs up to 32 metres, that's about 100 feet above sea level, that's all it is. Uh, but it has a very steep gradient with a maximum increase of 14%, so it's quite a solid wall, this one. Well, Marco Corti there uh, going off the back end of the main field, and that's an indication the pressure is actually starting to come on for a lot of these riders. Marco Corti, the son of the owner of the team of Claudio Corti, I think, Phil, uh, yeah. he's just uh, learning the hard way how tough it is to ride races like the Ronda, as they affectionately call this race here in Flanders. Slowly but surely, the boys are under pressure here. This is uh, David Boucher of Lambeau Credit. He's also slipping away here. We've got a couple of Spanish riders gone off the back as well. We are very close now to starting the ascent of the Molenberg. And then we start uh, what we call the real part of the Tour of Flanders. Well, in the next 25 kilometres, we've got uh, three climbs, uh, which are fairly important. The Molenberg is the next one on the horizon, as you just said. That's followed uh, five kilometres later by the Wolfenberg. And then, of course, uh, for me, the important climb where the Tour of Flanders really starts to split up the main field. At 79 kilometres to go, you've got the Eau de Quaremont, which is a climb of 2.2 kilometres. Although it's uh, fairly steep at the bottom part, it's the false flat over the top that makes it a difficult climb first selection perhaps and that's why Leif Hoster is riding right on the sharp end of the peloton here and not surprisingly keeping an eye on proceedings George Hincapie's made a great move by there he is just off to the left of our picture he's sitting up there so too are the CSC riders is that Cancellara having his dinner it is as well uh, so he's in a very good place I've never seen such a confident man as he is right now I guess that comes with winning well it certainly takes the weight off your shoulders when you start off well as he did in the Amgen Tour of California winning that uh, opening prologue getting himself the yellow jersey but what impressed me more I think in the Tour of California Phil was the way he was actually climbing because normally he's a man who yeah. struggles on the climbs and they said the same thing about Terreno Adriatico which he also won he was riding well on the climbs but not climbing with power he was climbing with great suppleness gap opened slightly to one minute eight so the pressure's gone off because of the trip over the cobblestones behind them now uh, but that will be all put to rights once they get to the next uh, journey along the road here somebody's trying to move up now as they try to regain front position well, you see how they've spread out across the road. This is a, a slight lull. This is a time that you have to take advantage and scuttle up the outside, either left or the right, to get yourself to the front end of the main field until all of a sudden somebody takes control of the pacemaking to stretch the race out into a long line before that right-hand turn into the Molenberg. Steinewalder, the champion of Belgium, easy to spot in his uh, tricolour jersey there of black, yellow and red. He's gone up to the front. He's just in the centre of that picture there. Back to the four leaders now. Here they are. They got away on the Kleisberg, and they're still away, but the gap 68 seconds, so on these long straight roads, uh, they're not going to get too much in advantage now. Well, they've never really been given very much freedom, and I think it's because of the, the weather conditions in the main field and the nervousness of the peloton. They didn't want to uh, chase a, a long breakaway, they wanted to just keep it nice and sensible once we got in to the very difficult hilly. There's another crash at the back end of the main field, the rider just pushed off the edge there. It sounds as though it's one of the top sport riders there. Yes, it is. I didn't see who it was, but he certainly... Uh, it's very dangerous going around the corners here. You've got to pay attention all of the time. Well, he's got back in, but of course he ran out of road. No injury. He's just got to make a lot of work now to dodge through the cars and get back up to the leaders. Not the sort of effort you ever want to make, because you've got to make every effort count on the Ronda. Everybody looking over the shoulders here, looking to see where the teammates are, because they know now it's important to move up to the top end of the main field. Everyone looking to have a teammate with them. Uh, you can see just over to the right-hand side of the white jerseys of uh, F. De Jeux, Francaise De Jeux. They're looking after Philippe Gilbert, who I have to say put in a fine, dominating performance earlier this year in the Het Vault race, where he rode away from everybody in fine style. And he, too, sounded very confident at the start. He's a French-speaking Belgium yeah. on a French team. Now, this is how the accident happened. Just have very a look great. there. Everybody He's uh, squeezing around that traffic circle to get themselves off the road. A little bit of a touch in the middle, and all of a sudden, I think really oh, that went rider who ditch. went into the ditch there, he was just looking for a soft landing. I think it was Frederick Verkellen who went down the ditch there, and it looks like it might even been a teammate who also got involved. But anyway, one thing's for sure, he'd be very smelly when he rejoins in the peloton. Well, uh, I've seen a number <laughs> of riders go into those uh, big ditches at the side of the road. 
we're looking at uh, 75 57 seconds I'm getting my Flemish wrong there 57 seconds is the advantage as you can see now the acceleration the main field taking this very seriously they're getting themselves stretched out now because they're all waiting they put it fixed in their mind and most of the teams will have ridden this course Phil and the preparation for the Molenberg which is next on the menu for today this is the thing you see you see the pressure on the front now to stop anybody catching up this is the race now for the not to get over the top of the Molenberg but to get to the start of it and their whole position it's all about holding position here come the charge of Rabobank guiding two riders possibly here I think all of the faith is in Juan Antonio Fletcher who told us this morning and I have to say I bow to his knowledge that uh, no Spanish rider has ever made the top 10 in the Tour of Flanders and if that's true he's out to put it to rights well he's the man who could he's been great in the Paris-Roubaix classics he's a, a good strong rider and he has been for a number of years here there's a little bit of a struggling at the back here this uh, looks to me like this is oh. Eric Zabel and I think uh, they're saying over race radio that he's coming back after having a, a flat wheel punk, a back flat wheel no back he's, back, he's still got he's it still got it he's waiting for a Leckerbont as they say he's now waiting for a new back wheel so it must have just happened bad luck for Eric bad place to have it especially Awful. just before the Molenberg because that little sign over the road there as a cop van der Weeks ride sees indicating number three and that's the third Hellinger the third climb of the day the Molenberg as you said Phil that doesn't climb very high and it's only 500 meters but I tell you what it really is a, a nasty little acceleration yes looking at the, the gear systems on the bikes this morning at the start uh, surprisingly they were riding quite low gears 24 sprockets on a compact chain set because they know they're short and steep but they have to allow for the fact that they may be brought to a complete standstill and that then requires huge effort on the climb well in fact uh, Fabian Cancellara for the aficionados has got himself a 38 tooth chain ring on the inside and a 25 tooth sprocket at the back yeah. and that again is just in case you've got to start from dead stop and that's a very useful gear of course for the steep coppen bed absolutely well let's look at the back here for a moment Tom Vealers the skill Shimano team and that's the not 57 that's seconds not, no way and you see the rider getting through on the inside there and there now as now halfway down the field they start to slow for that bend but these boys have got control of the head in Cappy in third place again there he is experience showing here for big George here the Molenberg and there's this, the back this <laughs> is why you have to ride at the front because these guys now are going to have to accelerate quite viciously to stay in contact while the guys at the front have gone round at their own speed they've started to ride these men here now have lost themselves 30 to 40 seconds on the front runners because they didn't start the climb at the front could even be a separate peloton once over the top and a long chase to even get back on they just hope now that they will rejoin but some tough riding George there there's the traffic jam at the back again riders now having great difficulty and it's no good complaining but David Boucher is waving his arms asking them all to move along as if they weren't trying to do so and there's Eric Zabel and that's what happens when you get a puncture at the wrong time poor old Eric back there he was wearing that the black raincoat there Zabel at the back end Fabian Cancellara is just over there on the left hand side he doesn't want to show his uh, cards too early but he just wants to ride at the front and I noticed a little bit of cyclocross Zabel yeah. professional here just waiting for the uh, traffic to unfold in front of him but that's an indication Phil that there's a lot of battling yet to do well, it's, a, it's a little bit surprising to see it quite in such a mess at this early stage of the race. Zabel just waiting for a run at the hill here, letting them all get on with it, and then he'll have a go. There's no point in starting and then having to walk again. So you, you've got to take your hat off to Eric. The last time he completed this race, he finished 11th in 2006, and he was 4th in 2005 when he tried desperately to win the race. Having won over 200 races, he's never won this one. Well, he is a star. He's a great bike rider and a fantastic personality as well. I think a little bit unfortunate for Zabel to have that flat tyre at the wrong place but he's being phlegmatic about it if he catches himself back into the race fine all well and good he knows all about it and look at the riders walking up there goodness me now this uh, their race is probably done already Paul well, uh, the reason is they're keeping themselves uh, nice and alert at the front end of the main field, but they know this is not yet the moment to make a big move. They've got themselves now around about 10 kilometres before the next climb of the day, and that is going to be the Wolvenberger, and that's quite a nasty little climb. A rider here from Team Skill has managed to slip off the front, and this looks like uh, Kenny Van Hommel. Well, if he's trying to get up to the leaders, that is going to be a bit of an effort. They're saying it's Robert Wagner. Uh, yes, it is. It's Robert's 238, in fact. It is Robert Wagner. 
who's got clear of the field and well, he's done well to get away over the confusion I presume he's away because meanwhile back on the Molenberg it's still total chaos and imagine how far these riders are now behind and the only reason you'll see in the photographs is because our camera bike is stuck behind them as well well I think the important thing is uh, you have to understand they started the Molenberg as a complete main field and these guys once they go over the top will have lost themselves between a minute and a minute and 30 seconds in the space of only 483 kilometers uh, yes that's right and the rider there from uh, Barlow well Marco uh, Gotti being pushed along by anybody that will give him a helping hand. He just simply cannot get the bike going, and same too applies here to Sergei Lagutin, the rider we saw crash earlier on today. Yeah, I'd actually forgotten, uh, be in between these two sections of cobbled uh, climbs, that the Molenberg and the Wolvenberg fill is actually a very long cobblestone section of around about three kilometres, and that is the Kerke gate, and that is going to be a very difficult next ten kilometres of racing. And look at the panic now on board in the main field as riders scramble to get back to the peloton. Some will get back, uh, not all. Now, a lot of those we've left on the climb will not see the peloton today. They're out of it, for sure. And uh, there's a big group here. We're going to be 140, 150 strong still. Not too sure now where that skilled rider was, but I'm pretty sure he was off the front, uh, Robert Wagner. These slab concrete roads here. Very dangerous, sir, uh, because most of them were laid there uh, many, many years ago, and as they've settled through the rainy parts of the seasons in Belgium, they've uh, left gaps in between. They try to seal them up with tar, but there's always uh, occasions when you'll be find this gap, which is just comfortably enough size for a front tyre to slip down into, and that's when we get nasty accidents. Still lampering, trying to keep uh, on top of this, and looking as though that they have a real chance of controlling it. For the there he is, he's off the front for sure, and he's trying to bridge the gap, because as far as we know, and we've lost contact with Radio Tour at the moment, the four riders are still clear, albeit by just 30 seconds at the start of the Molenberg. I don't think they were bridged. Well, that's a little move for him to try and get across the gap. He's going to find himself in no man's land. The four leaders are still looking to survive, I think, to the next climb of the day. I don't think they will survive up to the summit of the Old Quaramont, which the riders will reach at 185 kilometers into the race again. There you can see Frederic Guedon is the rider from F de Jeux there in the white jersey, former winner of Paris-Roubaix, and of course, great winner of Parry Tours as well and uh, even though he's getting on to 36 years of age he's still a very competitive athlete 25 seconds he is they're just behind the leaders now that lone rider Wagner and probably about 10 or 15 seconds ahead of the pack who've turned off again now because the challenge is not the leaders the challenge is the topography of the country and so they're waiting for the next one now and after the Molenberg it's the Wolvenberg and it's a little way away so that's the next battleground well it's the big acceleration and deceleration as they get to the uh, important strategic points of the race I must say that Gedon seemed to be enjoying it he's uh, feeling pretty pleased with himself he's held his front position on that first climb He'll be well aware of the chaos behind as riders try to rejoin. Was the Politano riding at the front as this well? Is Eric, isn't it? Uh, Eric Zabel. Meanwhile, a life at the back of the race here, and he's still ticking away because he's in a group here, you see. Look at the gap now they've lost here. But that might be the tail. Uh, that's not the field. There's a peloton right ahead. He's going to come back. Well, you see, he used his intelligence there. He didn't want to stop and have to walk up the, the climb. He waited for the race to, to clear up, and he waited because he knew that there would be a slowing down in the main field. A seasoned professional, he knew exactly what he was doing, he didn't want to panic. If I come back in a race like this, it's going to be good luck. If not, well, then I'll go and take an early shower. But there he is in the dark raincoat, just sitting at the back end of the main field. These, a number of years ago, were the kinds of race that Eric Zabel really did enjoy. Just hearing now, the peloton is now a minute 30 back, so they've really shut down again. Nice little bit of Flemish heritage there in the field as the riders go by and they're probably celebrating the return of Eric Zabel, who was once knocked off by a horse, in fact, uh, in this area when he rode in Gent Wavergum. They're all rejoining, that peloton is building, they'll have lost only a handful of rides, I think, by the end of the day on the first uh, climb. A little bit more effort just required to close the gap, never easy. The important thing to do, though, is uh, if you are a rider like Eric Zabel, oh, there's a, this is a problem at the back then, one of the riders from F. De Jure, and that, in fact, is Mathieu Ladagnou, who's uh, 
passing the wheel across to it would must probably be Philippe Gilbert I would think for the panic to be like this it looks like him but we can't see his number nor his face right now his legs look like Philippe Gilbert I would have a guess this is Gilbert because they, they certainly would have tried to help him it is Gilbert yeah now that was bad luck for him but you see because the team cars were so far behind the only solution in a situation like this is to take a wheel from a teammate they've got the wheel across the team cars now are starting to filter their way back into contact and I think Gilbert will find himself very shortly in the main field this is the next section of cobblestones at Kerke Gate 3,000 meters three kilometers or two miles in length nice cobblestones but you will see the main field accelerate over and again breaking into the lead of these men who actually again Phil has managed stretch to the bit. stretch up to around about a minute and 25 seconds yeah and it's because the peloton aren't hunting the four leaders they're just uh, replying to the challenge of the day which is the countryside right now these four boys working well together they get the best shot at seeing where they're going of course we've still got Wagner in between and I'm sure now that the rider at the back here Tom Vailers knows that his teammate is chasing so he may not help that breakaway until his teammate joins well, there you can see a, a rider from uh, F. De Jure, Francaise De Jure, has dropped oh, back. This oh, is the panic the on the right-hand yeah. side, and you can see immediately, once uh, Ladanu had seen the problem, even though Ladanu number 84 has been involved in an accident himself, he stayed in contact with the race, and he's trying to help his teammate back. One of the other riders uh, here, this is uh, Juan Ofredo, who's dropped back to look after the chances of Philippe Gilbert as well. But I think the fact that we've got a couple of corners here is going to allow Philippe Gilbert to get back into the main field, but not necessarily at an ideal point as they start the next section of cobblestones, the Kirkegate. He'll be starting that section right at the back of the field. Yes, and he's going to find himself, uh, he's going to have to pick his way through there for sure, because otherwise it won't be as bad as going uphill, but it's still going to rattle him. He knows all about these roads, by the way, because although he rides uh, on um, a French team, he is in fact a Belgian, although he's a, he's a Walloon rather than a Flamand. He comes from the uh, the Asia area and uh, he speaks French as a first language rather than Flemish, but he's back in the race. Look how far away the front end of the main field is when you're sitting here there an awful long way round the corner. From the front end of the main field to the back end of the main field on a day like this, you're probably looking at there a good 45 seconds. There is Philippe Gilbert. Now, he mustn't panic at a time like this. This, this is the time where you may well find yourself have an accident. He's got a number of teammates alongside him. They need to wait now for a nice open section of road to try and move him up to the front. Yeah, he's just got to live with this now for 3,000 metres because he won't make a lot of progress. He's come back on, though, that's very important. And he's uh, living through the best start of the season he's ever had in his career, Gilbert. Is it would, wouldn't normally say this is a race to suit Philly, but uh, when you're on great form, things can go very well. Well, he's a, an interesting rider because uh, not only does he ride well in the, the Ardennes classics like Liège, Baston Liège and the Flèche Vallon, but he does enjoy these tough Flandrian races. Of course, he was the winner of the Het Volk. But this race, I think, is not something which is completely and utterly outside his ability. Oh, absolutely right. Lampe is still confident that the rider who wears number one, Alessandro Balan, is going to deliver at the finish today. He certainly loves the area of Belgium, and he's done well in this race. There's the Belgian flag flying now. No Belgian riders evident just for the moment, but there's plenty of them here, not least Tom Bone, and we've seen him occasionally. This is the split now in the breakaway. Tom Vielers is going off the back there, along with uh, Jérôme Vincent, I think. It no, it's not, it's just uh, the other guy, it's Sven Renders. So he's giving up the hair and the uh, weather again changing. It's going to be uh, looking out at the finish line. The sunshine is here. It's clear blue skies, but obviously out in the Flanders, those showers are coming through and making the cobblestones very damp. And I think these two guys, Phil, they've raised the white flag now, and I think they realise that it's pretty much all but over. They know what is happening in the main field, so I think it's time out for them. Yes, well, it's still an awful long way to go, and they're cognizant of that fact. But of course. Uh, if the legs decide enough is enough, enough is enough. For these boys continuing good tempo. It's a pity we can't, because the roads are so narrow, we can't get down and see who's actually at the head of that peloton uh, just at the moment. These two riders are now setting the pace. There's the spur wheels and the spectators again. I think it's still illegal, even in modern-day cycling, to take those wheels. Well, this is Andre Grippel at the back end of the main field, the leader of the World Cup. He too now is not enjoying the slippery conditions over these cobblestones. He's not he's losing ground here. As he moves down the back, he looks cool enough, but uh, he must be thinking now, a successful defence of that jersey. He should keep it because 
He got 65 points, I think it was, and there's only 50 up for grabs today, so he should still leave by the end of the day anyway. Well, in the complicated points situation of the World Cup, he actually won himself a points on the individual that's stage as well, yes, to that's give correct. himself that rather strange leading figure of 62. But as you say, I'm not sure he's going to get too many points on a race like today. You can see the concentration now coming into all of these riders' faces. They realise now we're getting into the very important strategic part of the race. Kop van der Wegstrijd on the left-hand side, the leaders of the race. It's now down to just two riders with the main field, the peloton, on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, with, with most of the main contenders there, all of them staying right up at the front end here on this very long section of cobblestones, the Kerke Gate. A lot of concentration on those riders now. They'll all be feeling pretty pleased with themselves. Johan van Sommelen off to the right of our picture there. Pretty pleased with themselves. The fact they're controlling the head of the field and not having to combat uh, the nervous uh, centre of the peloton. And they're not going to give this position up very easily, I can tell you. Just caught a glimpse there uh, in around about 10th or 12th position. In fact, it was Oscar Freire, who is a very good Spanish rider, formerly three times champion of the world, and pretty dominant in Milan San Remo. And he may well put things to right with the Spanish riders' performances in the Ronde van Vlaanderen over the last few years, because he too could be looking for a podium position. This is what the Ronde van Vlaanderen is all about. Now, look at the rain coming down. You can see the puddles at the side of the road. This is a man's race, Phil. This is seriously what the Ronde van Vlaanderen is all about. And you know that an awful lot of riders enjoy this situation. This is what they want, is a very hard race. And uh, they know that there'll be a lot of riders in this field today will not be wanting this race like this. And uh, people like Tom Bonham may not like it either, but certainly there are others who will love it. And the soaking fields here, and now it is absolutely tippling down, making those uh, cobblestones like a skating rink. Well, I'm not sure if there's not a little bit of snow and sleet mixed no, into that weather is. coming down here. They had actually forecast snow. That looks like the skilled rider no coming question. halfway across the gap there. Now, he um, moved away a little bit earlier. That is Robert Wagner. He is at around about 30 seconds, but I think he's probably still only about 30 seconds in front of the main field most unpleasant moments it is in fact sleeting here it was forecast everybody thought on Friday when we had a spring like day with temperatures running up into the mid 60s that they must have been joking in the weather center uh, but they were right the snow was coming and it's here and it's blowing over the Tour of Flanders here it'll only last a few minutes but they of course turns those cobblestones into a very treacherous surface indeed riders now have another little hazard to contend with See the massive crowd, what other sporting event in the world draws crowds like this in weather like this. Uh, the only thing in the favour is it's a free show. Well, I have to say, uh, another sporting event that you and I went to in the early part of the year had weather conditions just like this. The Amgen Tour of California pulled in uh, around about 1.6 million spectators. And who would have expected it when the weather was probably was. the worst that the race had ever seen? Down the Pacific Coastal Highway there, right into San Luis Obispo, it was dreadful. But the crowds are as big as they are today here in the Tour of Flanders and that race of course grows in stature every year maximum 17.3% now Paul as we head on to the Wolfenberg yep the Wolfenberg uh, only 645 uh, meters in length it doesn't sound very much does it but when you realize you've got a 17% maximum for an average of an 8% grade it is a little bit of a difficult climb the riders are realizing now that they're getting into the serious part once they go over the top of the Wolvenberg, they've got another long section of cobblestones to head into the Kattenberg, but they all realize more importantly in around about 20 kilometers time we'll be looking at the Eau de Quarmont. You can hear Paul licking his lips here, he can't wait for that to happen, he suffered over it himself of course, now he's delighted when others do the same. <laughs> That's we now well, see. I have to tell you, I actually used to enjoy <laughs> the Eau de Quarmont, I like the battle to get into the bottom of the, the climb because the important thing about these climbs is if you can get into the first 10 or 15 places you actually end up and everybody ends up riding at their own speed so it's actually the battle before sometimes which is more difficult than the actual climb itself that's the skill is again it's all about holding position but you need strength and courage to hold the front of the peloton before the climb starts a little bit uh, easier for position for these two riders and it certainly looks here as though Tom Back is a bit too strong here by Vincent at the moment well, I have to say, Phil, at the start this morning in Bruges, I didn't think there was a huge crowd turning out to see the Ronde van Vlaanderen, but here, out on the open road, the crowds are as big as they are normally. Well, it's huge by normal standards, but not by perhaps what we expect. 
Uh, and you're right, the crowd seemed bigger than ever out on course. Maybe that's where they all went to today. Here's the peloton. Third rider in the line there in the orange jersey. That's Juan Antonio Fletcher Good looking position. very concentrated, riding up to the front end of the peloton. He would really like to be the first Spaniard ever to win this bike race. Uh, this is the climb again for the main field now on the Wolvenberg. 17% are the maximum part, but this isn't a bad climb because it's not a cobblestone climb. It's a nice smooth climb. The race being controlled there on the right-hand side by Team Milram. You get a chance to see it, uh, how difficult this road is. Team Slipstream Chipotle also got a ride up on the left-hand side. I haven't seen very much of uh, Maggie Backstead. Backstead not wearing the normal team colours. In fact, he's the champion of Sweden, so his jersey, if you get a chance to spot it, will be uh, blue and yellow. That's the same colour as the flag. Correct. Well <laughs> spotted. <laughs> Swedish national colours. This is life again at the back here. One or two riders here from the Slipstream Chipotle team. Just bringing up the rear at the moment. Uh, Fletcher, by the way, terrific positioning for him up front just now. He had a magical early season last year. Two second places, he'd only wish they were first. He was second in fault, the first classic of the year in Belgium, very close to where we're racing today, and second in Paris Roubaix, which again was the it equal the finest ever position. It was uh Poble back in 19, I'm gonna guess this, 1953 when he finished second, and no Spanish rider breached that till uh, last year when Fletcher got on board and equal the position of Poble. So the win is all he wants now to become the finest Spanish finisher. That, of course, will be next week in Paris Roubaix. Well, he could certainly do that. He's a great, tough competitor. Not had any problems so far this season. Really is turning out to be, as uh, they said beforehand, and uh, this morning we could hardly believe it when we looked at the blue Ooh. skies, it was going to be a nasty day. Sorry about that, Paul. I was watching the Liquid Gas rider who lost complete control of his back wheel on that bend, managed to straighten it up in time. I thought we were about to see a few go down. Well, everybody now alert and nervous as they get themselves around this corner. Now, how about that? You know, that's about a 45-degree back on yourself, Ben, that these riders have to negotiate. And that's why you have to stay at the front end of the main field. The front group, which was four riders long now, is down to uh, a single rider, chased by a single rider. Two men uh, who were in the leading group of four, and then Robert Wagner halfway across. But very shortly, I think, once we get to the old Quaramont, that's all going to change. Well, Wagner is just 18 seconds behind the two dropped riders, including his teammate Tom Vilas. So if he can just bridge them, he might well find that they'll lift themselves and go back up to the two leaders as a group of three. Uh, either way, it's all a waste of time, let's face it, because the peloton will wipe them out eventually towards the end of the race. At least some of the peloton will. These narrow, narrow roads here. I remember when I first came to live in Belgium, I lived here for six weeks and it rained every day. Yes, it can be nasty when the rain comes down in the early part of the season and you can have months without seeing the sunshine. It can be a, a very dreary and miserable place, but when the sun does come out, it's a great place to come for a bike race, especially this area where we are here now because this is a very undulating part of the Flanders and it can be very tough if you could search out and find the nasty climbs that the Tour of Flanders manages to do. So they're still the same up front, two leaders out in front, followed by the two chasers, dropped by the break, and then the lone rider, then the peloton, and that's the spread on the field here. Except they're trying to reshape the front here, the peloton now. There's Wynn van Sevenant on the front there for Team Silence Lotto. He's the sacrificial lamb there, of course, for Leif Hoster a little bit later on in the day. They're just dropping down here into the town of Einarme and Edelara, which is where the cobblestone section of the Kattenberg is. And that's where we are currently, uh, Van Sevenant, just looking over his shoulder, just seeing the damage that he's done to the front end of the main field. Calm the ardour a fraction, young man, because uh, it's all going to happen, I'm sure, on the Eau de Quarimont. Well, that's where we're bound for, but not quite yet. We're over the Wolfenberg now, next up the Eau de Quarimont. We'll go out into the country to find it. Einarme is the town, a little bit of smooth road. And that sharp left-hand turn, most of the riders getting back at the back of the field here. Rabo Banker just keeping Fletcher right on the sharp end, ready for the old Quadamont, because that could be where the first selection is about to be made. Well, there will be a split, certainly. There'll be a battle to get into the uh, first corner of the old Quadamont. Then you've got a slightly twisty road until the cobbles start. Just looking over there, you can see Johan van Sommeren sitting up a little bit further back. The gap between the front racer and the front end of the main field now is down to just 40 seconds. And that's amazing because they're not really chasing at all there. Have a look at the back end of the main field. Problem there over on the right there for a rider from Liquigas. 
didn't quite sure who it was well, I exactly. I think it's uh, Frederick Willems, actually. It's I think it was Willems. There you can see, that's the town of Odenarde. There's the town square in the middle. You can see the, the belfry. And in fact, Odenarde is the home to the museum of the Ronde van Vlaanderen. Very well worth a visit if you get a chance. It absolutely is. They've got some of the original cars in there that were used in the days gone by, some of the original bicycles, etc. It's also where the women's race started from this morning. That'll be finishing very soon, up at the same finishing line. That's a World Cup event for the women. Number one is Nicole Cook, the great British rider. Who, uh, who was the winner last year. Well, uh, she'll be looking to try and get herself a, a victory again this year if she can. And uh, they've been opening up the route out on the course here. And that's, in fact, the addition of the women's race over the last couple of years have made it that little bit more difficult for, for the spectators to get around because the roads are mm. closed around about an hour ahead of the men's Ronde van Vlaanderen. Just looking Still, down. a lot of work being done. Team High Road off to the right there. There's people Pozzato there with the flowing golden locks riding at the front end of the main field. The two leaders have got themselves back together there. Uh, Vincent Jerome and Yannick come back. But I think they realise, Phil, uh, very shortly they will be back in the main field. Again, the main field have got themselves through a strategic point, slowing down a fraction, waiting to get themselves ready for the next acceleration, which is going to come very shortly. Stuart O'Grady just popping to the front over on the left-hand side, riding a sensible race. Yes, Stuart's moved back up to the front. Let's hope he doesn't fall off again. He's had a lot of unfortunate crashes, Stuart. When he stays good and fit, of course, he provides us with the results. And uh, we saw him crash out terribly in last July's Tour de France uh, on the descent of the Rosalind. And uh, a real shame, because he was on for a great tour, I think. But he's bouncing back, as he always does, the man from Adelaide. There he is at the moment. George Hincapie comes up again. Second wheel here, having a chat, telling him exactly what wants to be done. Well, Team High Road have seriously been, I think, given the nod there, Phil, by uh, George Hincapi to move to the front end of the main field. They know what's coming up next. They've got around about 15 kilometres before they get to the old Quaramont. They'll leave Odenada behind them. They'll go through Bevere, Lupechem, and then into Berkham, and that's where the big, the big climb starts. Just look at this absolute chaos as they start to make the turn here. I can tell you now that uh, Judith Arndt has just won, and that's a big 50 for the American team high road. I'm not surprised she was delighted. She's just crossed the line in first place in the women's event on the same finish line as the men. So a good victory for Judith Arndt. And in fact, uh, Nicole Cook came in at the back end of that group a little bit further back. Looking down the road then, the rain is with us, I'm afraid. Again, I don't know how long it will last. It's still quite nice at the finishing line of the uh, of the Tour of Flanders. These are the two survivors of the breakaway. Well, they're surviving not by very much as we look back. There's a rider coming across. In fact, the two riders coming across the gap here. And I wonder if it is Wagner or if it's still his teammate. I think it's the original two coming back here, and I thought Wagner would have joined them, but it looks like he's never quite closed that gap, which was down to about 15 seconds. But these are the two riders who were originally with the break, I think. Yep, they are. They're uh, going to reform at the front end of the main field, making a four-man leading group, with Wagner still uh, hovering, they say, at around about the 15-second mark. So Villers, Renders, Vincent and Tom Back are all back together again. Chance to use our caption again, which... Uh, caption operator had generated a while ago probably thought for the last time into Odenard this is the town square in Odenard a very nice town square very much reminiscent of a real typical Flandrian scene and made more typical I suppose Phil by the snow that seems to be coming down the temperature dropping to around about zero degrees uh, funnily enough as we drove down here to the finish line this morning the car temperature was registering a very healthy 12 degrees Celsius it's certainly not that now that's right around about 56 degrees Fahrenheit and then once the snow comes it just plummets and it goes to little above 40 45 and these riders at least have got a bit of a sweat on right now so that should help just wondering if we're actually on top of the museum here as we head down uh, the centre of Ronde von Flandre is the street here by the way is called the Ronde von Vlaanderenstraat so it's, it all happens in Odenard. It all comes together here. This is, as you said, where the women's race started from. It, that's all finished now, but this, for me, is really just about to start. They're heading down there through the magnificent uh, backdrop there on either side of the road of the daffodils that have come out in the early part of the season. And now we have to think about uh, who is going to be the man to make the first selection once we come to the old Quarum, followed by the Paterberg, followed by the Koppenberg, 
big climbs are still to come. I'm just wondering why on earth Robert Wagner never caught up with his two teammates. He was only just behind them, and uh, it was the obvious thing was to go forward. It must mean that his actual teammate, Tom Velas, uh, could never have known he was chasing, otherwise he would have allowed him up so they could have gone up and made five. Well, you know, he was uh, into 18 seconds deficit at one say, stage, yeah. and now the race referee is just saying that he's hovering at 22 seconds. I think he got halfway across the gap, and then he hit the wall. He just couldn't close down that last little bit. As uh, I see, Rabobank have manipulated themselves. Quite a few riders at the front there. They're saying it's all for one today. They're racing for Fletcher. They believe in him. They think he has the ability, and uh, he's certainly delivering at the moment. Well, he is, and uh, everybody's starting to get that little bit nervous now. They've got themselves over a few climbs, but they realise this is the time when you've got to be very attentive and make sure you don't get caught at the back end of the main field and don't have to waste energy chasing back into the peloton, as Eric Zabel did a few moments ago with a very badly timed flat tyre. Zabel is comfortably back in the main field, and I'm sure he will have used all of his experience to uh, weasel his way through the peloton and get back up to the front. Last man around the corner there was uh, Bastian Gilling from the uh, Van der Schoenen team of uh, Cycle Skullshop. This is another Sonia Duval rider here now trying to bridge away from the field. The thing is the riders are never in the same direction for more seemingly than a kilometre or so before they change direction again. This all leads to a very hard pace. Well, if you've not ridden this bike race before, we're now moving into a very complicated part of the route because, uh, you're right, you're zigzagging now through the Flanders, uh, crossing uh, fields to try and find the next climb of the day. You're one moment going east, then west, then north and south, and uh, if you don't know your way around here, you really have no idea where you're going to or coming from. This is the chaos which will ensue throughout the rest of the day here now. With Stuart O'Grady just going through the uh, team cars. I think he's just been back to have a quick chat with the team management there. Confident. The best thing to do at the moment. Sorry about the bit of camera bag up here. The trees are affecting the pictures just at the minute. A few riders from Team CSC had uh, slipped off the back end. I think maybe they're taking advantage of this slight lull in the tempo, Phil, to have uh, what they would probably call a natural break. And there is Fabian Cancellara as well. Yeah, there's definitely been a, a group decision here to take time out. They're coming back nicely, but they're confident enough to do this. They've obviously sensed the slowing down of the peloton just a little bit for the moment. Last man up there looked as though it was uh, Baden Cook again. So he's picked the right wheels and his mate Stewie. So, well, they're good friends off the bike. They certainly are good friends off the bike here. Uh, but as you can see, uh, I think we're starting to get some seriousness at the front end of the main field again. They've uh, gone through Odenada. They've got, uh, by my calculation now, about 14 kilometres to go to the start of the old Guadamon, which is why you can see this seriousness starting to come into the field. Well, they t they've tried to chase away off the front, but they've also tried to shut it down at the back here, so the pressure is very much on here. I think the next time check we'll find that they were, uh, we're going to bring back that leading group because there's a five or six man break trying to get clear. Frederick Guedon is riding there in third position. I think seriously here this afternoon he will probably be looking after the hopes of Philippe Gilbert because he's definitely the man on form for Francaise de Jure and definitely the man who would love to win this race. As you said, although he's a French-speaking Belgian, this is a big race for the Belgians. It's not only yeah. the biggest bike race in uh, the country, it's actually also the biggest attended sporting event of the year. Looking at the way this breakaway is forming here, individual team riders leaving a lot of riders behind to block off, and that could mean this breakaway might start to go clear here now. Well, this is uh, one of those silly little moves that seems to form when somebody lets a gap go in the front end of the main field, and that is what is happening. They're looking over the shoulders. They've seen the possibility of a gap. The Lamprey rider there, formerly a lead-out man for Mario Cipollini, is Paolo Fornacciari. He's a big, strong bike rider, very happy and uh, having a great laugh at the start this morning when he could see his uh, team leader, Alessandro Balan, being interviewed in Flemish with the Italian responses. <laughs> well, that's a crash. crash here. We're well, going back down the field. This looks like a rather heavy fall. Sony Duval is down. Astana sat on the roadside. And the rider from Quickstep has gone down as well. Just looking there, the rider from uh, Credit Agricole, Angu, Jimmy Angulvon went down quite hard. There's a rider from Ouch. Quick Step. Now that doesn't look too Unlucky good. Unlucky for some, Stephen de Jong. That's number a serious 13. Ball, that. Yes, very sad. Well, look, so the Stephen de Jong, uh, we've followed his career for a long time since we watched him racing in Australia, and it's sad to see somebody go down quite so hard. 
not so good for uh, Tom Bonin either to lose a, an ally like that. Now this is uh, this is our man who's come across the gap here, and I think he's just about to make the junction here. Robert Wagner finally, after a very long chase, makes it five in the lead. And the final composition by Robert Wagner as he gets up. We've now got five riders uh, in the lead. It might all happen a little bit too late on because that crash will inspire some chases. But five for the moment, and two riders from Skill Shimano, so they're warranting their wild card efforts around the country, especially for the organisers of the Tour de France ASO. They haven't got an invite to the Tour de France, as far as I know, but uh, they're in their other events. Another little move there as we look at the uh, replay of this acceleration just a few moments ago. This, I think, uh, prolonging the agony here, Phil, because you can see the main field, they're basically just staring at this guy saying, look, we know what's coming up next. We know it's the old Quartermont very shortly. We're not too far away from the Odenard barn or the Odenard street and that's when they'll start to accelerate and, and try and get to the front for the start of this climb again a little incident at the back there right from Boyd Telecom it really is all starting to happen see they slip off the concrete and just bordering the concrete are these little cobblestones and they're all laced with mud you can see it there if you lose the ground you're in trouble and this rider here is a Putsep Erki oh they're saying it's almost oh, 58 I thought it was 56 so it's Frank Renier Quite sure where this guy thinks he's going here at the well, moment. He's got himself no two the meters fifty off the front end of the main field, and they're all looking at each other, probably saying the same thing. Where do you think you're going, young man? Because we ain't giving any tickets out right now. No, we're all thinking of the next climb, which will be hill number five of seventeen, uh, the old Quadamont, and that's where it's going to start for sure. And you can almost feel the atmosphere here now. As he looks over his shoulders, he may as well wait, or at least he's holding a good position at the head of the field, but they're all sitting there, they're all massing liquid gas, quite clearly confident that they have Pizzato in the thick of the action. Francais de Gilles got Gilbert as their leader. They're up there as well. Stuart O'Grady, uh, a little while back uh, in the cars, uh, up in the front 10 or 15 places there, you can see him just popping through. Very serious, as Stuart O'Grady. Christophe Morgin in the white jersey there and the glasses, a former French and national uh, cyclocross champion. F. Desjeux riding carefully at the front end of the main field. Team Slipstream Chipotle are represented at the front here as well. There is Eric Zabel. How you did see, he do that? Incredible. Tactics and uh, knowledge of the terrain have certainly helped him get himself back up to the front. Uh, Great competitor. Superb. Oh, superb riding by the old man of the peloton, Eric Zabel. There he is in the blue and the black top. Always alert, looking around, to tremendous skill, but not just skill, a huge effort there uh, to close the gap and now resituate himself at the head of the race. That's terrific. He knows where he's got to be. It's a matter of being able to do it because once we get on to the old Quadamont, uh, the race is certain to fragment. Well, that's uh, a typical view of the Flanders here and there's a typical view of the Flanders at this time of the year. You can just see how damp and nasty it is out there. But these guys are not even worrying about the weather conditions here. They're worrying about the older Quaramont. There is Stein de Volder, the national champion, formerly with Team Discovery Channel, over to the right-hand side. Another quick, ste quick step rider moving forward. Mm. That's all for Tom Bonin here this afternoon. Philippe Gilbert in the middle in the white jersey with the, uh, the clubs on it. That is the Francaise de Jeux. Coffee dish. Just looking at the weather here, Paul. It's, it's uh, all started to go a little bit wrong for them again in the weather stakes. And the confidence riders here, the Chavanel and Kevin Duvert. So uh, Sylvain Chavanel is having a great start here. Frank Hoy, I think, is in there as well. There's Bonin just over on the right-hand side. He's very alert as well, and he's uh, riding comfortably at the front end of the main field. He will revel in conditions like this. Uh, this is, uh, I can't believe, Phil, the weather conditions out on the course, because on the finish line, it's, fine. it's still absolutely dry. But what the uh, weather people told us this morning was it was going to be like this we were going to get rain snow hail and it certainly has come true well they're getting it that's for sure as it started to hail again here most unpleasant conditions now these boys are well out of it at the head of the race it looks only four of them we've left to, oh was he just peeping in i think he's just peeping into our off camera here. well there i think uh, they're about to see themselves pulled back into the main field it's been a long escapade they've got themselves a little bit of television time for the sponsors here this afternoon, but now that the race is about to start in earnest, they're about to see the big guns come out to play. Well, you wouldn't think it was spring looking at the trees right now because it's hardly time to spot those leaves. 
we're looking at about 10 seconds advantage for these guys the last time check we got was a minute and eight seconds and then it was 33 seconds and now it's almost over 2.8 kilometers to go to the Eau de Quarmont. as you said the fifth climb of the day it's 2.2 kilometers in length the average gradient is only four percent but it's 12 percent at the bottom and it's 1600 meters of cobblestones and it's narrow and it's uh, high hedges around the side of it there is a coffee shop on the top for those who'd wish to stop and call an end to the day but i think most of them will continue on as they still try to all come back together well there's the catch and we uh, since uh, the early part of the day for the first time we're looking at what the italians would call a gruppo compacto well they chased so hard over those last few kilometers that the boys up front really didn't have much of an option there We've got big Johan van Sommer, those long, lanky legs of his. He's a driver, he really is. Well, there you go. Uh, they've just said it in French now, uh, regroupement général. And now is when the général van Sommeren on the front here is starting to take over. There you can see the big rider from Team Quickstep is looking after uh, his big teammate, Tom Bonin. That was Herr Stegemans in the blue jersey. On the right-hand side is Bonin. Now, this is almost, Phil, oh, it's resplendent a of a sprint finish. <laughs> just look at it. It's a virtual race finish just to get to the turn onto the old Quadamont. And now they've got to break very hard, and it looks a little bit glacial down there. Tight fit on the right-hand side of the picture. And look at the cobblestones just to make it a little bit more nasty as well. And now we see the boys at the back having to slow up, slow down, and make a hugely different effort to stay with the race well we're about to two kilometers to go you can see team silence a lotto all over the front end of the main field team predict all lotto it was last year there's a problem at the back here for a rider from lotto and now he is going to have a hard time getting himself back in what a bad place to have had a flat tire i had a flat tire he made a complete mess of his gears there but anyway he's left behind his two teammates are driving on led by van summer in here Hats off to Tom Bonin, the winner of this race twice, looking today to join the all-time greats with three. He's tucked in at the front. Well, let's have a look and see if there was an incident at the back here. In fact, just after the corner, that's when the lotto rider had the problem, stopped in the middle of the road. I think uh, something must have happened to his bike, but uh, he's up and I riding again. But at gears. the front end of the main field here, you've got the big names. Alessandro Balan moving up there. There is Tom Bonin, Gerd Stegemans, Leif Hoster. All the big men, Phil, have realised that this is the important part of the race. You've got to get around those corners, get yourself into the front uh, 10 or 15 places because there's no acceleration. And Mr. Personality over on the left-hand side there <laughs> at the front end of the field, Eric Zabel with the blue, uh, with the black raincoat on. If he took 10 years off his age, it, they'd everybody be worried to death about him. He's had one win already this year, Eric, by the way. He's heading up. He'll be 38 years old. Uh, joined the Tour de France this July. And it wouldn't surprise me to see him in that race just one more time. And now he's uh, he's right back on the sharp end. He, his head and his legs are still in unison, which is terrific. Well, as you can see here, this is the uh, the flat part of the old Aquarement here. There is absolutely nowhere at all that you can accelerate and get yourself to the front end of the main field, which is why we had such a great battle. Obviously, Eric Zabel is in great form. You know, if you were ever a supporter of Sean Kelly as a bike rider or Laurent Jalabert, the next man you have to support has got to be Eric Zabel because this is the master of longevity and the master, I suppose, Phil, of dedication to the sport. And the man with the most wins uh, currently racing, of course. He's got over 200 victories to his career now. His career started back in 1992, where most professionals we talk about having a career of eight years. Here's a man here been a pro since 92 we're looking now at the head of the field here they have caught the four-man break of the day they're all together they have fought valiantly to hold front position Hincapi is up near the leaders Eric Zabel's peeping into the left of our picture also up at the front here is Tom Bonin and Alessandro Balan last year's winner look how narrow the road is this is now the approach to the old Quadenberg well, yes, Old de is this, in fact. And I tell you what, all of the big names moving up to the front. It was a massive battle to get in here. Here is the acceleration starting right now. They're onto the cobblestones. This is the steepest part of the Old Quadermont. There's 1.6 kilometres of cobblestones, although the climb itself is 2.2 kilometres in length. The steepest part, Phil, is right here at 11.6%. And this is where the race normally splits up for the first time. And once they go over the summit of this climb in four kilometres, they've got another 
nasty climb called the Paderstrasse. Which is why they'll keep the pressure on. We're already hearing calls from the race cars behind that riders are stopping at the rear of the peloton. We may not see pictures of that, but the riders on the front now are tapping out the rhythm, and this is already beginning to split the field. It looks like we've got Fletcher in second place for Rabobank. Well, we talked at the start about the weather conditions. At the start, the weather was pretty fine. At the finish here, there is no rain on the ground, but out on the course, as you can see, it's raining intermittently. There's a bit of snow coming down. Now and again, there are hailstones, and that is battering onto the riders' bodies and their legs and thighs, and you can see the wind rippling in the flags of Flanders there. This is going to be a tough test. This is making the race, which is a tough race to start with, even more difficult. Well, Team High Road have got control of the breakaway and at the head of the peloton just behind. Hincapie has held a very good position. They'll take a lot of confidence in the team riding from that. This, Just take a look at those cobblestones now because this is how difficult they are at this stage of the race. I think it's Vassfall who's there um, for the Gerlsteiner team. And there's the steep part at the moment. Well, there's a little cafe that Phil always talks about over on the left-hand side there, but there's not very many people here stopping for a little cup of coffee here this afternoon. Now, this, to me, Phil, is always the toughest part here of the old Quaremont because this is the town of Quaremont, and it now drags up in a false flat for about 1.2 kilometres. What makes it more difficult is not really the gradient, it's the fact that you've got a very nasty wind battering across the road, making it difficult for the riders. Looks like Thomas Veitke here on the front here for Team Astana, not selected yet for the Tour de France, and they're hoping to allow their legs to do the talking over the next few months and try and persuade the organisation ASO to let them into the race with the defending champion Alberto Contador and the defending third-place finisher Levi Leipheimer. Well, this is the tempo we expected on the Quaramont, and this is where it is starting to split up. It's only a four-star, the hills are judged one to five stars, by the way, the Muir, the wall at Capel Muir, the church wall, that gets five stars. Hill number 16, the last climb, the Bosberg, uh, gets four stars, probably because it's a, a strategic position near the end. But you're looking out along what are most certainly now the bleak fields of Flanders here, as the Tour of Flanders is pulled out into a long straight line. Every man for himself, even if they are riding shoulder to shoulder, as they try to control this race. They came to the foot of the climb altogether. Riding up at the front there in second position is Tom Bonin, I can see, followed by Leif Hoster. There's the acceleration on the older Quaramont and the pressure coming down from Team Astana. Johan Brunil, Phil, said to me yesterday, no pressure on my squad here this afternoon. All we're going to do is ride a race to enjoy it. We may well look out for Gusev down towards the end because he's a tough competitor, but looking over his shoulder here, he can see the damage that's being done. And coming across, that looks to me as if it may well be an acceleration from Leif Hoster. The old Quaramont, and it looks as though it is Leif Hoster. The man has finished second on three occasions, trying to get up with the leaders here. Now, that is going to cause a lot of riders here now to react to this man, who is on a mission. He's trying desperately to replace the memories of three second places with a win, going up towards the leaders, checking on, seeing uh, just what's going on here as he joins the leaders now. And we've got four riders clear. Well, in fact, as they go through the feeding station here, you can see the little acceleration coming across. This is the Ronde van Vlaanderenstraat, and that was an acceleration coming across there by Tom Bonin, who's come up to make this a five-man leading group with Johan van Sommeren as well. So Leif Hoster has got himself a little bit of friends there. And as you can see, the main field scrambling to stay in contact. Well, I think it's reasonable to say now that the Tour de Flanders has taken a couple of hours, but now it has really begun. And that is a group now led by Johan van Sommelen here, trying to organise something special. Well, we expected this would be where the race would start today and it is certainly seeming to be the case. Well, it's important to keep the pressure on. You see the older Quarima once again has split up the main field. We're looking down there at a group of maybe 15 riders. Everybody else is now scrambling to get back into contact because you've got Hoster there. And this is a little bit further back. You see the damage has been done because the, the, remen the remnants of the main field are still just getting to the top of the summit of the old Quarima. Well, that's a big chunk of riders out of the race right now. This uh, peloton here is about to repair itself uh, but when it gets together you've probably got no more than 50 riders here as they're coming slowly back together all under the impetus of the drivers at the front 
and the strong men want this peloton to be much smaller now so they can concentrate on the race get rid of the nervous energy well you can see that little gaggle of riders at the front they've seen they've done the damage there it's getting themselves together and they don't want to set the tempo right now but they know they're nice and safe because in about two and a half kilometers they've got another very nasty climb the Paterberg itself a steep climb with a maximum gradient of 20.3 percent now that is pretty nasty well, that's one in five in old money as they come over the Paterberg here. Two kilometres to go to that climb of the day. Now, this will take us up to climb number six. It's a four-star rated climb. As Paula said, it's got that 20% middle gradient on it. It's not very long, you know. It's only 360 metres. The average gradient is 12.9, but these guys know how nasty it is. And I wouldn't be surprised with weather conditions like this if we don't see one or two riders actually having to get off and walk on this climb. And if they've walked this one they'll certainly walk up the next one which is the Koppenberg once you get wheel spin on these steep cobblestone climbs you've got no chance you've just got to dismount and dismount quickly or fall off is that a, a problem yep. riding there's going? another crash gone down there there's, 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 there's a guy one in the field there goodness knows how he got over the hedge but that's what happens the road gets too narrow the man on the inside clips the grass and over he goes it's a CSC it's a rider. rider too it is a CSC rider who's gone down there Gives you a chance to see just how nasty it is off the side of the road here. This is going to be, and a lot of the Flemish people said this morning, a monumental Ronde van Vlaanderen this year. There's a mechanic over to the right-hand side there, and uh, I think that rider from CSC is certainly uh, looking for a little bit of assistance. There's the, the remnants of the main field. Let's just have a look. I didn't see how that happened. It happened just a little bit further back. There was an accident in the middle of the road, yeah. and the guy from CSC, here, I think he had nowhere else to go. I think he just took a dive over the hedge there and now down into the ditch. The only uh, best part of this was he had a soft landing, but that's about where it ends. And we can't see, can't make him out at all or his number. It looks like we're back up with him here at the moment. See if we can swing around and take a look at his face. Well, it's hard to see his face in a day <laughs> like this, so we get a big as sweep well. as we see I'll him. I'll tell you who it him. isn't. Well, I'm not sure I can tell you who it is. It certainly it could be uh, it could be Lars back actually, who's gone down there. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't Cancellara or Carsten Kroon or Stuart O'Grady. But you can see here, this is uh, again a fairly small group and this is the damage that has been done by the old Uquarama. I always talk about the old Uquarama as being a very important place. There's Juan Antonio Fletcher He's over there. to the left-hand side in the orange jersey of Team Rabobank. There's a rider in there from Credi Agricole as well and I wouldn't be surprised if that wasn't Big Tor Hushoft and riding comfortably Tom Bonin. It's the first time we've seen him this year, Phil, uh, riding uh, with a desire to win. I have to say, though, that that split really was due to Van Summeren here because he was the man that split them off on the old Faramont. Here the we go again. And here we are on the next climb of the day now. This is the four-star Paterberg with that steep 20% gradient right in the middle. The group is still clear from the old Quadamont, but let's face it, Paul, it is still a very, very big group here. But Johan van Sommeren driving on the front, Bonen on the right. We are 75 kilometres to go to the finish, and you're already looking at the heads of state. Bonen, as you've said, is there on the right-hand side. There is Alessandro Balin in the pink. There is George Hincapie in the white jersey, in the white helmet. Hoster is over to the left-hand side. There, in fact, in the, in the second row as well, is Fabian Cancellara. The big boys are showing their faces at the front with two hours of racing still to go. But they've no choice because if you lose position, you lose the race. You can't shadow box in the Tour of Flanders. There is the pack now, slowly getting strength from behind. The riders in the far distance still recovering from the previous climb, the old Paramount. Uh, we've seen one CS rider go over into a ditch, and we're not sure who he was. We think it was Lars ba uh, Lars, uh, Lars back. Yeah, Lars back, who went over there, out of the race. But very impressive so far, Tom Bonham, sitting at the front here. Now he's stamping his authority on this climb as well as he comes up towards the summit. It's not very long, the climb. It was pretty steep. So first man out is Tom Bonham, looking for three, remember, to join the greats of our time in the Tour de Flanders. Well, that's the way to do it, to dominate the climb. There's his teammate going through, the champion of Belgium, Stein de Volder. The uh, difficult thing about where we are at the moment, Phil, is in just six kilometres from the summit of this climb, they've got to get to the summit of the Koppenberg. Again, not a very long climb, just 600 metres. It doesn't sound very much when you say it quickly, but this is a steep climb coming up next because that is 22% the gradient at its maximum part and all about 50 riders are on the back heels here just trying to repair damage rather than take part in the race which is going to make it difficult for them the Koppenberg is a five-star climb 
as you say, Paul, it's one of the toughest. It's well known in the Tour de Flanders as the field here continues to rattle over the Paterberg. Well, it's a question of survival now. It's a question of trying to get yourself back into the race once you've been uh, tailed off the back on a climb like the old Quaramont. And these riders here in these groups will be paying zigzag all of the time. Life Hoster over on the left-hand side. Tom Bonin there on the right-hand side, just making contact with one or two spectators. But these men are going at mano a mano, as they say in the sport of professional cycling. Number 71 there is Laszlo Bodrogi. He's better suited as a, a great individual time trialist. Uh, he's at the back of the group now as they go over the summit here of the Paterberg. No lead out for Tor Hushoff from Laszlo. I don't think he's going to get back here. It was good to see the image there of George Hincapie in the second line over the top. He's concentrating well and he's riding well. And we think there might be something in George today. He's not been, uh, apart from his stage seven win in the Amgen Tour of California, the last day victory for him on what was a very wet day, but a terrific victory for him. We're now looking for him coming good here. Similar conditions, actually. Probably very, very slightly warmer, but only slightly. So we're looking down at the leaders here now as they continue to drive towards the next challenge of the day, which is the Koppenberg, and that is five-star. Johan van Sommeren on the frontier, looking over, just trying to figure out who is in this group. Well, I can tell you the riders we've seen so far are Fabian Cancellara, Leif Hoster, George Hincapie, and, of course, big Tom Bonin. It's not a very big group either. It's down to around about 20 men yep. as we look uh, to possibly four kilometres maximum until we get to the Koppenberg, and that really is a legendary climb. If we talk about the forest of Arenberg in Paris-Roubaix, then we have to talk about the Koppenberg in the Ronde van Vlaanderen. Absolutely. I make this group 35 strong, and it's being led by Stein de Volder, the champion of Belgium. Just 35 riders. This is an indication that the guns are firing a little bit early on this year. They didn't allow the breakaway to go clear. They just gave them a minute or so. I think they only got a minute 30. was the biggest lead they got. They chased them down, not literally chased them down. The infighting brought them all back. And now the strong men try to go clear. I'd love to be in amongst it to see just who of the favourites has missed that split. Uh, but because of the nature of the course, our cameras can't get down amongst it just yet. That is the chaos of a race like this. And uh, the riders themselves in the individual groups, they know exactly what's going on. But watching from a distance, watching from a high spot like this, it's hard for us to know who has missed out. The guys in the groups behind now are scrambling to try and get themselves back into this race and it really is a nightmare if you're in one of those groups because it's like having a long piece of elastic you pull it out as long as it'll go before snapping and then slowly hope that it's going to pull you back into the main field those riders at the front will start to slow down a fraction now giving these smaller groups behind a chance to make contact there was again one of those little illicit bottles at the side <laughs> of the road and they will put that down to a very friendly spectator but I can tell you one thing it's highly organized and talking to one or two teams they've got riders they've got to help us out at around about 14 places along the race route today not in the first 150 kilometers but in this last hundred kilometers of racing and it's very necessary. It looks as though Stein de Vol here trying to plug in his race radio, his earpiece there. He's probably covered in mud by now, I would think. He's not too sure he's receiving. Anyway, Tom Bonin riding brilliantly, dead centre of the road here. And that's a big position for him to be in. Fletcher just off to the right. He's here too. I think Gusev is also here. So some big names in this group as they head up towards the next challenge of the day. Philippe Gilbert has made this split as well. Tell you what, Tom Bonin is actually using a very small gear. He's got a lot of supperless in those legs, which looked absolutely huge this morning when he was standing on the presentation podium. He was looking extremely relaxed and ready to do battle on this day. And as you said a number of times, Phil, he's looking to write his name in the history yeah. books today to become one of those special riders who's won the Ronde van Vlaanderen on three occasions. And he's young enough to go on and win it four or five times. Could become the outright record holder. That would make him a superstar if he isn't already here in his home country of Belgium this is a very select group around about 35 men have made the first split they're not pushing on they know this race isn't won here but it could be lost here uh, they're in a safe position to continue they'll be concerned about who is in this group the boys behind will start bridging gaps as fast as they can get across I'd like to see exactly who is in there but I have to say the race referees just now doing a great job 
because they've got no cars in these gaps they've got them all out of it which means that it's really hard work now for the groups to close the gaps well it's also very hard work for the managers to get into those gaps because there's hardly a place here where you can actually overtake and that's why this is such a special race and that's why you have to make sure that you've got a good place in the team cars behind because uh, once these races start to split up in the cobblestone sections it can take you 10 to 20 kilometers to get back behind your riders to help them in case they have a flat tire well, I have to say no sign of global warming in Belgium this winter they've had more than their fair share of rain as we look here at the leader of uh, the race, which is Stein de Volder, there's just something about André Griepel on the radio there. Well, he's actually the, the leader of the World Cup after the Tour Down Under Phil has just abandoned at the side of the road, uh, obviously not enjoying the weather here compared to the weather he had in Adelaide in South Australia. No points for him, but with 62 points, he can't be caught today, so he'll need to come to the finishing line to receive his next white jersey. He just got uh, those few points for winning four stages. Uh, to make him uh, safe for at least this event but next time of course he's going to be in trouble the peloton continues to cut its way through the sinuous track here of the Tour de Flanders the rain has started again the group of 35 is swelled probably up to 50 or 60 riders just now and nobody off the front because they're virtually the strong men are blocking the road here well, we're looking now at uh, the acceleration as the riders set themselves up, Phil, for the Koppenberg. Winding their way through the Flanders, just look at those fields. They are absolutely sodden in mud. It's very wet. It's been raining for over a week, and that bodes well, I think, for next week in Paris-Roubaix as well, because there we're going to have a very similar situation. This is a small group trying to get themselves back into the race. The teammates of Team Quickstep and Silence Lotto have really got to struggle to get themselves back into the race here because they need need to be alongside their leaders in a race like this because at the moment currently this is a may a race as if it was a race from the previous era where there is no support there's no technical support yep. at this point in the race because the team cars could be almost five minutes behind any trouble and you're out it's 50 seconds to the next group of our picture to the leaders there so that's a big gap now and it could go bigger as we get on to the next climb of the day the Koppenberg uh, as I say, we've just heard that uh, Andre Griepel, the World Cup leader, has stopped by the roadside and abandoned the race, so another name has gone from the event today. It, your, your fortunes change so quickly in Flanders. You can say, I'm feeling great, I'm going well, you have a slight problem, and you find you cannot catch the leaders again, your day is over. Well, you have to be courageous, you have to battle through those moments there when you do have a bad time, uh, you mustn't give up. Johan Museo for many years had crashes and flat tyres at the wrong moment but still rode himself back into the event. Stein de Volder is at the front of this group here and you can see still one or two riders, little small groups of five, six, maybe ten riders are, are returning to the front end of the main field only to get whacked again in the head by a hammer in a short moment's time when they start the climb of the Koppenberg. We are looking down from the helicopter now on the leading group here in the Tour de Flanders. It's swelled from around about 35 to possibly a few more than 50. Another nine are rejoining at the back, and it's 50 seconds spread now from here back to the next main peloton. It's all happened on the Peterberg. We're still bound for the Koppenberg, which is the next big climb with a, a steepest gradient of 22%. We're turning onto it now, and uh, this is a very select group, and they'll work hard now to break off the rest of this race. Well, just to tell you about the Koppenberg, it's only 600 metres long, but it's a 22% the maximum gradient, 11.6% is the average, and it is all cobblestones. It's actually been relayed over recent years because it was coming much too dangerous to use, but it is a phenomenal climb. It's a dangerous climb, and a lot of riders putting very low gears on 25 tooth sprocket for some of the riders. Tom Bonin is there on the front, followed by Juan Antonio Fletcher. There is Leif Hoster, Hincap, he's not far away either. Stein de Volder, the champion of Belgium. Where else should you be when your country's national champion is right on the front on this most revered climb of the Tour of Flanders? Tom Bonin on the right there is keeping in the saddle. You've got to stay in the saddle. If you get out of the saddle, you lose control of your bike, you know, finish up leaning against the wall, which on this occasion is grass. Looking down the group here now as well, we know Alessandro Balan, last year's winner, is still up here. Look at the strength of Bonin here. He just uses those shoulders, those huge thigh muscles. He stamps on the pedals. He's too strong for the race right now. Well, this is a show of defiance. Uh, this is me, Tom Bonin, showing you guys 
how strong I am here this afternoon. This is the only way to ride this climb. There's no easy way. You can't hide back. You can't hold into the main field there. You've got to show how strong you are, and you can only ride up at your maximum speed. There's Sylvain Chavanel a little bit further back. Over on the right-hand side in the green is Tor Hushoff. This, Phil, is a great show of form by Tom Bonin. But there are still ten more climbs after this one is over before we get on the road towards the finish in Mierbeke. Stein de Volde, another good ride from him here, once a teammate of, uh, of uh, Tom Bone, and now he's trying to just keep up with him as the world champion, ex-world champion, albeit, stamps out a superb rhythm. His face here, one of contentment, I think, one of concentration. Look at the face of Stein de Volde. He's grimacing under the pressure. He has to stay there, though, because he's a teammate of the man who's shown that sign of form there. He's the big teammate of Tom Bonham, followed there by Fletcher. Next along there is uh, Fabian Cancellara, then Philippe Gilbert, then Leif Hoster, then Alessandro Balan. All of the big names moving to the front. Little split forming as they come up towards the top of the Koppenberg now. And quick step in the driving seat here. This is life a little bit lower down. One or two not pushing with great enthusiasm right now because this is going back 30 years in the Tour of Flanders. The weather's turned against them, the roads are soaking wet, the back wheels are spinning, it's time to walk. But look at the difference between this man and the guys we were just looking at. He's climbing here with pure power. Dominance this looks like to me from Tom Bonin here this afternoon as he looks over his shoulder just to check and see what sort of damage he's done. But as you said, he knows in the back of his mind, Phil, there are still 10 climbs to go and here we go stop and start at the rear of the field the Shimano rider there is Kenny Van Hummel who's decided to walk along with a lot of riders here now it's about this time of day when they're beginning to wish uh, there must be an easier way of earning a living than being a professional bike rider Thomas Volkler is in this group as well over on the right hand side in the pale blue jersey of Boyd Telecom and uh, this really just gives you an indication of what this climb is like. The reason they're having to walk, by the way, is because once you lose traction, you can't you actually can't restart on. on a road like this because it's too slippy, it's too steep, too slippy and impossible to get going again. And it's always the rider in fault in front whose fault it was. It's never yours, is it? Oh, it's never your fault. It's always somebody else's. And the tough thing is you've got to get yourself to the slightly flatter part of the course, get riding again, get your mind back into gear and realise you've got a long chase to try and get back into this race because everybody has a teammate in the race and you have a responsibility to your guys in front. Well, this is now the back end of the field. The chances are the back end of the field will not see the front end anymore today. We're now gone up to the head of the race, the bottom of the red stripe. And it looks as though it's thinned down again to a handful of riders here. Well, as we come over the top of the Koppenberg, we've reduced the field yet again. It's going to happen every time we go over a climb. And dare I remind the riders, there are still ten more climbs to come. That's the nice thing about you, Phil. You never forget those nice <laughs> little facts, and I'm sure those guys out there really don't want to know that at all. Well, I'll be uh, a little bit nasty as well, because uh, in another five kilometres' time, they've got another climb to boot, and again, it's a cobbled climb. It's the climb of Steakbegeris, a climb of 700 metres, and again, not, not very steep at 6.7%, but the damage is already starting to be done. I've got, I've got a handful of maybe a dozen riders here on the split, led by uh, Stein de Volder at the moment. Second wheel there is Tom Bonin. They're doing an awful lot of work to try and shape this race into a small elite group of escapers. And this may be the first uh, nails in the coffin of many riders back there now. You see how narrow the roads are. It's really, they aren't wide enough to accommodate a huge peloton. Uh, but at this stage of the race, the organisers know that very rarely is a huge peloton. There is the remnants of the riders now as they spread across the fields of Flanders. Somebody's gone into the field there. Oh, he just didn't have the mate. ability to get himself around that corner. This is going to be a phenomenal race. This, I think, is going to go down into the history books as one of the great battles of Flanders because this is uh, a race which is still looking at around about 70 kilometres to go to the finish. And we're looking already at the heads of state already together in that leading group there you can there, just see on it. the right hand side he just lost it and uh, it must have been a little bit muddy going into that field of potatoes <laughs> well let's hope he's an ex-cyclocross rider because it's his only chance of coming back here uh, that must have been very very uh, unnerving as he did he's, he's come off that bottom bend these are the riders then it doesn't look like quite a descent but it is and it's a very sharp right hand of that and they're all worried about the roads now and of course the brakes are covered in mud as well as water 
And so it is a nasty feeling when you put your brakes on and you go faster rather than stop. George Hincapie now coming into that leading group of riders. It was down to, I made it around about just 12 riders, but once we've gone off the cobbled climbs, it'll slowly start to come back together. Two riders will make their way back in, five, it'll swell up to 30 or 40 riders, but I think we're starting to see a serious decanting going on here. Stefan de Jong there, and now I'm surprised to see himself get back up. There is his number, number 13. He was involved in yeah. a nasty crash a little bit earlier on, and I think he will be looking at probably going to an early shower here this afternoon. He's with the uh, former world champion over 4,000 metres there in the team pursuit, Mark Renshaw, the Aussie, who now rides for Credit Agricole, and he didn't look as though he's enjoying this at all. I think they'll all be heading for the showers ahead of the riders. Uh, the big disadvantage for the men that do well in the Tour of Flanders is they get a cold shower because all the hot water's gone by the time they get there. This is uh, the Bevor riding or the uh, feeding station in Flemish as the, that leading group goes through and you can see the riders now starting to scramble back in. Tom Bonin had also received uh, a little bit of reinforcement there because Matteo Tosato was one of the riders who came back. So Bonin surrounded already by a number of good strong men and that's important because if you look behind, as we said earlier, Phil, there are no team cars there, there's no technical support. Support. It is impossible to get through just now. The field is well spread. They're saying there are 30 or so riders here right now in the leading group. But you see, they're watching television as well because they can't get the referees up here yet. They're taking the benefit of the pictures to find out who is in the leading group because there's no numbers coming at us whatsoever. We're only seeing what we can see as you can see at home. There's no, uh, there's no music at all coming out the radio. No race support, no race radio. Just a question of survival of the fittest. The man's race, as if we turn the clock back around about 50 years. Philippe Gilbert right in there. There is Fletcher over on the right-hand side. And this is a, a brief moment to take on board some energy and some uh, liquid to keep the energy levels topped up for what is going to be at least another hour and a half of racing. Look, so look at this here. Now Chaos all there. the team cars are ah, blocked. This, this is a quick explanation here. What this is, in fact, are the team cars are not allowed to go over the Koppenberg. So the Koppenberg, in fact, you see a slight deviation there and these are riders who've actually abandoned the race they've uh, realized they're not going to get back into the race but those are the following team cars who were deviated because the Koppenberg is deemed too dangerous to take over all of the team cars oh, I can't see why that is I've got no idea at all the reason is I think goes back to the time when uh, a man by the name of Jesper Skibby crashed on the Koppenberg and somebody rode over his bike and he was unable to continue this is and yes that caused an outcry of course and in uh, fact, quite they, rightly so they have a couple of uh, special uh, special team pits there where the uh, team send their spare wheels and spare bikes to before the race comes through well the 30 or so riders are being chased by just half a minute now by the next group on the road so they've got themselves a very workable gap just now pressure is on and it's uh, going to be difficult now for other riders to break in, especially when you've got the strong men here. We're pretty sure Devolda we've seen, Bonham we've seen, Gilbert we've seen, Fletcher is definitely here, George Hincapi we think has made the gap, uh, so a lot of the big names have made the decisive move. They're not going to let this go now. No, certainly they won't. Uh, I think what we'll see over the next few kilometres, we'll see one or two riders uh, starting to get themselves back in here. This is uh, the next uh, little section of cobblestones. In fact, this is, in fact, uh, Maria Borstraat. It's a section of cobblestones at two kilometres in length. And at the end of this, just to make it uh, a little bit more fun for everybody, there's another climb, the Stake at Beredris, and that's a climb of 700 metres. A mere three stars, so it's not going to be quite so hard. A chance for these boys to springboard further ahead now as they feel as though they've started the first big move in the Tour de Flanders. We expected it to happen on the old Quaramont, it did. And now they've increased on the Koppenberg, and that uh, has caused a huge split in the field. But I think, uh, Phil, uh, just ca catching a quick glimpse of the main field, we've got a lot of the big names riding at the front end of it. Uh, Sylvain Chavanel has got himself in here for Team Kofidis, and that's nice to see because he's had a very good start to the season. Angel Gomez here, number 148, has got himself a problem. Oh, and dear me, that's a Johan Van Summen, the strong man. He seems to have been claimed by a flat tyre, I think. Well, Van Summer and the way he stopped there and was looking over his shoulder, it seemed to me that he was actually looking for one of his teammates. Well, he's left at a very strange time in the race, I would have thought there, because he was on the... Hoster, that Hoster. Leave Hoster, did he spot him? Not yep. allowed to go back on the course. Hoster is in trouble here as we approach the Steinbeck to this climb. That is why Johan van Sommer yep. stopped that quickly. He was looking over his shoulder to see what the problem was, and I couldn't see where the bike was of oh. Leif Hoster. He either crashed or something broke on his machine. 
Well, he must have known, but he's not allowed to go backwards down the course, so he's got to wait, and there he is now, uh, just hanging on here. Funnily enough, it's not Hoster who carries the Magic 21 as team lead. It is Johan van Sommen. That was the signal by Angel Gomez as well. He got a problem, and it was Hoster off to the right. Yeah, he was uh, stopped right in the middle of the road. Now there's going to be a certain amount of chaos there because uh, the team cars, as you know, can't get past the riders when they block the road like that. So he could lose a little bit of time there, Leif Hoster. He's got to try and remain calm inside himself there and ride himself back into this race because on a day like today, there's no chance of not having any bad luck. You've just got to ride through it. Well, that's a real sadness, though, for Leif Hoster. He, he really just has this love-hate affair with the Ronde von Flanderen. But for the moment, a lot of work still to be done. He's strong, he might get back, but it's going to be a real tough call now because nobody getting there to help him. They're saying the second group is at 35 seconds, so it's uh, still losing a little bit of ground. This is the 700-metre climb for hill number seven of the Steinbrake Dries. As they go through the S's, there's Anhol Gomez. I'm not sure he's not still riding his flat-back tyre here. Well, that might be the thing to do until you've got a team car up behind you. Uh, you can see a little bit of uh, work being done by Team uh, Rabobank on the front end of the main field. Uh, they're going through now the start of this very difficult climb, the stake Berkadris, and that is it. And uh, this is an acceleration coming here now, and uh, it looks as if we've got a small group going off the front, and this is a bit of a move here by Tor Hushoft. Well... I take my hat off to Tor, he said he was hoping the weather was going to turn bad during the race, well it has, because he's got a good chance to defend, he's used to the snow, he used to do a lot of skiing throughout his schoolboy years, before he became a cyclist, skiing being of course a favourite pastime for the Norwegians, and now he's trying a little move, good for him, and Sebastian, I've missed his name, name? Langevelt, Langevelt. thank you very much. He's a young rider on Team there. Rabobank, and uh, there's another crash up, these guys are going down now. Oh. Well, we're looking down now at a fallen rider here as they're about to tackle the climb of the Steenbeek Dries. It's, oh, and that was a very nasty fall indeed. He clipped the right-hand kerb there and he tore his wheel to shreds and I'm, it's a Sony Duval rider. I don't think, but he could have been Angel Gomez who was sitting at the back of the group, but he's certainly down there and he looks a little bit stunned. You know, that's the thing about this race. You have got to be alert. There is no moment of relaxation at all when uh, these riders uh, are riding in a race like this and he went down so hard he didn't even have time to react well sadly it was Angel Gomez who fell here's where it happened again obviously he was riding head down he didn't see that what a nasty shock that was as well ripped his wheel clean out of the frame and smashed it to pieces he had a mechanical problem and he was waiting for help uh, but now he needs a complete new bike if he's continuing. Back to the two leaders. Well, this is, uh, Phil, as we said a little earlier, going to be a monumental, legendary day, I feel, here this afternoon. Uh, you know, there has been so many incidents so far, and we are certainly an awful long way to go to the finish. We're now looking at this very difficult climb here. This is a 15.8% maximum. This is the Tienberg, it's a 530 metres long, and it's uh, an average grade of 6.6%, but again, this is a very famous climb in the Ronde van Vlaanderen. Sebastian Langevelt, Rabobank, trying to soften the field up, I feel, in favour of uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher. But uh, Langevelt has been at the front all day today, dictating affairs. Let's take a look down in amongst the folks here. The cyclists, the one in the coloured jerseys, by the way, as they get between a huge crowd here on the Steenbeek Dries. This is actually, we move forward, we went over the stake break the race pretty rapidly. This, in fact, is the Tienberg. This is Langevelt on the front. As we look back there, we can see it's all starting to come back together. Langevelt has only got himself about a 10-second advantage over the front end of the main field, who are, I think, giving him a little bit of uh, freedom. But they will accelerate over the top of uh, Tienberg here. Then they will, fortunately, Phil, have a little bit of respite for about eight kilometres, because that's the length of time it is before they'll now get to the 10th climb the Berge to Steine climb, which is a climb of 1.3 kilometres. So, a good move then by Sebastian Langevelt. Got off to a good start, he enjoys racing in, uh, in Belgium, he finished second in Kuna, Brussels Kuna, very early on in the year, last month in fact, and now he's, uh, he's up here in the head of the field. It's going to be a long day for these riders, even so. Tienberg is hill number 9 of 17. Langevelt proving he's pretty strong right now, Turn pro only a couple of years ago. He's only 23 years of age, this guy, and yet he's already won 11 races. 
Well, there you go. Langeveld comes round the top of that climb uh, with about a, a two-metre advantage over Steyn de Volder. De Volder, the national champion of Belgium, I think, this afternoon, will be sacrificing his own chances for Tom Bonin, who we've seen has already felt demonstrated. He's in fine form for the Ronde van Vlaanderen here today, looking for win number three. Already the World Cup holder has gone. This is Stein de Volder here now. Just trying to bring a little bit of semblance of common sense to this race. There's still a long way to go. Well, the Grand National, the famous horse race in Great Britain, was held yesterday. That's over the fence. It's said to be the toughest horse race in the world. And horses are always going down along with the jockeys. I always think of this race as being like the Grand National. If you can stay on your bike and master the conditions, you have a real good chance at winning. You have to be alert though, you have to stay near the front, make sure that you avoid any ill luck. We well, don't know for the moment because Race Radio is not telling us what the position in the race is of Leif Hoster. He had a mechanical incident and I tell you one thing, I think uh, he'll be having a very hard chase to pull himself back into a chance of winning the Ronde van Vlaanderen after three second places. Well, it looks like it's time for a break now because these riders have all come back together again. Poor old Angel Gomez is lying in the road about two kilometres behind them, uh, but the big strong men of this year's Tour de Flanders are still right there on the front. And as you're looking down now on the... Uh, well, I would say, Paul, it's around about, still about 30, 35 riders. The field, the last time check we got was around about 50 seconds. Nobody really knows, let's face it, uh, there's no timekeepers between the peloton and the chase, so they're working on landmarks to try and work out the, the gaps and tell the managers uh, who and what is happening. Um, they have not on any occasion given us a list of riders in this breakaway, uh, so we don't know, in fact, uh, I think George Hincapie is there. Uh, but we don't know who is there for CSC, and I think that might be crucial to the plan. Well, uh, you know, that's what I think I like about races like the Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix, Phil, is, is the chaos. It's uh, an old-fashioned race. It's a race where uh, you can throw all the technology out of the window. You have to ride like a man. You have to ride with guts and dedication, and you have to really enjoy a bike race like this. Uh, that looked like uh, one of the riders from Cofidis at the back there in support of Sylvain Chavanel. But they certainly are not holding back anything here, and somebody's been given the word of the front to keep the hammer down. Pretty sure that the Cofidis rider there, Paul, is Nick Williams, and uh, looking very useful. He's a man for this sort of a race. Uh, but looking here at the front now, Stein de Vol has ridden superbly this week, this week or today rather. He's been second, first wheel all the time, trying to keep Tom Bonin away from the front of the action. That's not easy in itself because Tom uh, he's still full of enthusiasm. He knows he's hurting the field, but he's got to take into account that they're still here and there's still a long way to go and there are still a lot of climbs to come. Big climbs, nasty climbs that will come down towards the end, uh, climbs like at the Berendries. For me, the, the most uh, important thing now is will be once we get down towards the end and uh, we go over the Kapelmur. But I wonder how many men are going to survive the, the ride down to the Kapelmur. Team Quickstep have got a lot of riders in this group. Uh, Matteo Tosato has made the, the move. Now there you've got Stein de Volder. A number of riders in here for Team Rabobank. They're looking after Juan Antonio Fletcher, who's riding there in fourth position. I have seen George Hincapie in this leading group, but again, he's riding very sensibly uh, in about uh, ninth or tenth position, keeping himself away from uh, any danger which may happen at the back of the group. Just looking there at the group, you know, the French... Uh, it's unusual to see French riders in the front group, and of course, like this, it's not their sort of race at all, but they've got a few of them in here. The last Frenchman of any note to get even a smell at the front uh, was, in fact, uh, Frédéric Guédon when he finished sixth in 2003. That's the best place by a Frenchman since that date. Well, uh, that's never really been a great race for the French, apart from uh, a young man by the name of Jackie Durand, who won this race a few years ago with a, a rather strange and interesting breakaway. That doesn't happen very often. In fact, Jackie Durand not too far away from us here, commentating for one of the French-speaking uh, television channels. Well, in 92... Ronde de Bon Flandrens, a French rider's only won on three occasions, so any Frenchman will be remembered. He certainly will be remembered. Uh, I have a feeling, though, that Sylvain Chavanel may well come in with a good performance here because he seems to have reached a certain amount of uh, maturity. See how dangerous it was getting around yeah. that corner. There's no such thing as a level playing field here in Belgium. You've got to jump over everything. The CSC rider, in fact, punctured there. I still can't see his face as we go past so quickly. Uh, 
uh, but there is uh, there's a wheel required and what he did there Paul on that right hand bend he clipped the corner yeah and he just got a snake bite on his tire and that's exactly what happened and uh, they were calling for the neutral service uh, vehicle to come up alongside him and the reason for that, that was it is uh, there are no team cars yet behind there you can see the little bit of panic there and he's gonna have to wait an awful long time and the bad thing is he won't actually have one of his own uh, team wheels in there and that's always bad for the morale well, and the trouble is he was right with the leading group uh, and the poor old uh, Shimano Spurs man there is working overtime. He's on a motorbike. You can only, there's only so many wheels you can carry, of course. So first to puncture will get them. Uh, this field now, again, just trying to settle down. They're not so much worried about who is behind. They're not going to try and race them away and keep them pinned back. They'll just keep their tempo and think for themselves up front. If you get back, you get back. That's the look of the draw. Well, I think that CSC rider may well be having a hard time getting himself a wheel because Race Radio is still shouting for the neutral service vehicle to come up and assist that rider who had a flat tyre. This is the second group on the road, the Twee de Achtervolkers, the second chasing group, and they are currently at around about 40 seconds. And uh, having told you all morning about the wonderful weather conditions at the finishing line, we're now in the process of having a little bit of a sleet storm. Uh, so it's now caught up with us, and it's still with the riders out on course. They zigzag around the Flanders hillsides, and never all that far away as the crow flies from where we're sat. Uh, but the fact that uh, the uh, Silos Lotto team are driving that group, it looks as though Lee Foster's got himself into this second group. Well, uh, he must have waited a long time to get himself a change. Uh, you can see this is the front group we're looking at now. They're slowing around, waiting for next moments to, to start accelerating. And these little decelerations could, in fact, play into the hands of Leif Hoster, who had, of course, we saw there, the big strong man, John, Johan van Sommeren, with him. It sounded like uh, they've just said, they're speaking in Flemish on the race radio, that the gap is now 30 seconds uh, from the chase group. So they are getting close, and Webb might have got up to the riders up here. I don't think they'll worry about taking advantage of the mishap of uh, Leif Hoster. They're actually riding their own race here and getting on with it. They've uh, just gone over the cobblestones of the Etik Hoven plane before they get themselves ready for the next uh, climb of the day, which is going to be a nice asphalt climb, uh, the climb of Berge to Steiner, a climb of around about 1.3 kilometres. Next stop is hill number 10 now, the Berg to Steiner. And uh, that's going to give us only a, a sort gradient of around 10%. So it's not a huge challenge. They've only given it a two-star rating. And the steep bit uh, is uh, more or less at the bottom of the climb. Yeah, we've got a, a little bit of respite for a while for the riders uh, over the nasty climbs as they start to figure out what the tactics are going to be for the last 40 kilometres. We're now looking at around about 55 kilometres to go. And uh, Johan van Sommer, and we've He's seen him do this so many times in the past. But Oscar Freire now looking for the mover. You can only just pick it out because yeah. he's got his World Championship bands on. None of these riders in these weather conditions are hardly recognisable. Well, I really didn't think this was a big race for Freire. But there we are, former world champion on the front. And um, normally, reputedly, the, the rider who uh, waits for the sprint because he's got a phenomenal burst of acceleration. But here he knows that we're in a critical part of the race here. Riders are starting to calculate and thinking about the Berendries or the Mur de Grammont, the Bosberg. And he says, well, I'm going to have a go at this here and see if I can drag a small group of four or five riders clear. Well, Freire, for me, is doing this to force the others to chase him because they are always thinking of their leader, which is Juan Antonio Fletcher. Now, they've just told us the gap is 30 seconds to the chase group. It looks a little bit closer than that. Um, it looks to be around about 20, maybe. Yes, that just you could just see at the end of that long road there was the group containing Leif Hoster. He's battling to try and get himself back into the race. This is Frederic Guedon in the white jersey on the left-hand side. He's a former winner, of course, of the great Paris-Roubaix Classic, and he is looking after, I think, today the chances of Philippe Gilbert. But this is a great move by number 31, Oscar Freire. Well, Oscar Freire didn't speak any English whatsoever when he won his first world title, when we all never heard of him. That was one of the first races he ever won, in fact, was the World Championship. Now speaks it well. Look Hinkapi at the bridge. coming across there to this small group. He's uh, noticed a small group moving across the front and thought that this is the possibility of a dangerous move. But he's uh, very rapidly there brought back into the fold. You can see uh, the second group on the road there is the group of Leif Hoster. And there's a split in that group there of Tom Bonin. And it may well be that this race is going to split apart again. 
Well, we're being treated to a vintage edition of the Tour de Flanders with no doubt about that now. The rain has gone off again at the finishing line and the sun has come out over the riders. So you know how unpredictable the weather is today. But look at this now, Big George with his white jersey. Yes, it was white on one occasion for Team High Road on the front. Now just getting the mud off his glasses there and checking out. I don't think he wanted Lee Foster and the boys to get back in that second group and he started a nice move here. Well, then Cappy uh, was very attentive. He saw the fact that there was a, a nice little split, so just accelerated across there. Stain de Volder is sitting at the back of this group. He won't do anything at all, and uh, almost running out of road there, Oscar Freire, as we come into this next little town, the, the town of Marke Kerkem. Very much in the heart of Flanders here this afternoon, the main field that nice and safely around that corner, but you just see how dangerous any corner can be in the Tour of Flanders. You come around on a nice asphalt road, and all of a sudden it's broken up with a little bit of cobblestones on the side. Hinkapi here accelerating away. He sees this as a nice move. He's been such a master of these events at this time of the year. He just loves racing in Belgium. Look at his pure strength here. And a man of strength goes places in these classes. They're tough men events. Oscar Freire equally finding his form. It's been coming steadily all year. Bit of a tight old turn, and the wet roads don't help either. A little bit nervous there, Oscar, but at least he's round safely. Well, I think that's an indication of just how many risks he's taking going around these corners. Uh, he's certainly put the cat amongst the pigeons here, Phil, and created a split at the front end of the main field. There's the group going away behind him. In fact, they've got themselves a nice little advantage there. George Hincapie is in that first splinter group, and Tom Bonin is, the sec is in the second one. There's only 17 riders in this chase. It looks as though we've got six or seven in the next group. So we're a group of about 25, 26 men here. They know there is a chase group containing Leif Hoster at 30 seconds, and it's beginning to look as though that's never 30 seconds. Is it? That's not 30 seconds, but it's proving to be a massive battle for Leif Hoster to get himself back into this bike racing. It's going to be a tale this evening, Phil, of uh, the, the chase of two champions because Leif Hoster is yeah. trying to get himself back into this race. He obviously didn't panic at all with that mechanical incident, but it must have really scared him a fraction. Well, that was a, that was a wise move, I think, and he's going to try and come back. Just uh, just giving a few seconds lead for Oscar Ferda, but we can see that at the moment. Just Stein de Vol is trying to get up to the Leakley gas rider here. Well, the, the accelerations and decelerations all the time. Look at the power of Leif Hoster, the champion of Belgium there, just riding across the gap. He won't go to the front and work at all because he's thinking about one thing this afternoon. He's thinking about Tom Bonin and Bonin's possible ride into the history books. Now, this is the next climb of the day, and this is the climb of Bertenstein at 1,300 metres. It's an asphalt climb, 10.7% at its maximum for an average of 5%. Not too much to worry about, but again, the acceleration's coming. A little bit of reforming here at the moment. Stein de Volder knows he's got a real race trying to control these leaders now. He's thinking only of his team uh, leader, Tom Bonin. See by the flags that this is Balan. Well, I didn't recognise him, I must confess, but if this is Balan, they should be starting to wonder and uh, counter this move. It is Alessandro Balan because, and it looks poor by his knee, as though he's been on the floor today. He has been on the floor. You can see his shorts are ripped as well, and he's seen that as a, a nice little move to try and ride away from the front end of the uh, peloton. I have to say that Balan just loves, and it's very unusual to refer to the Italians loving this part of the world, Flanders, but they do. And it is a very, very difficult part uh, of the race. It's a good time to make a move, but he's, he's just casually riding along here just reminding them perhaps he's in the front group and now letting them catch up again well they've uh, pulled themselves all back together nice to see the yellow flags of the lion of flanders out there celebrating what really is a true flemish ronde van vlaanderen here this afternoon the group is starting to swell again uh, just a fraction as you can see everybody paying a serious amount of attention it was nice to see how good george hincapi was but this man could be creating a rather fabulous surprise here this afternoon because Oscar Freire is a three-time former champion of the world, but never has he really performed well here at the Tour of Flanders. But I'm convinced this is a ploy. He's doing this to try and draw the sting in favour of uh, of uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher. I think that's his thoughts here. And Rabobank have had a number of riders do this today, except we're running out of strong men from the team right now. And Lampre have got one or two riders up here uh, for Balan. 
about there's actually a number of riders from Team Astana in this group as well and it uh, looks now as if the referees are pulling the cars out of the gap and the neutral service vehicle and that's an indication that this uh, next group on the road is about to make the junction yeah. and that will pull Leif Hoster back into the race and that's uh, that's a professional for you he didn't panic he relied heavily we had hats off to Johan van Sommeren who knew what had happened and waited on the road and did a lot of work to bridge the gap again he's worth his weight in gold Johan van Sommeren he's such a worker we've seen him do it he's ridden the Tour de France three times he's finished all three but that wasn't the name of the game it was to make sure people like Cadell Evans and Robbie McEwen were always in the right place uh, to win their respective leaders jerseys we're looking for a very nice Nice gap here for Oscar Ferreira of around about 20 seconds but I think at this moment in the race Phil with that group coming back from behind with Leif Hoster they'll get themselves organized and then start to chase a little bit later on once we start to get into the strategic second zone of big mountains 27 seconds actually is the official time check as I say I'm not sure where they're getting the timings from right now it appears a little bit closer than that for us as the riders now continue to step on the gas here this uh, quick step ride at the front now. I think it's uh, I think it's Phil for Kretzkin, so I might be wrong. Who sits on the front, setting the pace. As we've now got uh, Bona moved up into third wheel, sharp left hander. Motorbikes need to accelerate just a little bit, get out of the way. That's nice peloton. Well, in fact, uh, Leif Hoster's group hasn't yet quite made the contact. They're, there they are, just and coming around. I think around. that 27 seconds was not quite right because that bunch is going to be on this time. Well, they're uh, accelerating, and it's a rather large bunch there, but I think the most important member of that bunch is going to be Leif Hoster. Yep. We're now going to look, Phil, at around about 60 to 70 riders coming together, and that will give the advantage to Oscar Ferreira. The wind coming from the top left corner of your picture right now, forming that echelon as the riders fan across to the left of the road. One or two strong men want to get the pain over quickly and rejoin the leaders because they're ever so close but then if the leaders shut off on the chase the gap opens again and the anxious ones won't want that to happen Hoster wants to get in there and settle down get up alongside Tom Bonin and the likes of the Oscar Freire and say I'm back boys Did you see the hard job it is for the guys who actually service these riders technically that car trying to get itself past there is the neutral service vehicle now the job of the neutral service vehicle is to ride in front of the race then drop behind the breakaways as they form but unfortunately here in a race like uh, the Ronde van Vlaanderen and the roads are so narrow it's very difficult sometimes for the neutral service vehicle to move forward at a time like this. Well still Freire is up the road and still this big group they haven't quite closed you see it did open again they, they've not quite got it shut down yet there is the leader Oscar Freire he's got a gap of about 40 seconds it's been hard work but he's prized it open we're into Bovenstraat now another nasty stretch of cobbles. We are looking now at Oscar Freire here, and as I say, he's on hog hook, which is two me two kilometres of cobblestones. He's about 40 seconds ahead of a field, uh, which is more or less together now with Leif Hoster, but they haven't quite bridged the gap just yet. Well, uh, as they say, now look at the uh, move here now. There's a nice little <laughs> bunny hop there. Lovely. The problem is there was a, a little dent in the cobblestones there. This starts off as the boven start and moves into the hog hook, and this is a two kilometre section of cobblestones. Team Quickstep have got a lot of riders in this group, which has now all of a sudden just swelled to around about 70 riders in strength. The next climb of the day that we will be looking at will be, again, one of the famous climbs. There are two climbs come close together very shortly. The climb of the Leiberg, which is a 13% climb, followed very rapidly by the Berendries, where in the past we've seen riders make the move for victory. At the moment, one rider has made a very tactical move of moving a clear of the front end of the main field, and that is the world champion, Oscar Ferreira. Ferreira, I think, trying desperately to draw the sting of the chasers, which he's doing here, for sure, in favour of Juan Antonio Fletcher, who's in this group. Uh, Gert Stegmans is doing a lot of work up here for quick step, as too is Stein de Volde. Uh, Bonin is absolutely brilliant today and so far has not been under any pressure whatsoever in holding a front place in the peloton. There is a bridge, you know that, you know, Paul, that bridge hasn't come about yet. There's still riders chasing here, and there they are, 
and that contains Leif Hoster, who had the bad luck to puncture, the common sense not to kill himself. He's coming back in a group of around about 45, 50 riders. He mustn't panic at all if he wants to pull himself back into this race and win the Ronde van Vlaanderen. I might just have called Oscar Ferreira the world champion. I should have said the three-time former world champion, and here he is, riding over the cobblestones like a true Trojan. He is, again, like his teammate Juan Antonio Fletcher, one of the rare Spaniards who excel in these very tough northern roads. He's got himself, Phil, around about a 30-second advantage. He's looking over to see where is the rest of this bike race. Well, when Oscar Freire finished second in the world under-23 road race title in 1997, I don't think I even turned the page of the book. I just didn't see it. Uh, but when he popped into the world road race champ in 1999 as a pro, we still didn't know him, and he won the title. Then we knew him, and he's won that title three times now. Well, he's about to get pulled up there by the front end of the main field, and I think the important thing to remember about his first world title, Phil, was in fact that year he'd been dogged by injury through the whole of the season. Yeah. And going into the world title, he only had 14 days of competition. And that's why nobody really knew who he was, but we've certainly learned that name ever since. No, he's a, tr he's a fantastic bike rider, very strong, very talented. His, his career's been dogged a little bit by injuries, and uh, he's had various operations, especially on his seat. Uh, but I must say that um, when he does ride, and he is in form, He's a terrific natural talent. I love the way you mentioned that, the uh, injury to his seat <laughs> well, well, area. Well, I couldn't think of a better way to put it. Well, the French are very nice when they talk about it. They call it the entrejambe, oh, right. oh, between the legs. The oh, between the legs. I thought it was the opposite to the legs. <laughs> no, well, there, there he is, as uh, cool as you like. He's made his effort. His mate's tucked down there, you can see him. Juan Antonio Flair. So this is the catch here of Oscar Freire, he's been away for about 10 kilometers, a maximum lead of 40 seconds. He's put back into the head of the peloton, which currently is about 25 riders strong, with a group of 50, including Leif Hoster, trying to bridge the gap. They were almost on two kilometers ago, and it's gone out to about 15 seconds again. Well, they haven't yet been able to make the junction because of the repetitive nature of all of these climbs. We're now here comfortably on the Leiberg, 950 meters, 13.8% at the maximum for an average of 4.2%, and still, Stein de Volde was a man who last year was one of the stalwarts of Team Discovery Channel, snapped up immediately by Team Quickstep, and he's actually riding away from the field here. Well, I have to say, he's riding superbly, Stein de Volde and uh, continuing to push the pace, he's been at the front almost every time, he's throwing all his energy to the wind, and it's in favour, I'm sure, of his team leader, Tom Bonin. Frédéric Guédon is the rider coming up. No, it's not, in fact, it's Philippe Gilbert has seen this as a serious gap, and he realises that was a nice tactical move by Tom Bonin there, let the gap go and let everybody else come up with the pace-making. Look at the face here of second-place rider Philippe Gilbert, and I think you can see just how difficult so far the race has been. We're looking at the top of this climb at 48 kilometres to go. That's still 30 miles of racing for Devolder and Philippe Gilbert. Ah, he won this year, by the way, the overall classification in a much sunnier race on much better roads, the Tour of the Algarve in Portugal. And he ran out of that by virtue of his brilliant ability to ride a time trial because he won the stage four time trial. There's the gap coming together again. You could have been forgiven for a moment seeing that camera shot there that we weren't commentating on Paris-Roubaix, but we're not, we're on the Tour de Flanders. And the man chasing there at the front of that third group on the road was Leif Hoster in person, realising now that he'd used up all of his teammates and the pressure was coming down to it, and he was having to take the responsibility of bridging that last 10 or 15 seconds on his own. Gilbert now, riding now finally filled with a lot of maturity. The first time I ever saw him was way down in South Australia in what uh, was then the Jacobs Creek Tour Down Under. He climbed up to get himself a stage victory ahead of his teammate Baden Cook. But I think in this last 12 months, he really has matured into a top-class rider. But just watching, there's three good riders getting clear there at the moment, and Frédéric Guédon, the last Frenchman to pierce the top six, and he did that in 2003. No Frenchman's been there since, so it looks as though he's finding his legs. He won Paris Tours a year or so ago, and uh, he pops up and lands the big ones and then disappears for a while, but he's very, very experienced. Wants to get on with the job. Sebastian Langevelt just saying to Stein de Volde, I'm not helping you. Please go up and join the leader. Well, Langevelt uh, making the contact again. Another group coming across there. Uh, Philippe Gilbert has nicely slipped into that leading group of three. This is uh, George Hincapie in the second group. 
And uh, just trying to see who the CSC rider was who's made the junction as well. They're trying to ride across to the leading group of three. This is going to be an incredible race here this afternoon because seat, I think, to rest up and allow other people to start chasing to save himself for what would probably be a big move on the Mur de Gramont. It might be a clever tactic because with Stein de Volder up there, why should Tom chase it down? Uh, because Stein looks as though he's quite capable at the moment of looking after himself. We'll see how it works out, but we're going to have six leaders here very, very shortly. This is Sebastian Langevelt at the back. Well, he's come to the back because he's just heard all of a sudden that the man coming across there from Team Rabobank is his teammate, Juan Antonio Fletcher. So Fletcher and George Hincapi are now riding across the gap, trying to make it a six-man leading group. Now, that, I think, would spell trouble for Bonin. He's not going to sit back and watch this one move too much, I don't think. He'll have big respect for both Hincapi and Fletcher. So, very shortly, we are going to have six riders in the lead here in the Tour de Flanders, and we've still got uh, six more climbs to come. These three riders with Karsten Kroon, it is, not Fletcher Paul, who is getting on terms with the leader. Karsten Kroon, uh, the rider in there for Team CSC, a little panic now starting to come on board here. We're looking now at the, the formation of this leading group uh, Austin Kroon, uh, the rider for Team CSC, Juan Antonio Fletcher in the orange at the back, and now this has been a very nice tactical move here for Team Rabobank because they've got two riders in this group, they've got Langeveld and Fletcher. Six riders are together. Frederick Guedon, Stein de Volder, Sebastian Langerfeld, Juan Antonio Fletcher, George Hincapi, Karsten Kruen, and Stein de Volder is now assessing whether he's going to drive this or wait. And it wouldn't surprise me, Paul, if he stops and shuts down. He's decided to wait, but there's another rider coming across the gap there, sort of disguised up by the motorbikes who are halfway across the gap. And in fact, there's more than one rider. There are three riders making the, the move across the gap. That's going to make nine riders. I think that will spell the end, Phil for this leading group of the rider in there is Nick Noyens there, number 65, and just sitting on the back, a rider from Lamprey, I don't know very much at all about that, is Simon Spilak. Spilak joins the leaders here, a new professional actually turned pro this year, if memory serves me right, and uh, we're looking now at the leaders here, they are forming nine riders at the front, Frederick Guedon, Stein de Volder, Langevelt, Fletcher, Hincapi and Karsten Kroon, and Stein de Volder looking a little bit concerned that uh, a one Tom Bonin has not joined the leaders yet. Nick Noyens and Simon Spilak also coming up here. Well, uh, I think now the attitude of Stein de Volder will, cha will change. He'll move to the back of this group and he'll wait to see whether there's going to be a return by his team leader for the day, Tom Bonin. Bonin there sitting in second place. You can see we're now on the next climb of the day and this is the climb of the Berndries. And there's the move by Tom Bonin. He doesn't want anybody going clear immediately chased there Phil by Fabian Cancellara of Team CSC it had to be here he's waiting for the road to go up to try and bridge the gap it's going to all be shut down with another show of absolute powerhouse riding by the former world champion Tom Bonham steepest part of this course is 12.3 percent it's not an absolute backbreaker three stars but look at the strength of Bonham but what it indicates is there are a lot of riders who are very tired in this group because nobody's responded when you see Tom Boonen get out of the saddle you have to respond if you've got anything the only men capable of responding were Alessandro Balan there just behind him and Cancellara looks to me as if he may be cracking well, this is another crucial moment in the race here, as they now try to bridge the gap. If they can get 12 riders cleared, it might well be the beginning of the end for the rest of the race. Still working at the front here, the leader of the race, which is Langevelt, trying to once again to split up this race. Well, Langevelt working for the rest of the team, but I tell you one thing, uh, Fabian Cancellara was comes. put into a little bit of difficulty there. He was unable to follow that acceleration. Just a little bit further up, you can see Tom Bonin, and he has now, just as we go over the top, of the Berendries joined the leading group however Fabian Cancellara had a little bit of difficulty there but he should feel recover over the top to join in a couple of minutes time the Astana rider by the way who's gone across with him is Gregory Last he's now joined the front runners as well and this is developing and it's not good enough in fact for Sebastian Langeveld because he's going again and he's causing them all the time to chase Throughout the race today, Stein de Vol has been working for Tom Bona, but it's been the Rabobank boys who have caused the reactions behind. 
They're trying to wear down Team Quickstep. They're trying to isolate Tom Bonin if they can. And this young man, Langeveld, has been absolutely phenomenal. He's not thinking about himself, as was Oscar Freire earlier on. They are thinking today that their man, Juan Antonio Fletcher, has got the legs to win the Ronde van Vlaanderen. And what a story that would be. Well, it certainly would. He'd become one of only five riders to have done it three times if, uh, if uh, he gets across the line. But looking over here now, we have got a nice little group of nine or ten riders here. Now, they've got to pay a lot of attention because these boys are all formed on their pure strength. Uh, not been a lucky breakaway, uh, slipping away out of sight of the riders. Pure strength has gotten to where they are. It could well be the beginning of the end for the rest of the riders here. Absolutely. Except uh, one. It's uh, <laughs> very difficult, this race right now, but I think the way Tom Bonham rode away from everybody there That's on the Langevel, or not the Berendries, it was uh, an indication that it is Pozzato trying to come across the gap. They've seen the importance. When you see Tom Bonin right away, when you see Fabian Cancellara, you know this is the move. Everybody else is tired in this race. You've got to go and do it on your own now. Oh, and uh, the other rider stopped on the right there was the other liquid gas rider who was in the break, and he's dropped behind at the moment. Uh, so that'll be Spilak, I think, who's just fallen out of the action. But he's seen his team captain go forward, so that, that can't be all bad news at the minute. Well, in fact, I think what happened there was he had a problem going around the corner. So, are we seeing now the beginning of the end for the rest of the riders in what is an extraordinary Tour de Flanders? This man is causing pain to everybody, and Sebastian Langeveld is trying to go clear again. Very shortly, uh, they will uh, come into the small town of Nederbrakel, and that will lead them down to the climb of the Volkenberg, which is the 13th climb of the day. But I think what's more important, Phil, is what's starting to loom on the horizon is the climb of Ten Bos, and then, of course, the famous climb of the Mur de Grammont. There now is Fabian Cancellara. On his shoulder is uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher, but this really is starting to turn out into the heads of state, this leading group, and we may well have finally seen the first big selection. And I don't know if you noticed that, Paul, but Philippe Gilbert is here as well right now, has also joined the leaders, so Stein de Volder is up, and ahead of him is Langeveld. Surely there's nobody else going to get across. The big boys who had the strength realised this was the big move. Carsten Kroon now is the man starting to come across the gap here. He's seen the, the dangerous move now. Once you get so many big heads of state, uh, it's a slight chance for the, the lieutenants to take advantage, and that is what is happening here, because uh, somebody before the start today said to me, you know, Fabian Cancellara is going to be such a marked man that you better watch out for Carsten Kroon, because he may well take advantage with his tactical knowledge of the fact that his team captain is well marked. Well, there's been no respite whatsoever. We race back underneath the uh, sun again as the riders get onto drier roads, and look at this man turn the gas on. Fourth man to come across, though, is George Hincapie, using all of his tactical knowledge here this afternoon. He's looking for these moves, he's riding sensibly. Once he sees the split coming, he allows it to develop slightly, and he accelerates across, but somebody else has seen the move too, because there's man number five. But Sebastian Langeveld, at 23 years of age, is hurting some of the most famous names in world cycling just now as they continue to try, and Abalan has come over as well. So the big names are coming back into the frame one by one, but every time they think they've made the decisive move, it splits again, and there's big gaps this time. This is a good gap, and I'm surprised that Tom Boonen is not moving across these gaps. He's being caught out every time. He's the man who's shown the most power on the climbs, and that maybe is a big mistake. He's shown everybody just how good he is. Nick Noyens now on the front there, and Tom Boonen getting rid of his uh, extra shirt there, getting himself ready to start racing. There's Philippe Gilbert in the white jersey, Juan Antonio Fletcher in the orange they're going to have to organize themselves so because that is I think looking like a very interesting five-man group now will the shadow back boxing start whereby they all look at each other and say but it's your turn no it's not it's your turn the arguments start and the gap opens up George Hincap he's been riding very sharp today been really riding with superb attention that's Carsten Crew the CSC rider who's got across to the leader here just sitting at the back uh, very workmanlike group. This is going to put Stein de Volder in a difficult uh, situation here. He's got to decide now, should he work on with these strong riders, or should he try and annoy them, sit at the back, and wait for the arrival of Tom Bonin? He'll have to make that decision shortly. Well, this is the next group on the road. In fact, uh, this was the group, I think, was the group that contained uh, Life Hoster, and they've just pulled themselves back in. Now, that is actually going to be good for the leading group of five riders, because there will be a serious slowing down 
And that's exactly what's happening in front yep. of our eyes. Yep, because now these boys have just had all of that hard work, finally got back to this group, are going to find there's a breakaway of five riders now gone clear. And there they are for you. Balan was the last to reach them. There he is up there near the front now. Last year's winner then, Alessandro Balan, proudly wearing number one here as we head now to the Volkenberg. Well, there we are. We're on the Volkenberg, 12.8%, just a 540-metre climb. We join the lower slopes of climb number 13 here, the Volkenberg, a mere two stars, but significantly, Stein de Volder has decided to try and go it alone. This breakaway has got quite a little lead now, as behind the field, including Leifhoster, has regrouped. George Hincapie is in the breakaway, as too is Langevelt. Alessandro Bolan, the last to join them, last year's winner. A very, very select front group of five or six riders. Well, in fact, the front end of the main field there just briefly being led by Rick Verbrugge. Now, he must certainly be working for Sylvain Chavanel, the Frenchman who is on form for Team Cofidis. This is Langeveld, followed by De Volder. Hincapie, I have to say, is riding a very good tactical race here this afternoon, and he's indicated as well that he's got the form to win this bike race. He certainly has. The way he's ridden today, George Hincapie flying the flag for his new team. He's watched every move. I can't believe that Stein de Volder can ride like this all the way to the finish. He's been leading up every climb today, doing work, we thought, uh, Tom Bonin. Inexplicably, at the moment, uh, Bonin has allowed some of the most dangerous riders in the race to go clear, and the group is not coming back. As we pull back down the climb here to the start of the climb of the Volkenburg. There they are, look, and the reaction is not there. Nick Noyens on the front, and just uh, no real chase here. Pizzato joined this group, hasn't gone forward. I think he has gone forward. He has gone forward. We're uh, at the finish line here, looking down on a, a damp road, although the rain has, in fact, uh, disappeared and the clouds are starting to raise a bit. But these guys have been through all kinds of weather conditions here this afternoon. I think uh, Tom Bonham may well be playing a very clever tactical game because uh, that leading group has just got about a 22-second advantage and it puts pressure on a lot of the other teams to actually chase them down. Pizzato is in this second group on the road here this afternoon, as is Fletcher there in about fifth position, and Bonin has the advantage, Phil, of at least having Stein de Volde in that leading group of five. Well, that's a good point, but has he got the legs to take it through to the finish? Hincapie's rode a very clever race today. He's just been watching all the moves. Here we're looking at Stein de Volde, number 27 at the back here. And uh, his teammate here having a chat there. Sorry, Leif Foster, sorry, at the back, number 27. And uh, wrong, wrong, uh, wrong champion there, as we're now looking also at Martin Jelingi, who's a very good, strong rider himself. He's transferred to Silence Lotto this year and uh, will prove a great teammate. But he's riding alongside uh, Leif Host, and Leif Host not looking too happy with the way this race is shaping just now. Well, he's had a long, hard chase, Leif Host, to get himself back into the race. He's got to try and recover and uh, get some food down his neck over the next couple of kilometres because we've still got some really serious climbs to go. They have gone over the top of the Volkenberg and very shortly, and I'm working out at, at around about uh, six kilometres, they got the famous climb of Tunbos followed by the Eikemolen, the Eike windmill climb. Hincapie riding sensibly, there he is at the front there in his white jersey of Team High Road, a new team structure for him for the first time really in his career, while there are still incidents and accidents happening at the back end of the main field, and that rider from Team Middleram was Nicky Terpster having a slight mechanical incident. Those five boys up front could well have shaped this race for themselves here. It's now all down for them. Langevelt is the rider who did it. There's the balancing act of Nicky Terpstra. Trying to get a quick stop. He's looking for the wheel. I think it's a back one. Meanwhile, Leek we gas because they've realised, in fact, Pizzato has been dropped by that leading group, but now have to take up the chase. Langevelt, Hincapi, Devolder, Bruin and Balan. They're driving this race towards its conclusion. And now looking for the 10 boss, a mere one star out of five, and that's hill number 14. Well, I'll tell you why. I think this is, in fact, uh, tactically swinging to the advantage of Tom Bonin because he's forcing other teams to come to the front. The fact that he's that got the Belgian national champion in that group, Stein de Volder, means that all of the other teams, are, of course, like Popo Pozzato's team, have got to come and do the work, and it takes pressure off Quickstep and Bonin. I think Bonin is thinking more about the Mur de Gramont, and he would like to see this race come back together just before Gerardsbergen. 
Well, if you're in any doubt of which way to go in the Tour de Flanders, you just follow the left-hand turn, line by the people here. Five riders speed towards the 14th climb of the day, which is 10 boss, and in the front group is the American George Hincapi. Well, there is uh, Balan on the front there in the pink and blue jersey of Team Lamprey, and it's pretty impressive, Phil, to see him in this leading group because he's been down and uh, on the ground. You can see his shorts are ripped, and he's actually got blood coming from his knee, followed there by uh, the young rider Langeveld, who last year was the winner of the Electra Tour in Holland. There's the average speed as they go slightly downhill, almost 70 kilometres an hour, not far off 44 miles an hour. Sitting on the back, Stein de Volder, I think now, will become the anchor of this leading group of five. He won't do anything at all to encourage the success of the breakaway. And the big man from the United States in the middle there, high road written on his shorts, George Hincapie. So around about 229 kilometres covered now. And a little bit of uh, help required here. Langeveld requesting uh, his team car. It's either for a drink. I don't think he's got a flat tyre. He's pushing on. Stein de Volder looking around. He's probably seen his hand go up. I think it's getting to the point now where these riders are looking for technical information. They're all a little bit worried on exactly what is happening behind because Langeveld, a young rider, a developing rider, only in his uh, second real season as a professional bike rider, is yep. uh, wondering what's happening with his men behind because he's got Oscar Freire behind. He was actually just looking for a drink and uh, the drinks can be handed up until 20 kilometers to go by the neutral service vehicle. De Volder there, the champion of Belgium, formerly got used to seeing him in the dark blue jersey of Team Discovery Channel, has now switched across to Team Quickstep, and of course he is the national champion, and what a glory for him being the national champion, riding at the front in what is Belgium's biggest bike race. It is, and Karsten Kroon in the move, finishing fourth in this race last year. And now looking for a podium position, he's read it right, he's in the break, he's on form, had a win on the second day of the Castilla y Leon, a Spanish race, and, you know, time's running out for him as well now, he's 32 years of age, Carsten Kroon, he's had a fourth and an eighth in this event over the years, and uh, we're looking back at the field now, not surprisingly, being led by the Cofferdies boys, they'll need to be helped out by the Liqui Gas riders, and Tom Bonin is going to wait and gamble and see if Stein de Volder is going forward to the victory or whether he might have to try and come away from the uh, last couple of climbs of the day on a counter-attack. Well, this is the small town of Brakel here, and if you've ever been to Belgium, uh, it's a very important town. It's at the centre of almost every bike race, and this is the star of the Tour of Flanders, yeah. a little piece of architecture put out there to, to celebrate the fact that the Tour of Flanders uh, and almost every other bike race, Phil, comes through the town of Brakel. Home of Robbie McEwen and home of Peter van Pietergum. Uh, Peter van Pietergum now retired. As we look now at the head here, this is the chasing group in the Tour of Flanders here, led by Liquigas and Cofidis, because the others, especially Team High Road, have got riders up front. We're heading towards the next climb, climb number 14 of 17 at Tenbos. And these are the leaders here. Sebastian Langevelt at, uh, on the front for Rabobank, George Hincapie of Team High Road, Stein de Volder. There's the gap, so the chase is still on, and it's actually quite violent right now. Also, Carsten Kroon and the last year's winner, Alessandro Balan. It's not sure it's going to work though, Paul, because uh, that work is being done pretty strained by the uh, boys from Liqui Gas and Cofidis. I don't think it is going to work because it's stretched up to around about the 22 second advantage. And now, just looking from the helicopter a few moments ago, I guesstimated that we were looking at probably 10 seconds advantage. And there was a serious chase organized in the front end of the main field. Not just one team, but several teams prepared to do the work on the front end of the main field. We'll shortly turn now into the 10 boss climb, and that is a very difficult climb, the summit of which is only 31 kilometres to go. That's 18 miles of racing down to the finish. And I have a feeling that uh, on the slopes of 10 boss, we may well see the return of the big names into this bike race. 13 seconds, unlucky for some, maybe. And they're all looking over the shoulder here. It's saying goodbye to Robbie McEwen's hometown of Brackel as the riders move away here. And it looks a little bit more than 13 seconds, but not much more, as here come the cavalry around the corner. And they, of course, can now see, as the sun starts to pop out again behind the fluffy white clouds, they will see the leaders up ahead. I thought that was a great move. I think they're a little bit unlucky, Paul. The, different, the distance between the Volkenberg and the Temboss has proved just a little bit too far. 
Well, you have to judge everything to perfection in a bike race like this, and I wonder if Tom Boonen has uh, pulled the clever tactical yes, move there of slipping back and allowing everybody else to start to panic a bit. You've got George Hincapie in the front. We've also got our man there, Stein de Volder. We've got Alessandro Balan. So you guys, you get on with it and you chase, and I'll take a little bit of a breather for 10 or 15 kilometres, and I'll come back and I'll whack you on the Mur de Grammont. But also the other clever team here today for my money is Rabobank. They've used every rider except the favourite on the team, which is Fletcher. And he's still up there in the group. Let's not forget either, Leif Host has come back into the action. A very long chase, although he himself uh, didn't use his energy up chasing. He relied on the peloton to do it for him. But he's back in the race here now, and I don't think it will be long before he gets up towards the front again. This is the climb now of Ten Boss. 450 metres, not very much, but don't forget these guys have been riding in the saddle now for 233 kilometres. It's 9% in its steepest point, and 7% is the average. I have a feeling, though, that George Hincapie, Phil, has ridden a very sensible race, and even if there is another move that goes on the day, Hincapie's got the legs to go with a second move if these five riders get caught. Well, he's long enough in the two because he's experienced. You know, if you get caught, you try again. Not every move works first time, as long as he hasn't committed too much energy. And in fairness, he hasn't. He's done nothing more than just a little bit of a share of the work. He's waiting to see what develops before he shows his true strength. The man who's been absolutely brilliant so far is on the front now, Sebastian Langevelt. 22 and not 23 until December this year. He's a super talent for the future. Yes, only his second year as a professional bike rider. There's the summit there of the big climb of a Tin Boss, and there is the main field. We're looking probably at a 10 to 15 second advantage. I think what will uh, write the end of the breakaway success is the combination of these two teams, Team Liquid Gas on the front and Team uh, Kofidis, who've seen, we've just seen Rick Verbrugge riding very well. And obviously they feel their Frenchman, Sylvain Chavanel, has got the chance of winning this bike race here this afternoon. This race is still, I think, going to change its face. And why not? Chavanel making the best start ever to his professional seasons. But the clutcher wins already. Here we go back to the Kopf von der Wedstreit. It's a lovely language, Flemish. At the head of the road race is what it means uh, virtually. As uh, we're seeing here, the last year's winner, one of the Italians who loves racing in Belgium in the winter. There aren't many Italians like doing it, but those that do usually win. And by the way, Paul Schoen caught sight of another man who conquers these races quite frequently, or did. Michele Bartoli was at the start today. Yes, he's a winner of this race and, of course, of Liège, Baston Liège. And he said, I love Belgium. I like coming up here. It was always like the second home for me when I was racing. De Volde now stripping down, getting ready to race as well. He won't uh, contribute at all to the success of this breakaway. The official time gap was 21 seconds so it looks a lot less than that uh, Rick Verbrugge on the front here a big strong man himself a winner formerly of the Flesh Wallon race which is going to come up in a couple of weeks time lots of chatting going on here on race radio because panic is starting to come on board Bonin will be sitting in this main field just waiting to see how the other teams react although there's a large number of riders in here from Team High Road I think they'll be very happy with their performance here this afternoon and content to have big George Hincapi sitting there in fourth place just looking at the faces of those riders that they gave me the impression they've got the breakaway under control but they don't want to move uh, to shut it down because if they do there'll be more attacks so as we're looking here at these five riders, they're still clear, uh, but the big question is for how long? Next climb that they will be facing will be the 15th climb of the day, the Aikenmolen, a small climb of uh, 610 metres, 12.5 per cent. The leading group of five are there on the left-hand side, the Kopf van der Ekstraide. The group of two Achtervolkers are the group of chasers at 21 seconds officially, but on these long straight roads now, Phil, they can actually see the leading group of five, and that will encourage them to organise the chase. And look at De Volder, just yeah. sitting there looking over his shoulder. Come on, Tomica, when are you coming up to take over the role of leader? Yeah, I get that impression. He's not actually working here now. He's expecting them to come up. He's just sitting at the back collecting the tickets and uh, just waiting for the arrival of the big chase behind now. And Langevelt's seen a little bit of sense too because this youngster must be getting tired now at the back. He's ridden so well today. Hincapie too is not overworking up here. It's Balan who seems to be continually driving at the front. He was the last one to catch this group and has been doing a lot of work. George has gone through now. And uh, just the three of them working. The other two have shut down now, the Dutchman and the Belgian rider. They decided to wait and see how it develops. And there's the team time trial of motorcycles behind. 
they also uh, there's no team cars here noticeably so the gap has been emptied by the teams well they've got everybody out of the gap because it's below that 30 second mark and I think Hincapi riding sensibly he knows how to ride tactically for success in a bright a bright race like this and just having a look there Phil I make that around about 17 seconds so it is actually turning to the advantage of this group of chasers the five men they are chasing I think are waiting for the catch they're waiting for the catch. These boys don't want to make the catch because when they do, there'll be a load of counter-attacks coming their way. Uh, so they're just leaving that gap there. They've just said on the race radio, 18 seconds. But I'll, I'll go with Paul Sherwin's watch, 17 it is. Well, it's a top watch here, and I've used it for a number <laughs> of years, and we're never usually very far out when it comes down to the time checks. People Pozzato is obviously in this group. I can't see him, but the fact that we've got Team Liquigas all over the front end of it means the Pozzato is in there. He'll be looking for his win, and this gap is coming down now all of the time. I think they've shut off because, in fact, even Stein de Volder has come to the front. I have to say, this has been a terrific race today. And if all the races are like this, you may recall that Milan San Remo was also a great fighting race this year. And it looks as though we're going to be treated to a, a wonderful classic season. Plenty more classics to come, not least Liege Bascon Liege and the Amstel Gold Race, etc. Well, we're looking now at Liquigas, who really are the only ones left to work here along with Cofidis, because everybody else that matters with favourites seem to have men in the front group, so they're just waiting. Leif Hoster's moved up, he's moved up to just behind, but he's no intention of doing any work. He's a clever boy, isn't he? He certainly is very clever, but he, uh, I think, was pretty courageous as well not to panic and ride himself back into this bike race when, on a number of occasions, riders who are a little bit spoiled would give up and say, oh, I've had a flat tyre at the wrong time, I don't want to get back into this race. He battled, he waited to get a new wheel, and he got himself back into the race it took him a long time almost 30 kilometers of chasing but he never gave up uh, he's a good professional and he, never, he doesn't understand the belgian road system nobody ever will of course well there's plenty of action there now as we pull back from the helicopter and just look to the right to the tail end of the bikes there they are it is getting desperately close now soon we're going to be treated to more attacks here as we head towards the 10 boss climb uh, at uh, hill number 15, I forgot we've been over the 10 boss, I didn't turn the page of my book over. We're now heading to the Eichenbolen, uh, which will be climb 15. Three to go, and dare I mention, the one at number 16 is the Wall of Gromont. Gerardsberg is the town, they call it Churchill, and it's a brute. They call it Churchill because over the top they go past the Capella, the Capella Mur. It uh, made it just that little bit longer over the last couple of years, but it is as difficult as it always has been. And last year we saw Tom Bonin get out of the saddle there to try and show his dominance in the race, but unfortunately he didn't have the legs to win it three years in a row. But I think this afternoon, tactically, things are starting to move towards his advantage. We're now slowly on this climb of Aiken Molen, 600 metres, and it looks as if it has all come back together, but that's still a fairly large group once we go over the summit of this climb Phil we're looking at 10 kilometers to the Mur. as we look down from the helicopter we are approaching the Eichermolen hill number 15 and they are about to be caught here there they are and it's been Liqui Gas doing all of the chasing with a little bit of assistance from Cofidis and we're off again as he saw them come up Stein de Volder has launched an attack on the Eichermolen Three climbs to go, and he, he's the man to chase again, and again, he's taking all of the pressure off Tom Bonin. Well, as they say in Flemish, a new Arnval van Steen de Volder. Now, what he's trying to do here is completely take the pressure off his own teammate, and if all the big champions start to look at each other, he's got a chance of getting himself a surprise victory here this afternoon. He sat on that group for a little bit of time, Phil, to get himself a little bit of rest and recuperation, felt this was the right opportune mine, and let's not forget, we're looking at 10 kilometers, six miles to go to the Mur de Grammont. Everybody's thinking about the Mur and yep. wanting to be economic with their energy. He's not. He's not got much left. Now, this is an interesting move because he might be set up here. He might be left to fry because nobody has countered the move. So he's got a chance to go alone. And that's another thing for them to ponder on now because are they going to let the champion of Belgium win the Tour de Flanders, who they think is working for Tom Bonin, the former world champion? As Langeveld here now goes back towards the group, Stein de Volde continues to ride a brilliant ronde. Well, as they say in Flemish, this man is a sterke moniker, a strong man a beast of a man to take the responsibility of a move like that and as you can see silence lot and now they have to chase this is the big battle of the Belgian teams in the Belgian race the Ronde van Vlaanderen and silence Lotto have to try and pull it all back together looks like a response they're coming from people Pozzato 
who's moved up to the front. He's seen how dangerous that is. Oh, that was Greg Van Avermaet of the Silos Lotto team there. He's another youngster with a great future, trying to do something uh, to bring them back together in favour of Leif Hoster. Big Tom has got to the front, free wheels, blocks out the sunlight, and the nose that his team mate and champion of his nation is up front. It's a good feeling right now. It's a great feeling, uh, just six miles, though, to the big climb of the day in the final part of this race, the Mur de Gramont, the very famous Mur. Response now coming from Philippe Gilbert of Team uh, Francaise de Jeux. He realises, oops, maybe I've made a tactical boo-boo here this afternoon and we're not going to let a man like De Volder go clear. De Volder has the advantage, Phil, of being a very good individual time trialist. He does. He knows how to ride on his own. He's never been, to my knowledge, Paul, the champion time trialist of his country, which surprises me because he often wins his races, as he did this year, uh, by winning the time trial and the Tour of the Algarve. And he's, um, here he is as the road race champion of his country. Paul Hushoft in the green jersey of Credit Agricole now. They're all starting to think, oh, guys, we can we can win this. We've still got a chance as they go through St. Martin's Lierde. And St. Martin's Lierde is uh, not too far away from the outskirts of Gerardsbergen. It looks to me as if they're trying to muster themselves now to try and get them organisa the organisation into the front end of the field. And still, Bonin is sitting there. I think Bonin has got the legs, Phil, to do something special on the Mur de Gramont. But if he can get his teammate to win, he'll play the role properly. I think it's very generous of Tor Hushoft here, Paul, to actually do some work because uh, he's working for the team leader. The problem is he is the team leader. And you think he want to lie back a bit and let the other teams do the chasing. Well, as he uh, sweeps away there, I think he looked at the faces on all the other riders and thought, we've had a very long, hard chase here this afternoon. Maybe as everybody thinks about the Mur de Gramont, this is the time to go clear. In fact, he's forced a small group off the front end of the peloton. Again, be putting that group of leaders on the defensive. Four riders chasing here, just about. We might make it five or six or seven in a moment's time, but this is uh, now desperate times in this year's Tour de Flanders, and it's been a superb race so far. A little bit of help. I think it's Nick Noyens trying to come through there. This is going to be a difficult uh, counter-attack to make it up. This is Sylvain Chavanel who's made the move. He's the man that Team Coffee were looking for here this afternoon. And this is great to see because Chavanel for so long has promised to be a good bike rider for France. And finally he's reached maturity. Finally he's riding in these races like the team leader we've always expected him to be. He comes to this race already with four victories this year. He's never done that before. I don't think he's ever won four races apart from 2005 in one season. And uh, after he got a stage win in the Tour of the Mediterranean, I think that was at the top of Montferron, Paul. He got second overall in the Tour of the Algarve. He became the leader of Paris-Nice after a stage win. And then, significantly, his last two victories have been right here in Belgium. He's ready for it today. He's ready for it, but this race is not over. You know, we're looking really at a gap of 20 seconds between Stein de Volde, the small group of four riders in the middle, and the main field behind. It's all going to come together, I think. Tombak is the man who's got into this leading group as well. He really is riding a phenomenal race here this afternoon. But how on earth did Tombak find the legs, having been in the breakaway all day when they got away on the Kleisberg, which seems last week, but it was only about two hours plus ago, and uh, he still found the strength to try again at this stage of the race. Great riding. Well, there are the four chasers. Uh, we're looking now at the lone leader, who's got himself 10 seconds advantage over these four chasers, who've only got themselves five seconds advantage over the front end of the main field, who are just in the chaos behind there of all of the motorbikes in this race. Well, this race won't lie down today. There's clearly a lot of riders believe that if they play the cards right or get that little bit of luck, make the move and it works, they can win this race. Because it seems to be one of those tours where it is uncontrollable. 12 seconds is the advantage of Stein de Volder over the four chasers and maybe three or four seconds advantage over the front end of the group coming, which again, Phil, I think, has split into a smaller group. We're looking at eight riders down there. Looking this way, though, looks to be a few more through the camera from the motorbike. Tor Hushoff swing, swings off the front. And this is Chavanel. Oh, dear me, he's gone into the box. He tried to pinch that motorbike and he borrowed ours instead. But well, Chavanel continues it's on. It's not his fault, he's not it's cheating. Not his it's fault. the responsibility of the motorbikes to get out of the way. And there are a lot of motorbikes trying to get themselves the shot of the day here this afternoon. The move that is going to change the result of the overall race here. I can't see Stein de Volder, but he can't be very far away from those four riders. He's probably in the first gaggle of motorbikes just at the top of the picture. Completely lost now, but he is there. He was just peeping in and he's got a lead out. I would say eight to ten seconds over these group this group of four riders 
as we're looking now at Chavanel, the man in the red, Tor Hushoff is here, Quincy Atto and Yannick Tombeck. The race is now bound for climb number 16, the Muir, the wall of Gerardsbergen, and the champion of Belgium is the man who's taking us towards it. Well, he's got all of the responsibility now of Team Quickstep on his shoulders. He's putting a lot of pressure onto the race, and he has got the advantage of knowing that if this move doesn't work for him, his teammate can take over the race behind him, because I feel today that still, even though he's not in this small counter move going clear, Tom Bonin has the legs. This is uh, Yannick Tomback trying to get off the front end of the main field. He's caught out the men who were with him. Just a little bit further back in the green there is Tor Hushoft. A little bit further back, Sylvain Chavanel in the red jersey of Team Kofidis. And just sticking on the back there, of course, Pippo Pozzato. Well, I reckon the Latvian here on the left must have stopped at the local pits and changed his legs because that was a tremendous piece of riding to find the strength to get into this move, this quality of riders after having been in the previous breakaway. But he was the strongest man in that breakaway when it was brought back, of course. We are looking now as we go towards the uh, wall of Gerardsberg. And remember, we will cross the town first before we start the cobble climb. No change here. We are still chasing Stein de Volder with four riders and just behind nine more coming up. Well, these riders have lost their belief in successful because they're all lo looking over their shoulders constantly to see the position of the chase group. Well, there it is. It's not much more than 100 metres as we go through the town of Deftinger. And just to, for a little bit of local knowledge, I just happen to know that Deftinger is the home of Ferdi van den Houten, a former teammate of mine who was also a winner of Ghent Wavel game. Used to ride for Laredoot alongside Paul Sherwin. The gaps officially are 18 seconds, Stein de Volder to the chase group uh, we've just seen, and then 28 seconds to the next group. Uh, last time we saw them, there were nine, but there might be more by now. Uh, de Volder, though, looks as though he's going to be first onto the wall. There's the chapel, dead centre in your picture. The church at the top, the Capel Muir, the uh, Chapel Hill. And it uh, looks as though Stein de Volder, I wonder how many times he's raced through Gerardsbergen or even trained through here. He's a man of Flanders. Well, he is an unbelievable man in a solo effort like this. Tor Hushoff now is the next man. There's Yannick Tombak. There you can just see uh, Sylvain Chavanel, but the group are hovering there, waiting for the moment when they can move forward. Sylvain Chavanel, a Frenchman, can you believe that? In at the kill in the Tour of Flanders. Only three French riders have ever won this race, and Chavanel now right there. That's uh, Kinziato, in fact, in there for Team Liquigas, but all of the other big names are around about five seconds in arrears. You can see in that small group there, George Hincapie is very much present, as is Tom Bonin, as is Leif Hoster. The big men are all waiting for pounce and uh, to Pounceville, and I think they're actually all going to pounce once we get to the Mur. The Capel Mur, the Mur de Gramont, in 1.8 kilometres time. The penultimate climb of this year's Tour de Flandre. For many of these riders, it will be their last climb because they'll fall away uh, from the race, really will fall away this time. Hushoft, Chavanel, Quinziato, Tombak, they will get there just behind Stein de Volder. Hincapi, Bonin, Hoster, big favourites in the group at 28 seconds from the leader, just 10 seconds behind the Hushoff group. It's going to be the grand battle of the stones of the Kapel Muir, and who comes out on top could well run to the finish. And let's not forget, once they've gone over the top of the Muir with 16 kilometres to go, they've got to figure out who is going to be the boss of the Bosberg. That used to be a man by the name of Edwig van Hoydong, but very often the Bosberg, the final climb of the day at just 12 kilometres remaining, tells you who has got the strong legs in the, in the, the Tour of Flanders. That is the last climb the, where the strong riders put the nails in the coffin of the others as now CSC are still trying to drag Fabian Cancellara back into the fray here. Just look at the speed of that bunch. They're showing no respect at all for the climb, which lies ahead here in Gerardsbergen as we race through the marketplace. So it looks like we're going to head down to Gerardsbergen, split by 28 seconds the spread between Stein de Volder and the Hincapi group. That is a very long line, and you see, uh, I still don't want to take anything away from the tactical way that Tom Bonin is riding this race here this afternoon. He's let his team do all of the work, he's come out and shown us how strong he is on a number of occasions. That's what makes me feel that Tom Bonin has got it in his legs here this afternoon. The Tweede Achtervolkers, the second chasing group, we're now in the outskirts of Gerardsbergen.
We are now in the streets of Gerard Bergen as the look at the crowd here. This is the narrow approach to hill number 16 of 17 climbs, but this is the brute, the five star here, climb of the wall. No change at the moment. We've got one leader, four chases, and then Hincapi in that bunch there. That's the situation. They snap back, Hushoff, Chavanel, Quinziato, Tom back. It is now one against the rest. Well, one man is hoping to survive the Kopf and the Wextrad. He would certainly like to see that. He's a Flemish speaking rider. He knows this is the front of the bike race. If you think that the popularity of the sport of professional cycling is diminishing in Europe, just have a look at this. The crowds have turned out on the town square here. This is right in the bottom of the climb of Heradsbergen. He'll go through the town square, over the place, and then he'll take the famous right-hand bend onto the Mur itself. 19.8% is the maximum gradient. It says 475 metres, but it's a lot longer than that from Heradsbergen in the bottom to Kappelmur in the top. Top. This is a very, very cruel climb here, and the uh, pictures are sprinkled over the hundred years of the Tour of Flanders. Well, nearly a hundred years. It's still a hundred years if you take out the World Wars. And now they're seeing the champion of Belgium fly the flag all the way up the cobblestones here. Reaction coming yet again now because they picked up Quinziato. Liquigas still think they can win with Pizzato. Well, in uh, the middle there, in the dark black and red jersey of Silence Lotter, it was Lay for Hoster, but this man is trying to survive. Uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher now, he loves this bike race, he wants to make the move. Fabian Cancellara on his shoulder. I don't think I've ever seen a Spanish rider dominate the Mur de Gramont like this. Well, he's come here to win, and as he's told us, no Spanish riders made the first ten throughout the history of the Tour of Flanders. He's in the making here. He's had a second in Paris-Roubaix, second in Het Volk, uh, but he'd love to repeat all of that with a second in the Tour of Flanders. This is a big move here, because look at this. This is the most unusual climb here, because they're not putting down the hammer like we thought. Well, they haven't got to the real steep part of the climb yet. Tom Bonham was in there over to the left-hand side, looking nice and comfortable. He won't make any big moves at all here Phil because he will still defend the position of Stein de Volder. these guys have still got to catch the champion of Belgium well, this looks like it might be Christian Knies here of Germany who's made a move for Milram he's got over the top first but they've made rather little of that hill a lot less than we thought look at the group coming up Paul that's most unusual now meanwhile at the front the second kick of the climb well, it seems like uh, Chavanel has slipped to the back end of this group, but this is a great move here. He's come first onto this massive climb of the Mur de Gramont, the wall of Heradsbergen. You can see how difficult the climb is, but he's still got the power, he's still got the punch in those pedals, and he still does not have that group behind him. He could survive, and that would be a monumental ride. I've never seen De Volder ride like this. All day long, I've been convinced he's been softening the field up for Tom Bonin to bite back at the finish. But this man is now committed here, and Bonin won't chase him down. He'd be delighted if Stein De Volder won this race. This is the narrow, horrible little section, the section where Paul Sherwin used to walk in the days of the Tour of Flanders, but it normally reduces men to mortals here. And look at Juan Antonio Fletcher. He's seen his team work for him all day, but at the end of everything, it comes down to the leader to do it himself. Coming after him, there is Nick Noyens, there is Tom Bowden, Alessandro Balan, Fabian Cancellara, all of the big names. There is Pippo Pozzato coming up to the front as well. And third up the climb as Vladimir Gusev is also moving up into the action. There's the chapel, and once you see the chapel, no bells ringing, but you go over the top, and there's no real big descent off the top of this either. And this is the group, and there is the chase group continuing now as they try to close down. Desperate moments now in the Tour of Flanders. Nick Noyens, but look at Tom Bonin there, he's on the defensive, he's sitting there waiting to see Alessandro Berlant struggling, but he's slightly injured, but he won't give up. He's a proud bike rider, the man in there for Team Milram, by the way, is Nicky Terpstra again trying to keep himself in this bike race had a little bit of bad luck but everybody wants to ride well in the Ronde de Vendouard and you do not give up you fight all the way there's Hincapi coming around now still looking pretty confident still in with a chance of a top 10 or 15 position well it's going to have to reassess exactly where they sit in this race once they're over the top of this climb now because did you see the face there on Alessandro Bolan 
gritting his teeth but very much in contact with the head of this race and looking like he's heading towards a big finish once more but this rider is now on to good roads here he's bound for the final climb of the day the Bosberg and it's a four-star climb and it's not so severe but it's where it's placed on the course that makes it so vital to the format well that's right it's three kilometers after the Mur de Gramont it's a very wide road but from the top of the Bosberg there's just 12 kilometers to go to the finish you can see here there's a massive move by team Astana but in the group behind Juan Antonio Fletcher is shadowed there by Tom Bonin Alessandro Balan and this is the man they all want to catch they're coming now out of Herzbergen and this is De Volder now just sitting up I think he was looking for a bottle he was looking for some assistance but he's got to keep himself in that individual time trial position Bonin Phil to me still looks good well whatever's happened he's telling the service cars here with the brand new clean wheels all waiting that's Gregory Rast of Astana who's had a brilliant ride today Johan Brunier would love a victory of course uh, so he could cock a hoop at the organizers of the Tour de France who won't let his team ride this year uh, Fletcher says all right you've chased me down come and help me chase this man down Bonin says no I won't because it's my teammate in front it's Stein of Volder. you want to win this bike race guys you've got to pull back my teammate into the fold I'm just going to sit here nice and pretty if you pull him back then I'm going to hit you hard well this is a now every man for himself here as if it wasn't a few moments ago and uh, the ride being done is by Stein of Volder because he's thinned that race out to a very select chase group and as far as we know they aren't making Making any impression we're still looking at 14 seconds the difference between Stein de Volder and that group of riders behind but the more they mess about the more the advantage is going to turn towards the champion of Belgium they will not get any help at all from Tom Bonin he's just going to sit there if it comes back together towards the end Phil and there's a group of 10 or 15 it doesn't matter because Bonin has still got the sprint to win this race well you saw some of the names here they are Gregory Rast is the rider on the far right for Astana there uh, the last year's winner riding a two superb defense of his title as he leads them through the streets here Alessandro Balan is flying the flag again for an Italian in the Tour of Flanders and uh, Nick Noyant is sitting in there just behind him he was working with Chavanel but what a great second gun he's turning out to be there is Stein de Vol, the race radio just crackled to give him a 19 second advantage there is no organization in this chasing group and I'm sure that's because of the fact sitting on the back of it is big Tom Bonin because they know if they work too hard to pull back Stein de Volder, he's going to win this bike race for this team and he doesn't want to chase because he'd love to see his teammate win while he's wearing the jersey of the champion of Belgium what a glory that would be we are just under the banner as we've started now the final climb of the day which is the Bosberg it's four stars but it's crucial now to the combination of the race and we're looking at Stein de Volder clear on the climb through Gerardsberg and over the Muir Tom Bonin has joined a chase group of six which is Gregory Rast of Astana Fletcher of Rabobank Noyens and Comedies Balan last year's winner Bonin and there's going to be a counter move immediately from the group as they approach the climb well this is young Langeveld once again he doesn't care at all about this bike race he's really found something special but they've lost more time it's 20 seconds now to Stein de Volder Dom Tom Bonin just sitting there carry on guys you're the big names in the sport you want to win you chase I'm just sitting here well this is an interesting move now but where is Sebastian finding the legs at his age 22 years of age 23 next December a man of the future for sure Stein de Volder well, he's not quite as young as Langevelder but he's certainly a star today and there's the climb now up through the woods here it's a good road surface and once we're over the top it's all man for himself as they race towards the finish well it's just inside of 1,000 meters in length it's 11 percent at the maximum part of the climb and an average of six percent but more important Importantly, I think, Phil, the summit is just 12 kilometres to go. It looks like curtains for that chase group. Uh, Leif Hoster was off to the right. I think he's done for. He's uh, looking very tired. The chase may have finished him off. Uh, Sebastian Langevelt here trying to leave that very select group of riders. And, uh, well, I said it was smooth, but I forgot about the little bit at the top. They're not severe, these cobblestones, uh, but they do shake you around just a bit. Well, he's got himself at 20 seconds. If he's got 20 or 25 seconds at the top of this climb of the Bosberg, he's got a very good chance of going down towards the finish line as the winner, wearing the resplendent jersey of champion of Belgium on his shoulders. But it's still a tall order. He's being chased in second place here by Langeveld. But there are a lot of big names in that group with Tom Bone and Phil, and I think they may well get themselves organised over the summit here of the Bosberg.
Well, there he is, and there is the distance, and the group more or less together behind here now as he comes up towards the top of the climb. Is he just still a carrot for Bonin to just come by and win the race, or is he actually going for gold himself? It's up to the race behind. They are the only ones with the answer now. As Sebastian Langevelder, another faithful teammate all day, still dictating affairs in second. Well, isn't it funny how the camera does tell a few lies there? It looked as if he was riding very easily across the gap, but he's only halved it because as he rides off the cobblestones, he's looking for 10 seconds to find the man at the front of this race, and the group behind him are really only looking for 20. This race is far from over, and this man now has to compose himself and get back into that time trial position but his body must be screaming out for surrender well there is the group and uh, Leif Hoster I think has joined this leading group and I'm just hearing on race radio that Fabian Cancellara has been dropped here so the pressure today is affecting riders in very strange ways the sun is out now they're all ready for the sunshine finish the finish not very far away uh, but it's still a matter of chase and chase there's no respite here nobody's getting chance to recover to put in their own attack well, this man now, uh, Stein de Vol, the champion of Belgium, formerly a Discovery Channel rider from last year, is now trying to win himself, I would say, his biggest ever victory after, of course, the Belgian National Championships. But sometimes the Belgians regard the Tour of Flanders as even bigger than the championship of their own country or the championship of the world because it is their own personal world championships. He's got 10 seconds advantage. That really is not enough to win. They've dropped the neutral service car there to get behind him. That's to assist him if he has a flat tyre or a mechanic mechanical incident well he's got himself uh, according to race radio 28 seconds but I calculated only 20 when they summited well the spread is across 40 seconds now which is not very much is it we're still a little way to ride down to the finish devolder has got 18 seconds over Sebastian Langefeld there he is 28 seconds over the group containing Tom Bonin and last year's winner Alessandro Balan and 40 seconds to what is left of the Tour de Flanders there is uh, Fabian Cancellara, he's winning the group there with, of course, Tom Bone and Fletcher now was looking to get himself a podium position. Now's the moment where they're all starting to play that little tactical game. Will I chase? Should I chase? I'm losing the Tour of Flanders, and if they don't get themselves organised, they have lost the Tour of Flanders here. Leif Hosterfeld, was, you was, uh, as you said, is definitely in the group, and he's done a good move to get himself back into this bike race after all of the bad luck that he's had. Well, Cancellara, having thought he was dropped, in fact, they must have been saying in Flemish he was catching that group. He's obviously joined it, and also Leif Hoster should be there. we we'll wait for confirmation when we see that group, but I think they've crossed the gap and have joined that chasing group. There's certainly more riders there than were there before. One rider out in front, 10 kilometres to go, six miles from the finish, around about uh, 12 to 13 minutes to race. That's all Stein de Volde that stands between him and the greatest moment of his life. Well, we're still looking at 10 to 12 seconds at disadvantage for the rider in second position there, and it is around about 25 seconds to the group of Cancellara and Tom Bonin. Again, well, another. Oh, that was a very ouch. nasty move there. The motorbikes are getting a little bit too race there, and that, that move uh, indication by Gregory Rass was a sign of not being too happy with the motorbike driver. I think driver. that's what he meant. Yeah, very polite young man. As we now see uh, the one man here, resplendent in the in the colours of his national champions jersey, and what better colours to show to the Belgians? They're all smiles. I can tell you, looking out of our comedy box here. There's a huge grandstand. There must be five, six hundred people in the grandstands here, and they're all just one big smile right now. And this ride is not looking like cracking. Well, what a man, Tom Boonen, in that second group behind there, Phil. He is riding as an incredible teammate. He really wants to win this race. He writes his name into the history books if he could win it for a third time, but he's giving everything up to try and give the advantage to his man at the front. And just look at this rider here, Sebastian Langefeld. He's riding about 15 seconds, if that, ahead of the chase group which has been strengthened by Cancellara certainly and Leif Host we believe and he's holding them off he's also doing the ride of his life inside 10 kilometers to go the champion out front second place is Langevelt and then this very select group containing the winner from a year ago Alessandro Bolan his last three rides here in Flanders first fifth and sixth well he loves this race he's 
certainly does. This young man is making a name for himself. We'll see him come back to the Belgian Flanders again in the future because, as you've said a number of times this afternoon, he's not going to be 23 years old until December of this year. But he seems to be losing a little bit of his impetus. And this man, as he gets closer to the finish, Stein de Volder, will find some strength, the kind of strength that you can only find when you know you're on the edge of a massive performance. And that's what he's on the edge of here this afternoon. His body will all of a sudden start to go numb. He won't feel that pain anymore anymore because he'll know he can keep this pressure going for those incredible 10 more minutes that remain for him well the thing is that uh, Sebastian Langvelt doesn't know much about this uh, uh, what it's like to win the Tour de Flandre. he hasn't had many shots at it uh, but certainly De Volder does and he's a quality bike rider De Volder because last year he finished third in the Tour of Switzerland apart from winning the time trial stage of the three days of the Pana, which has just gone by uh, again this year but I think he's beginning to nose away here at the moment. Well, the gap is officially given at just 14 seconds and 31 seconds to the group of the big contenders. The big contenders being Balan, Tom Bonin and Fabian Cancellara. So they are not really gaining at all on this man and all he's got to do is keep himself nice and consistent. You have to bear in mind, isn't it strange that the man who uh, spotted this rider as an amateur was no other than Johan Brunil. And he was also the man that made uh, Tom Bonin turn professional in the early part of his career too. Well, his new book is just out. Uh, uh, something, oh, I've forgotten the title of it at the moment. We uh, might as well win. He might as well win. Well, he seems to have picked all the riders that can win. And at some stage, he's had them on his team, but he's lost them, of course. You can't always keep them. Other teams offer them more money. They tempted Tom Bonin away, and uh, he went. But this is a group now which is looking as though it's getting a little bit tired. Well, this is Yannick Tombak, who's managed to get off the front of the group, uh, followed there by Gregory Rast, and just sitting on the back there, Juan Antonio Fletcher. They have caught out the big names there, and they're making one final dash to try and pull this man back into the fold. But every kilometre that goes by, he will be dreaming of victory here on the road of Merbeck, a very famous finishing straight. It's been here, the finish of the Tour of Flanders for a long number of years and every Belgian rider knows about it. This is as the man in second position, Langeveld, starting to suffer a bit. Look at those shoulders starting to rock and in fact he's about to get caught there by the group containing his teammate Fletcher. Now that may well turn the tables the other way. Well, I've never seen a finale to a Tour de Flanders quite like this one. Everybody is on their upper limits right now, and there's so many new names attacking the favourites. Let's have a little swing round here. They come again, They're coming back together, I think. Very shortly, it is going to be everyone. Nick Noyen trying to get across the gap. It's going to be everyone against Stein de Volder, I think. Also moving up, Big Tom gritting his teeth. Every right to follow the wheels. He's not damaging de Volder's lead, and that's the plan. Also in this group, you can see now, is Hincapi also getting across. It is still anybody's race, Paul. It's anybody's race, and now they've pulled Langeveld back into the fold, and uh, we'll see, I would like to think that these teams will get themselves a little bit organised. One man who won't join the organisation or the party will be Tom Bowen because he wants the, the party to be on board of Team Quickstep in the bus here this afternoon. Now getting out of the saddle, fighting. You can feel the tension in the crowd mounting here. They want a Flandrian to win, they want a Belgian to win, and they're <laughs> applauding every time they see him on the big screen. I'm laughing because I think we just had three cheers on the finishing line here for Stein de Volde. They're certainly shouting out there. It's a bit premature, I believe, at the moment because these boys have not given up. Yet Stein de Volde, this is Juan Antonio Fletcher, another desperate move here to try and crack the field and make the move. You know, Stein de Volde has never been a man for the single-day classics. He's a man for the stage races. He's won quite a few in his life. He's had 13 wins, uh, but this might be a move on to lucky 14 for him. Well, He's won the only a stage in the Tour of Italy, a Tour of Spain, rather, where he wore the golden jersey in that race. But basically, he's never been a man to score on a one-day classic. Well, Fletcher has made the move here. Fabian Cancellara started to chase him down, but he was immediately covered by Bonin, so it turned off the chase and the pace-making at the front. They're getting a little bit frustrated there with Tom Bonin because, after all, he's playing the defensive role. He's putting everything to the one side, but there is the neutral service car in front. There is Leif Hoster now. He's going to try and make the move. You know, Phil, this could all come back together inside the final kilometre. This is the second-place rider on the road. Juan Antonio Fletcher, he's only looking for 10 seconds. We're looking now at the last desperate moments here of all of the favourites in the Tour de Flanders, chasing the champion of Belgium, Stein de Volder, and the man who's closest to him now is the big Spanish favourite, Juan Antonio Fletcher. But Bonin is still back in that group and just waiting for the chance to counter the move, I feel sure. 
Well, it's not very much more than 10 seconds there. You can see the blue neutral service vehicle behind this man, Stein de Volder. 10 seconds back to Juan Antonio Fletcher, who, if he catches Stein de Volder, I am sure will go on to win this race, but still only another five or six seconds behind are still all of the big favourites. Well, this is a doer battle, and it's far from decided. There is Juan Antonio Fletcher trying to become the first Spanish rider to crack the top ten ever in the Tour of Flanders, and more than that, he's trying to win the race for Spain. He's threatened it last year, second in Hepvold, second he was in Paris-Roubaix, and he could well be second in the Tour of Flanders right now. Well, he's pulling himself inside out. This is a final false flat here, just on the outskirts of Ninova, as we now look to get down to the flat part of the course and the running towards the final kill but I've never seen Fletcher pull his body apart like that. He realises he's on the edge of something very famous indeed for a Spanish rider. They're pulling out now the neutral service vehicle as we pull back. We're looking for five seconds here for Juan Antonio Fletcher. He's going to catch him before the end, and then what's going to happen? Well, it's happened to Stein de Volder, but de, uh, sorry, I was thinking of Lef Hoster. It's happened to Lef Hoster before being caught in sight of the line, so he knows what it's like to finish second. He's got himself into that chase group behind, but it may not be good enough now I think that was four kilometers to go to the finish here at just four kilometers two and a half miles to the line for Stein de Volder. he really has been a superb man at this race no way is he a fortunate winner he has led over most of the climbs today he's looking five and a half minutes of effort left down towards the finish line this is the false flat on the outskirts of Ninova and Merbeke and there this man is looking at the carrot in front of the donkey the carrot on this occasion is Stein de Volder the national champion of Belgium who is hoping to win this bike race here this afternoon but look at Fletcher look at his body he's pulling himself any which way he can he's a contortionist trying to get as much power out of that body as possible well let's remember the Stein de Volder last year won the Tour of Austria by virtue of his great time trialing skills on stage seven this year he won the Tour of the Algarve same reason his time trialing skills on stage number four now he's having the time trial to take out the greatest classic of the all. Nick Noyens is coming across the gap now as well for Kofidis, so we've got in the first three places on the road three individual riders, there's Noyens, number 65 in the and red shorts of Team Kofidis, we are now looking at just three kilometres left to go to the finish, Noyens looks over his shoulder, this is so terribly desperate for the man that I think we all want to win now, Stein de Volder, because he's been at the front of this bike race over all of the big climbs, he's worked like a Trojan for his team leader Tom Bonin and now he may well lose it in the final thousand yards. Nick Noyens, who knows what it's like to break the top ten, he was seventh in this race one year ago, Fletcher's seen him coming, this will be something of a light relief for Juan Antonio, because he could do with a break right now, because look up the road, and Stein de Volder is still riding them off his wheel and out of sight, the kilometres are ticking off here, soon it'll be the right turn, then he will see the finish, and then he will know what it's like as a champion of Belgium to win the Tour of Flanders, but it's not over yet, look at that blanket finish. You've got the whole of the race there, Phil, in about 20 seconds. These are the two chasers now, and a little bit of assistance coming from Juan Antonio Fletcher. Nick Noyens, a Belgian, is chasing down a Belgian. That's always a, a difficult thing in the press well, the next day, but it's all about winning this bike race. At this stage of the game, it's nothing to do with what country you come from. At two kilometres to go, it's about getting across the line and winning. It doesn't matter where you're from. Under the two-kilometre banner, another huge crowd here. Cheer, another huge cheer, rather, from the crowd. Two kilometres inside, uh, two miles to go. What, just over one mile, in fact. The tandem now is a Spanish Belgium tandem, and if they don't get up there in the next thousand metres, they're racing for second place. I don't think they'll close it now. It's 14 seconds officially to the two chasers there, who are looking a little bit raggedy. And this man, we've said a number of times, is a very good individual time trialist. It's 24 seconds back to the group containing Tom Bonin. Every time he puts his head down, he gets himself into that time trialing position he makes himself a little bit more aero his body must be going through turmoil at the moment but if he can get to that finishing corner in first place he knows he's got this in the bag and what a great victory for a Flandrian well the way these boys are looking over the shoulders as they still try to finish it off here they are racing for second place and worried about the chase from behind I think Stein de Volder has pulled off the big coup today He's ridden this race in favour of Bonin, and he's going to finish it off for himself. Absolutely superb demonstration. Oops, 
Nearly overshot that one. Well, he's getting a little bit nervous. That's something that he's been waiting for. He looks over his shoulder. He allows himself the uh, advantage to look back and see what the gap is. One kilometre to go, and he's looking with a 10-second advantage. He's not going to be able to enjoy this coming up the finishing straight because he's going to have to go and take it all the way to the line. Here are the chasers. Fletcher now looks over his shoulders too to see Nick Noyens a little bit further back. They know the group are there. This is a desperate struggle, but I think he's finally got this one in the back. Well, he's not the first champion of Belgium to cross the line wearing the national champion's jersey, but he certainly is going to be very special here. He's now 26, uh, 27 years of age, 28 years of age now, Stein de Volder. His birthday coming in August this year, just after the end of the Olympic Games in Beijing, where I'm sure he'll be going after a demonstration like this on a one-day race. He's never before approached a victory in a one-day classic race, and now he's approaching the finishing line as the winner of an absolute vintage edition of the Ronde van Flandre. He deserves it. He certainly deserves Deserves this, and there you can see the two chasers. Now he can look over his shoulder, he knows he's got it. That's the moment of victory, that's the moment of great enjoyment. Well, Stein de Volder, as champion, takes the victory today. He doesn't believe it, he never raced for the win today. It came his way three hills out, and he never looked back. There's the big crowd have cheered him all the way home, and a huge, huge grin on all of their faces. As Stein de Volder crosses the line, the sprint for second place here. Well, Juan Antonio Fletcher will get third behind Nick Noyens, but that's the best finish ever by a Spanish cyclist in the history of this event. But that's the way the race has been today, and it's finished off in a very tight sprint there, and George Hincapie, with a smile on his face, has finished alongside Alessandro Balan. But as I noticed there, Tom Bonham was very happy to sit up and celebrate there. Great win for Patrick Lefebvre in there with his team as well, because tactically they rode a superb race here this afternoon. <laughs> this man rode with sheer courage, though, Stein de Volder, over those final few kilometres. I'll tell you one thing, Phil, tomorrow morning he's going to have a sore body. Well, you could bet your life, but it'll be a happy one. He might have a sore tummy, too, because I'm sure he'll be celebrating tonight here in the town, as only the Belgians can. Uh, this is a wonderful country to be a champion in in the sport of cycling. And uh, Stein de Volder now looks as though he's about to break down here as reality dawns. He has just won a terrific version of the Ronde von Flandern. Well, he certainly has done that, and you know, uh, he knew all the time in the back of his mind if he was to fail, he could still count upon Tom Bonin, but Bonin, I think, tonight will be just as happy as if he'd won this bike race himself. So, the Tour de Flanders is history for the year 2008, as the champion of Belgium, Stein de Volder, well, he's just become the 65th Belgian to win at this event. He should be happy with that. And there it is, all smiles. Black top of his jersey, another victory for Patrick Lefebvre. That man turns out classic winners every year, one way or another. It wasn't perhaps the way he thought it would happen. He probably expected former world champion Tom Bonham, uh, but indeed it was Stein de Volder who made the line first. Well, uh, a great way to do it as well, Phil, to be able to ride over those final few kilometres on your own, knowing you don't have to hold anything back and worry about the sprint finish down towards the end. It's a great way to win, and I think the uh, added uh, advantage to him this afternoon was he won this race as the national champion, and that is a photograph I think will go onto the wall for many, many years to come. A true champion in every way. There's the uh, big step team welcoming him home. And there was the hearts in the mouth at some stage there, because I really thought he was going to get nailed back on the Vieux Capoeur. Uh, it wasn't to be, he climbed it in the saddle, full power, all the way, went over the top, and after that, it was a matter of time. There's Patrick Lefebvre, congratulating, he's congratulated all the big winners of the early spring classes at some time or other, I guess. Well, he certainly has, he's uh, won nearly all of them with Team Quickstep, and the great thing is, I think, he's brought together a serious squad for the classics. They've always had a hard time putting together a man to ride high in the overall classification, but when it comes to the one-day races, they certainly have been the best. This was the race that Sean Kelly always wanted to win. He won all of the others. He could never win this one. He finished third three times, uh, but never got the win. There we are looking at the remnants of the group coming home as they just uh, come home in small groups now, but all of them still trying to reach that very tight spin. That as it uh, the rider, I think, I might have took it out with the it was Kurt Hugeling, but perhaps I didn't recognise him. He rides on the top sport team. 
here we can see the, the winner of the day getting his hat on for the uh, interview. And, uh, Stijn de Volder, hoofdschudder, je gelooft het, het nog altijd niet. Je hebt de Ronde van Vlaanderen gewonnen en op welke manier? <laughs> ik, ik, kan het gewoon, uh, ik kan het gewoon niet geloven. Um. I can't believe that I've won this. Oh. Ik, heb, ik heb er gewoon geen woorden voor. Uh, kan, uh, het zal nog een tijdje duren voor ik, uh, voor ik echt besef dat, dat ik de Ronde van Vlaanderen gewonnen heb, denk ik. Uh, yeah. Je zat in een verloren ontsnapping, dan worden jullie ingerekend uh, met dat vijftal. En dan ga je, en het is nog bijzonder ver. Ja, uh, ik zat te wachten... Uh, Wilfried Peters zei constant, uh, niet rijden, niet rijden. Uh, uh, um, ja, Tom kwam achter en uh, het kwam er op, uh, op een ideaal moment uh, bij voor mij. En, uh, ik wist dat uh, na, na de Eikenmolen uh, uh, wind mee was. Tot, uh, tot, uh, tot aan uh, 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 Bosbeck, zeg maar. En, uh, 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 um, ik was heel goed. Uh, Felt really good. Ik had heel goede benen en uh, had, uh, excellent legs. dat was gewoon uh, een tijdrit tot aan de aankomst. Maar uh, het bos waar, uh, was echt uh, heel zwaar, like uh, wind trial. op kop uh, constant. En, uh, Um, ik denk dat ik nog nooit in mijn leven zo, zo hard heb afgezien of die, dat stuk naar de Bosberg tot, uh, tot aan de aankomst. Ja, tegen de wind, zoeken naar de juiste versnelling. En wist je hoeveel je voorsprong was? Um, ja, ik had, uh, ik had wat miserie met, met mijn oortje. En, um, uh, ik wist eigenlijk nooit uh, hoeveel voorsprong dat, dat ik had. En uh, moest constant vragen, vragen aan de, aan de motards eigenlijk. Uh, Hoeveel voorsprong dat, dat ik had en, en dan de Bosberg was gewoon uh, and, uh, alles gegeven. Ik was getting information from the guy on the motorbike. Uh, once I got to the top of the Bosberg, I knew I had a really good chance of getting myself the victory. <laughs> Soms zeggen woorden veel minder dan een beeld. Well, there we have the result. Stein de Volder, the winner today. Nick Noyens getting second. A one-two for Belgium, but a Spanish rider on the podium as well. Alessandro Balan fourth this time, American again in a classic, fifth for him, Pizzato in sixth, and Kurt Assel Arvison of Norway getting there in seventh. Well, it was a memorable race to say the least, and that most of the favourites were in the frame at one stage or another. Stein de Volder certainly wasn't an outsider by any manner of means, but as he says, he couldn't believe it. He actually has won the Ronde von Flandern, and that to a Belgian and if you're the national champion as well, is really very, very special. Well, George, you rode with all the right moves today, but unfortunately you uh, you missed the one when Stein de Volder went at the end. Yeah, it was, you know, it was, uh, we had a good breakaway with five of us going, and Stein wasn't working. Obviously, because he had Boone in behind, it was, a, it was a really uh, the only tactic they can play, and uh, as we were getting caught, Stein played, uh, took, a, took a risk, went in the break, and he was gone. He, ro he rode an awesome race, and I'm happy for him. Strange that he's a former teammate of yours, but at the end when he moved, was it because the, the main group was so close behind you thought, well, they're going to chase him down? Yeah, well, we were getting caught, and he went as soon as we were, we were getting caught. And, you know, quick, at the time, uh, Liquid Gas and Kofidis were tracking, were chasing, and um, I guess they, they put in a big effort to catch us. So once we, they caught us, Stain was gone, they had nothing left, and it was really a good move. You must be happy with the form though, because uh, you showed you were able to go with all the right moves and you were with every move apart from the one of Devolders. Happy for the form? Yeah, you know, today was an extremely tough race. Um, my legs were, were not the best they've been, but I'm happy with, with the way they went and uh, hopefully next Sunday I'll, I'll be a lot better. I think uh, riding a race like this and seeing you had so many teammates in the group behind you gives you good confidence for Harry Rubek. Yeah, the team's awesome. Um, we got some really experienced riders on this team. Uh, we all get along well and, you know, we all just want to win the races. Well, Tyler, that was a tough day. Uh, I've been to a lot of Tour of Flanders in my time, but I've very rarely seen one quite as hard. Yeah, well, you know, it was uh, <laughs> a little bit of everything for the weather today, and that definitely made things uh, interesting on some of the steep cobble climbs with the rain and hail and snow and everything. But it's a lot of fun, you know. I think this is probably the most beautiful race in the world, so this was a true Tour of Flanders, I think. Well, for some of your teammates, it was the first time uh, I bet they went into this with a certain amount of trepidation and fear. Yeah, I think everyone was kind of looking at the weather forecast last night going, oh, boy. <laughs> but, you know, we were pretty lucky. We stayed dry for the first 120K or something like that. And then, you know, by the time it got nasty, we were riding hard. So you stayed warm, but it was pretty slippery on some of the climbs. Pretty important, though, for the, for the guys to learn because next weekend is Paris Bay, and that's a race that Magnus Backstead really has a chance of winning so they had to learn a lot today yeah you know I think this was really good for everybody just to kind of uh, you know 
do the biggest classic in the world and kind of get get one in the legs uh, before sun next week. So Magnus uh, says he's feeling pretty good, so I think uh, I think it'll be good, a nice day. Well, you're back on form now after uh, a good start at the Amgen Tour of California and a, and a sad withdrawal, but back in Europe and, and back on the high road. Yeah, so far so good, you know. Uh, things have been going pretty well. I had a pretty bad crash at Perry Nice that kind of laid me low for a few weeks, but uh, I'm over that now and healthy, no problems, knock on wood. So <laughs> hopefully uh, I can keep it rolling for another week. Great, we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. Well, in the slipstream bus here with Magnus Baxted. Magnus, that was a pretty tough day today. It was very difficult because of uh, the weather conditions and, um, you know, you had to be at the front at the right time and, to be honest with you, it was almost more luck if you were at the front at the right time than, than legs, you know, and unfortunately I messed up a bit coming into the old requirement and basically kept chasing for the rest of the day and, you know, I got back on but always right at the wrong time and it was just one of those days, you know, but I got a good workout so I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to next weekend instead. That's the important thing is because this race gives you a little bit of a, a warm-up for Paris-Roubaix, shows you how the legs are, shows you how the position is on the on the bike for the cobblestones. Yeah, definitely. You know, if if you got the feel on the cobblestones, and I was definitely I was floating over them today. So, um, you know, I'm looking forward to next week, and I've got a good training ride in today. I got a, got to do the last uh, sort of 50k's, swapping off with three other guys to to get to the finish. So. You know, I'm all, all things considering, I'm I'm pretty happy, and of course we got to look at our, you know, the team effort and getting Martin in the front there. Like I think it was 15th in the end, that his first ever Tour of Flanders. You know, that's that's awesome, and uh, I think we got a lot to lot to come from that guy in the future. So I think we're pretty happy with uh, with how the day went in the end. I think that's the important thing because the team is still developing in these big races, and uh, they came together with a really good team performance and a team spirit. <laughs> The team spirit is always high here and, and you know, we, we just wanted to go out there and try and see and learn a bit and get the, the, the younger guys to sort of get the experience of this race and then possibly next year come back and have a have a proper go at it and hopefully next year I can keep myself on the bike the whole year as well and, and um, I know that I can, if, if I'm 100% fit and everything goes all right then I can be up there as well so um, you know, today was the legs are definitely there was more in there than what I showed, but you know, for some reason that Koppenberg climb I never get into that one right. I always end up being a little bit too far back right there. Pretty horrible. Don't worry. Next week's the Forest of Aramburg. Next week's the Forest of Aramburg. That that'd be much better. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, you know, the commentary went so quick today because it was such a great race, but one man stood out, and Stein de Volder really deserved that victory, Paul. That was a brave move. He did it exactly the right time, almost out of the handbook. Wait until the moment when the breakaway gets caught and go clear. He did that. I never really thought he was going to succeed, but what courage. Well, there was no easy path to victory, was there? If you couldn't ride at the front and to the best of your ability, you were never going to win this race. There were a lot of good riders behind. Tom Bonin, though, I don't think he'd be very upset because Stein de Volder was a great winner. He played a real teammate. He did everything right to help his teammate get the chance of winning that race. He'll come up next week in the Paris-Roubaix and do his best. After a great Milan San Remo, don't forget you can get that on World Cycling Productions video as well. We've now had a great race here in Flanders and there's plenty more to come. Until the next time, for Paul, for me, Phil Liggett, goodbye.